हेलो हेलो
So what is it then tabs?
You need a minute? Cool. Okay. <clears throat> Listen up, people. I know a thing or two about extinction. And let me tell you, and you'd kind of think this would be obvious, going extinct is a bad thing. And driving yourselves extinct? In 70 million years, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. At least we had an asteroid. What's your excuse? You're headed for a climate disaster, and yet every year governments spend hundreds of millions of public funds on fossil fuel subsidies. Imagine if we had spent hundreds of billions per year subsidizing giant meteors. That's what you're doing right now. Think of all the other things you could do with that money. <laughs> Around the world, people are living in poverty. Listen Don't you up. think helping them would make more sense I than, a thing or I don't know, extinction. paying for the demise of your entire species? Kind of think this Let me be awkward. real for a second. Go You've got a huge opportunity right thing. now. As you rebuild your economy and bounce back from this pandemic, in seven this is humanity's big chance. Ridiculous thing I've ever heard. So here's my wild idea. An Don't choose extinction. Save your species before it's too late. It's time for you humans to stop making excuses and start making changes. Thank you.
where cancer can cause a big infection of bad kind of pain in the field. This is from problem six, where this is going to start. This pillar and bones are already today's problem two, fire to the fire, the solution to energy and fire. The record of ceremony, ladies and gentlemen. The need for energy, the third level of energy, is central to the power supply of the planet. The level of sustainable energy affects all sectors of the economy, the health, the industry, commerce, education, the general standards of the We must appreciate the challenges posed by energy transition and advance of open energy markets. These challenges include Learning, policies and strategies, human capital developments and training, financial knowledge, infrastructure provision, awareness, as well as cultural methods. The government of Toronto has been corrected in the number of the states. The Minister recently completed the Constitutional Parliament. The national energy policy, the integrated resource planning generation, as well as the new global energy sector, which will be used by governments and other institutions for planning purposes, programs, and projects into the future. The government of Toronto has set targets for mitigating greenhouse gas emissions to reduce the country's emissions by 50% in the year 2030. On the base time and for the guidance of these conditions, the government has set a level of 50 The steady development of renewables is driven above all by the transformation of sustainable development. Climate change is an issue for which the government needs to play a key role. The reason for the central role is renewables is always. Renewable energies are fully or for most fully carbon free. Consequently, every kilowatt hour of renewables and every calorie of renewable energy means carbon dioxide saving and is directly connected to the power supply. I must continue to encourage our son. When you talk about virus, we use the recently launched biomedical projects. There's a big use of the other ways to generate the heat, the cooking, lighting, the heat. We are aware of being aware of the different things while sharing the environment by using a real resource. We are today recently in a dark project. We've also noticed a lot of the fires. And after the community, this can only go a long way to be spread across the country, such as we can benefit from this virus. And I look forward to the liberations of today, whereby other ways of approaching this will be helpful by the virus seekers. In the first to protect our environment and our food. The of ceremony is that I would like to the Lord to us the closing of my remarks to appreciate all of you who named the Catholic Conference today, your contribution, debates, and excellent opinions will enrich the discussions in the conference. <coughs> The people of all of us in the within the environment while employing innovative and advanced technologies to protect the resources, the environment, and our people. We also report to all those uh, extra people, especially those in uh, our generation, where we rely on our base of the resources. And lastly, we will be listening 
and it was highly promoting production and utilization of biogas from other ways and it was based in the south of the country. And in some sense, in the environmental community. The objective of the biogas project was to facilitate low carbon investment and public private partnerships and the production and utilization of biogas from agro waste in the district that I was on the top of the planet. And it had four strategic elements. One was creating an amazing environment that supports the market development of agro waste, maintenance, yes, and biogas. So that we stimulate investment in this area and increase the uptake of such technology through new policies, food, and financial incentives. Number two, that once there was institutionalized and strengthened uh, the private sector capacity development for biogas technology, development and services, and improve agroeconomic management and regulation through awareness raising, training, and dissemination platforms. The other objective was to participate and establish biogas installations, which include small, medium, and state biogas plants. And lastly, facilitation and establishment of appropriate utilization and knowledge platforms. And in the first project, prior to the project, uh, the government of Uganda had already undertaken a number of studies and developed strategies to promote the global change in the country, as the minister alluded to some of them. First, one of them was a kind of white house on solar water. It was a very good site for a small and yeah, let me get to it. It's really decided for production and use of biofuel in my region. There was a strategy to develop for Ghana energy and renewable uh, energy within current for Ghana. Through the application of renewable energy sources and facilities, such as the ones that we left the NPC and other stakeholders. The government will not only address the energy security concerns, but will also meet the climate change protocol targets. The project itself entails the installation of a small medium sized steel stove with and water underground digester. And the project also uh, made some research on different materials, different designs. An assessment of different agricultural byproducts feedstock. 31 pilot biogas digesters were installed in order to verify the research component, and thereafter, 200 small digesters of different sizes at six uh, cubic meters, between six cubic meters to 30 cubic meters, were installed in the project area. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we are happy to report that the Biogas project made some significant achievements towards the development of the renewable energy space. Specific uh, achievements are the guidelines and standards on low carbon alternatives and utilization technologies for agro waste and wastewater development. And these are some of these are the biogas standards, um, the biofuels guidelines, and creating a level playing field for all energy providers and the review of the renewable energy feed-in feed tariff that I mentioned earlier. A business plan was developed for the three potential medium-scale biogas sites near the agro-industrial plants with the potential of take uses analyzed. An environmental impact assess assessment of selected biogas sites was also done and installation of the 200 
small scale digester that I referred to earlier. These achievements will therefore go a long way in realizing the government's vision and commitment in the principle of environmental responsibility in ensuring that modern energy technologies are adopted, which are less harmful to the environment and contribute towards offsetting the country's carbon footprints. They will advance the mandate of our ministry and other ministries in the promotion of the use of green technology, which relates to, amongst other things, the use of renewable energy to minimize the environmental pollution and to promote the use of alternative energy sources that will ensure sustainability and security that the minister alluded to. And as I conclude, ladies and gentlemen, director of ceremonies and distinguished guests, I would like to express my sincere gratitude uh, on behalf of the ministry for the contribution, the funding, that and the guidance that was provided by the United Nations Development Program uh, GE, under GEF. I would also like to express our gratitude as a ministry to BITRI for the research and the development on and the designing of the small scale underground brick and mortar fixed dome biodigester plants, especially on the 31 demonstration sites, which led to the rolling out of the 200 biogas digesters. Let me also thank the Department of Waste Management and Pollution Control for taking control of the waste management training and supporting waste management policy advancement and enforcement. And lastly, my, our very own Department of Energy for the overall project implementation, as the project can now be used as a pilot to integrate biomass technology into energy policy specifically consideration of off-grid biogas stations with renewable energy fees in tariffs guidelines. Director of, thing, of Ceremonies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Maritza. And I'm really happy that uh, we're moving right along uh, with the formalities so that we can get into the meat of things. But a collaboration between um, uh, really big entities, BITRI, uh, the Department of Energy, uh, UNDP, we have the GEF fund as well that is involved in this, the government of Botswana, is something that is not an easy feat. Um, and would like to say congratulations to all the stakeholders uh, in making sure that uh, this project that was uh, uh, conceptualized way back when and launched in 2017 is indeed uh, making uh, real inroads and it's a true success and uh, would like you to give yourselves a another round of applause. Now our closing remarks are going to be delivered by his Excellency, the resident representative of the UNDP, uh, and his name is uh, Mr. Balash Hovath. I'm the best pronouncer of that name. Minister of Mineral Resources, Green Technology and Energy Security, Honorable Nafoko Maxa Moagi, Deputy Permanent Secretary, um, Ms. Hazel Wright-Sane, whose seat I took unwittingly this morning, for which I apologize. Um, Chief Executive Officer, Botswana Oil Limited, Mr. Mashak Jakedi. Chief Executive Officer, Botswana Regulatory Authority, Ms. Rose Seretze. Chief Executive Officer, Botswana Innovation and Technology Research Institute, Professor Shedden Masupe. General Manager, Generation, um, Mr. Edward Ugoi, Director, Department of Energy, Mr. Maidas Sakabo, Director of Center for Scientific Research, Indigenous Knowledge and Innovation, Professor Kevin Nwaigui, Deputy Director, Department of Energy, Mr. Tuso Machameko, Product Development Specialist, National Development Bank, Mr. John Matlapeng, 
at a renewable section, Department of Energy, Ms. Mr. Sechedi Harambe Ntsoe, members of the media, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to all of you. I'm truly pleased and honored to participate in this session. I'm very new in Botswana, less than a month ago that I arrived, but this project is already very close to my heart. I very much look forward to hearing and learning from all the knowledgeable people present here, partners, stakeholders, beneficiaries, and project participants alike, about the excellent work that has been done in the biogas project. As you know, UNDP is supporting the government of Botswana in reaching energy targets, as various speakers have already mentioned and will explain during the course of the day. The biogas project has demonstrated a credible approach to increasing the share of renewables in the energy mix and also for managing waste in an effective and efficient manner. This relied on support towards developing policy, regulations and standards to improve compliance with environmental requirements, piloting of demonstration sites and development of knowledge products to share and disseminate information wide. As you are all aware, UNDP focuses on supporting countries to achieve the sustainable development goals through integrated solutions. In particular, as already mentioned by the Honorable Minister, the implementation of the biogas project supports the attainment of SDG 7 on affordable, clean and renewable energy to all, and SDG 13 on combating climate change and its impact. Achieving the sustainable development goals requires a partnership between government, the private sector, civil society and citizens to make sure we leave a better planet for future generations. I'm honored and very keen to engage with the Honorable Minister Lefoko Maxwell Moagi on how UNDP can continue to support the government in implementing the country's sustainable development goal roadmap for a cleaner and greener Botswana. The UN Climate Change Conference COP26 was a platform for countries to discuss issues related to ambitious goals to contain greenhouse gas emissions and therefore reach net zero emissions by the middle of the century. The conference has achieved on the one hand more than many have expected, but on the other hand less than would be needed to keep the rise on global temperatures below 1.5 degrees Celsius and to protect communities and natural habitat. Therefore, more needs to be done to mobilize finance and successfully implement initiatives targeted at transitioning towards the phase out of coal, curtailing deforestation, speeding up the switch to electric vehicles and encouraging investment in renewables. These goals are attainable, including in Botswana. UNDP stands firm in its commitment to support the government of Botswana, the relevant ministries as they work towards achieving them. I'm happy that the Ministry of Energy and also the Ministry of Environment and Natural Resources and Tourism continue to make strides in these aspects through approval of policies and strategies. The latest one being the national energy policy, the latest ones being the national energy policy, the climate change policy, the integrated waste management policy, and the launch of the integrated resource plan, which aims to increase significantly the contribution of renewables in the energy mix of Botswana. As for UNDP, we have just completed, we have just finalized the new country program for the coming five years. This program has identified renewable energy and waste management as key focus areas on which UNDP will concentrate. And we look forward to working with the government, private sector, and the public in general. You have also heard the dinosaur speak in the movie as we began. Taking actions today is key for a sustainable future. Our planned projects aim to contribute towards reducing greenhouse gas emissions, increasing the use of clean fuels and energy efficient technologies, ecosystem-based adaptation, 
and strengthened community resilience to shocks. These strategies will build on the achievements of the biogas project, as well as other projects supported by UNDP, working with the government of Botswana. I remain confident in the effective teamwork that exists among partners in this country, which we hope to strengthen in the next program cycle with the aim to increase the positive impact of interventions on the lives of citizens. Ladies and gentlemen, the COVID-19 pandemic has been a huge global challenge and continues to cause devastation around the world and also in this country. However, as the vaccination rate continues to increase, which will help limit serious hospitalizations and deaths, and as we slowly recover from the pandemic, I'm looking forward to building forward much better, cleaner and greener than ever before. In closing, I would like to express our deep appreciation to the Ministry of Mineral Resources, Green Technology and Energy Security, the, minist the Ministry of Environment, Natural Resource Conservation and Tourism, and all other partners who have worked hard during the implementation of the biogas project. Thank you very much for your attention. These are indeed exciting times, uh, Dr. Masabi. And, you know, a greener Botswana, um, the effects of climate change. We always used to think that these things are things that affect people in the tropics uh, and, and other parts of the world. Uh, but the effects of climate change, uh, especially the weather patterns of late uh, in Botswana, have changed dramatically. Indeed. Indeed, and I had the liberty of participating in COP26. So when uh, the resident representative spoke of the net zero uh, attainment by mid century, it was actually the talk of every day for the three weeks that we were in COP. So it's good that um, Botswana is not just sitting, we are doing something. And I like that um, he acknowledged uh, the possibility of our actions towards reaching the climate change goals, including actions of Botswana, not only globally. Thank you so much. We're really excited about the new five-year plan. And as that unfolds, uh, all the stakeholders that are here, uh, we need to be well aligned so that we may take advantage for a better and greener Botswana. Now, the work, the hard work that you are doing uh, is not only visible on television, but we see the results, uh, Honorable Minister, and we do understand uh, that uh, there's more work that you do have and uh, would like to thank him for gracing uh, this occasion. There's a point where we're supposed to have taken a group picture. Uh, we're going to move that item forward uh, so that he may be able to attend uh, uh, Parliament. And uh, we thank you uh, very much uh, for gracing this uh, uh, this occasion, Honourable Minister. May we please give him a round of applause? And, uh, can we acknowledge the online audience? We have quite a number of people who have joined us virtually. We acknowledge their presence in this conference. Thank you. So thank you very much. Uh, please uh, stay glued to your screens. This is going to be an exciting day as we get ready for session one. Uh, of this uh, exciting Biogas Conference 2021. Muchas gracias. Yes. So, what's a man now? Lehi's a little hova the pili, built the billy resalam rah. You are also welcome, my sister and the director as well. Kitla go pa top table or a re, resimule di nepecalona, and then the rest will also join for the group photo. Bora ba di nepa kanzi kwa tuaba iti ngori, kupositiono ya, unzo kote mnyadi kaha, ma wa mnyadi, boma lome. Thank you.
Thank you. I think uh, that was well executed. We may proceed for session one. Thank you so much for your patience, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, I would like to ask the technical team to line up um, the biogas video, the one that speaks about masons and beneficiaries so that we can uh, reignite that energy back in the room. And then uh, my colleague here will speak about uh, what will then be happening in the first session. Thank you. Uh, immediately after the video, we'll move to the next session, which is session one. And session one is speaking about the benefits of small scale biogas for cooking, heating, and lighting in homes. The moderator for this one is the UNDP biogas project manager, Meludo Moroka. We'll call them and re remind them again. But firstly, let's uh, start with the video. of small-scale biogas for cooking, heating, and lighting in homes. The moderator for this one is the UNDP Biogas Project Manager, Meludo Moroka. We'll call them and re-remind them again. But firstly, let's uh, start with the video. Lenane o la biogas. Lenane o lele ne le dirwa go lebeletswe dilo di le malwa tse di harloganeng mo tikologong le mo lehatseng ka bophara. Ke lenane o lele tshwaraganetsweng ke mapata a harloganeng le mo ela one le le la khotetso le la le khotala di chaba la UNDP la mangwe. Ena re ngo khola last year rafio a tshono ya gore ra plele project ya ya biogas ya no ra ira ya lo e be ra plele 30 cubic ya ya biogas e le ngore mo gopolo ke gore mo plus ya ya ka go ntsiana re khona gore re produce tse gas ka hore ditlotlo tsa gas di a go go dimo me re khona gore re produce tse gas e khone go gore ra pe ka yone go ntlo re khona gore re idirise go di kuru be re idirise go di kuku le gongwe le gongwe ha ile gore tle be re tlhoka gas e ke po ne 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 a ka re tsa batho bo tlhegela ne sa tlhaolo ke tsa gore kana dilo tsa mohuta o ntsinjana se se kgathlang ke go roskware go go ntshiwa e kitsiso o bo iteba gore ana ke yong ka khonang kana ga nke ke khona ne go go rutlwediwa mongwe le mongwe hala gore o ka iteka le sego bo golo jang ka gore project ya mohuta o e kgaogantswe ka di sa sedi harologaneng 
ya ka kirna re bona na gona le 6 cubic ne gona le 10 cubic ne gona le 20 cubic le 30 cubic ya no wana ko yena no itlopela ke tsa gore go tsohela gore motswana o na bona gore o ka khona me tota ga re lebeletsi tiriso ya sengwe sa mohuta o kana madirelo a ntsinjana thutlo tsa me ka nna gore batswana re ne rite ka le sego mo dwentsi di ntsinjana ga ke dumela gore no gona lo pe o ka pallwang ga maikelo ana le teng nna ke ke agalwa ba ke ya ya 10 cubic eh ira bare bare e hetasela ka ba ka ke re go di size ya potential for growth so they advised to for kids here 10 cubic so mo selo gore ne se ke ka rena sa ntlha bona go sa lo buisepe me wena o no tshwantse gore o tswe ka di dirisiwa tseleng gore ke tsa ka go go tswela gore botona ba project ya go ke boheng ke sone selo gore se tla tswa gore ya nwana wa go dirisa madi a ka me ka tumelwa gore kana la ga o sa dirisi madi a ga go mo project ye tshwana e ka tsela mo gone o tlogela tshwana ke go dirisa madi mangwe mo dilontse dingwe e ka nna motlaka swa le sa tsile sa tsiru dirisang e ka nna ke sere e tlwaetseng e motlhola go nyentsi dirisiwa kana janghela ya no ka tsela mo madi ono tla tshwana ke gore nna wa dirisa tota tumelwa rona ke gore ga go kwa hitlela sepe bontsi jana go sa dirisa di tsinya go lo di pe go are go nne le tsinya go lo go rotwa go nne go bona dipoelo ya no rona ne ru dumela tota gore mo re go dirile mmo e gare ka bona ka tlhego e tla nna sengwe sele mo gore ke sa senne la ruri kana sla tsa lobaka dipoelo tsa temo tla di akola tata ko morago mo project ya teng re re kopya gore re ka di di material le di tsompelo tsotlhetsetse le mo gore di a tlhoka hal and ke tsa gore tse re di dirisitseng hana was about uh, about 28000 to go raka di di material tsa tsa teng me ya no ya ka ne ke bua pele the technical expertise and the labor comes from the uh, from the project for men to mo lemo o dira tiro a yona mo ba yo ke se ya ke ya hwa yana i ya hwa hela ke sa duela se sa me go gore ke tlise di o tse di dirisiwang go aga e me ba thwa ba tlong go thaogela ha ba ira tiro e ga ke bane le sepa ba 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 thuswa ke go romente tota bone ba 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 mothomong ya yone program yena ya ya ba yo ke se gore go ka ha go buang ka teng ga te eh re ka dirisa anything biodegradable boloko bongwe le bongwe a jwa di khomwa a jwa di koko a jwa di kolobe but for starters gore a gore go ngwe re ta simola ka jwa di khomo ka gore eh ke jone jo bontsi journal le bon e re on a daily maintenance e ber ka dirisa jwa eh jwa di koko ka pa jwa di kolobe gone mo fa monnye ja ka ntse le bona halele hale re ruile re ruile di koko gona le sa mae ka hale tota me re ga kolotse gore mae makaka a tenga di koko la di phologolo o se ka sa ipe a na le mmu so ara se nyang ka moteng ha ba ke se ka ile gore ra ra di rese gore ga di ka ka di ka ke le mo di mo ha te like sa di sa di layers re bile seng ke kwa tlase jana gore e collect makaka a te ga ile boloko ja di khomo re sa ka moteng ha le saka mo ile gore go na le mosotelo kwa tlase gore se ka sa mo go na le mmu ke na le di koko tsa nama le tsa mai so ke na le gona go ka tsaya masala ra tsa me mantle ra juba ka metse go nna ka mo tlo gonya na ya e be re tshela me ya la mo go moe ka re mo ga e go na le ba bana di khomo go na le gore ga go tlhabiwa gore ya la go mpe ra go tlhabitsa ka gore go covid ba tsene ra ga go tlhabiwa ya ne be re ka phona go isa ba ke to gore ba re tshela mo tswa mo be go tsa lona ka go ira mo tlo gale le re go le tsa rona di tsala throughout the year ha mari ga tsana yan di khona go tsala bosego di kolojwane di asita so if we have a heater there go tle go thus go ha ke khaoles na ndi khong ba bere ke ya ka ba nle ha ba sokola ka go a pa le 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 rona ka ri tle go nna ha yana ri tle go nna le le sokolo ye o ya go a pa le go tshuba le heater le di heater ra kana go tsa mari ga ya no ke go nna ha ile go re go tle go re go tle go re thusa teng go re re tsele di setemo ya rona temo thua ya rona mo khaolo 
it is a very interesting initiative um hela kwe simulo kong because of deforestation issues kone mo khaolo ni re mo goeni ya greater gaboro kana go na dikhong ra hoza mo famo me ne re khona go ya khonye hela thuba se bomo mo dipane kana di want mo dipane ne re tsa kolo ya ba ra di khonye go ne go now since re na le one plante re thuba hela malatsi o tle re fida mo go nyenyane e be re sa stina malatsi i think you can stop the video even though the audio is very interesting yes, yeah. uh, I, I think there will be an opportunity to to play the video again uh, just maybe when we come back a little bit after lunch but uh, i'm highly intrigued it's really exciting to be able to see uh, results in action these are some of the masons and the beneficiaries of this biogas project however we are slightly behind time and this is the time where we play catch up and I'm really excited about this first session. Yeah. Uh, our first session is benefits of small scale biogas for cooking, heating and lighting in homes. It's somewhat related to the video that we just watched briefly. And we have panelists who will be talking to us on this session. The session will be moderated by Ms. Ludom Moraka. Thank you very much. Please let's welcome her onto the stage uh, with a round of applause. She is the Biogas Project Manager. Again, it's Susui Ruiling. Uh, our panelists, we have the Director of Energy, Mr. Mada Sakhabo. We have beneficiaries, Ms. Tulaganyo Masara and Mr. Kuto Sidimo. We have the Masons, Ms. Kifilo Matale and Mr. Kelezo Maribe and a biogas expert, Mr. Walter, Walter Ogello. Ludo will do the proper introductions of the panelists. Thank you. Uh, director, there's a microphone next to your chair. Yeah. Let me make Please sanitize this one and give it to me. Thank you, Mr. Saboni, and good morning, participants, distinguished participants, and welcome to this session that speaks about small scale biogas digesters. My name is Ludo Moroka, and I'm the biogas project manager with the UNDP. It is an honor for me to welcome you to this session. I am here with the Director of Energy, Reza Khabo, and two beneficiaries of the project, Ms. Tulahanga Masara, Mr. Kuto Sidim. I have two masons with us, Ms. Kifilo Matale, Mr. Kelozo Maribe, and our biogas expert, Mr. Walter Ogelu. Thank you, participants, for joining us. You're all welcome. So to start our session, I'll hand over to Mr. Maira Sakhabo to highlight to the audience what the mandate of the Department of Energy is in providing energy access to all, and also to indicate how the Biogas Project has supported the interventions of the department in increasing energy access, in particular, renewable energy. Over to you, Rasqab. Uh, thank you very much, Ludo. Um, the, the Department of Energy's major mandate is the uh, creation of a conducive environment for the energy sector to thrive. And uh, the Belgas project came in handy uh, to enhance the mandate which we do. The department is actually 
it's a lead policy making authority of government on all matters of energy supply and demand management. It formulates and coordinates national energy policy and programs and facilitates availability of effective, reliable, affordable energy services to customers in an environmental friendly way. That is as a way of uh, the mandate of the department. Um, if we look at uh, the, we have the statistics of the project that we have, we are saying that we had uh, 30 demonstration plants that have been constructed. And there was a target to have a 200 small scale agribusiness utilizing agro waste steams from biogas digesters in the southern part of Botswana. The simple, we are saying today we are sitting at 183 of those, 104 have been commissioned, 27 have been completed, not yet commissioned, 22 are ongoing, and 30 still procuring material. So you see that uh, we are actually doing um, um, very well. Uh, on issues of how the Burgess project supported the interventions of the department, we are submitting that uh, it actually contributed to improved livelihoods and lifestyles. For example, it actually reduced the household expenditure by 58%. It reduced fuel, well, fuel wood collection time by 42%, and it is mainly used for cooking, heating, and lighting. Contribution to the renewable energy mix, we are saying that we are, it is considered better than, it is considered a better option than solar. And it is cheaper, it has got low maintenance. Cheaper option than solar, mainly because with biogas, we are not limited to uh, daytime. No, you operate it throughout the day uh, and night. It is also less prone to theft because uh, this is a, a structure. It's almost like a building, you can't steal a building. So really, burgers that just are the plant, there's no way anybody can, it's less prone to theft. It is also um, rich for, it reaches those far. Because it's a local thing, you install it at any area, it will work. You will not need to move around buying petrol or anything. Once you have it, it works. So it, it, we are saying that uh, it is very good because it reaches those most vulnerable uh, communities who are far from cities and towns. And uh, it also reduces the deforestation pressures. Because now the gas is here, people can use it for lighting and for cooking. There's a few people now going into the forest to collect and cut down trees. So it's actually good in that sense. The digestate, which is actually coming out on the other side, is actually an organic fertilizer. So we can simply say indirectly we are increasing to food production in the country. Um, what are the major achievements of the project to small scale users? They, 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 the advantages of uh, the biodigester are really, you, you will never finish them. I will just indicate that uh, because of this, um, normally in our culture, children are the ones who are mostly sent to collect fire. Now, if we have the biogas, children have got more time to study. They have got the light and everything. So, is it mine or, oh, thank you. And then it contributes to cleaner environment as we have less cow dung. I think those who have cattle post will know that uh, almost every two years we have to build a new cattle post because the, this one now is uh, full of dam. And the problem is that when it's raining, the, gun, the dam becomes very muddy. And when the cattle go in there, they get sick. So you have to build a, a makeshift one. So almost every two years we build a new crop. We are saying here, now you don't have to have a lot of uh, dung in there because you are feeding it to the digester. I will tell you one thing, when individuals use it, uh, collectively, if you look at uh, how much um, power is actually will be needed to do what they are doing with those bio digesters. We are saying this bio digester, if you count all the people, bring them together, you have created a visual power station and it, it really reduces the pressure 
on what uh, um, the our generation plant ought to be um, uh, producing at the time. So this biogas is more about savings and using the money for other activities. So you, you can be able to do other things with the savings. And um, of course, we have talked about uh, reducing pressure on livelihoods, on the forest and everything. It is an all-rounder. And uh, we believe that uh, it's a very wonderful option for our people. Botswana is uh, almost the size of France, but uh, we've got only 2 million people. So the distance that you need to rush between the two providing services is actually huge. So this is a very good opportunity for everybody in the country. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ross Kabo, for that um, highlight. And now I want to give it over to the beneficiaries to tell us from their experience what it has been like using biogas. I understand what Ms. Ross Kabo is saying and saying that it's better than solar in some ways. It reduces deforestation. But let's hear from those who are actually using the biogas. Mr. Kujo Sidimu, please let us know what your experience in biogas has been like. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Kujo Sidimu, like Ludo mentioned. Um, a farmer based in the Little Gang sub district in Gwening district, uh, near a small village called Matlavats. And uh, my experience with biogas has been very interesting. Um, I didn't know much about it before this project. So I didn't know what exactly I was going to be working with, but it's, it's been really fun. Um, it, like the director has said, um, it helps to clean the crop. We don't like muddy, muddy crawls as farmers. Every farmer will tell you that. It's, it's something we really, <laughs> we really don't enjoy because the kettle refused to go into the crawl. Sometimes they don't even come to the kettle post. So in that way, it has cleaned out our, our crawls uh, our cattle come almost every day now. We don't have any muddy situations. Um, another thing, uh, it has turned me into a tree hugger now. Um, we've put away the axe. Uh, we, we don't need firewood anymore because of, of the heat that can be generated through biogas and also the cooking gas. Thank you. Thank you so much, Re Sidimo. And just as a follow-up, how do you see yourself go progressing in the biogas space? Uh, well, at the farm, we have a plan, my parents and I. I'll, I'll keep saying we because they, they really supported me in this project. Uh, we had a plan on, our intention was to run the farm 100% of the grid. Uh, we have a borehole that is powered by solar energy. Uh, now we have the biogas digester which just keeps improving our, our strategy at the farm. So in essence, we've just developed what we wanted to do at the farm. We didn't know exactly how we were going to do it, but like these opportunities come. For me, it was a no-brainer to, to apply for this project because it aligned with our strategy. Thank you so much, Mr. Sidimo. And just to highlight to the audience and the online audience as well, Mr. Sidimo is youth. How old are you? If you could tell the audience. I'm 29. Yes, so we are excited to see someone as young as him being excited about that, I guess. Um, Mama Sar, please let us know. Let us know how your experience with Biogas has been like. When did you start using Biogas first? Thank you, Ludo. Uh, I am Tulakanyo Masara based in Tokweng. I have a farm in Tokweng along the Zurast Road. I'm doing poultry, basically the layers and the broilers and the tsana. The biogas, uh, I started in 2020. That's when I, the construction was started. By just seeing the post and the Facebook, then I applied, and then I was approved. Then the project went on and I went live in September the same year. So it's been a year now since I'm using it. Uh, but it's so beneficial to me. Like others have said, it helps in cleaning. Like poultry, it's fond of flies and smell. But with that, I'm not experiencing that. Because uh, every now and then, We've put the corrugated iron under the chicken cages 
So we just pull the, the, the zinc and put into the digester, mixing with water. So in that way, our pot houses are kept clean. Our environment are kept clean. We are having less flies because flies we cannot do without. They are part of the human. So that's the most beneficial thing. The other thing, the gas, we're using it for cooking. No matter if it's rainy, no matter if it's windy, we have a meal on the table because we have something to cook with. Because it's at the farm, even the workers there, they don't have a challenge of cutting down trees, looking for firewood. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Mamasar. You can see that they are very passionate about the project and um, they're working very hard to sustain it. Thank you so much. I want to hand over now to uh, our Masons. The project as part of um, empowering the youth trained several Masons, a number of 72 to, dig to construct these digesters. We have two of them here and they'll give us a highlight of what they've been trained on and what construction of biogas has meant to their lives. And in future, how do they see biogas being part of their lives, even beyond the biogas project? So Ms. Matale, please, I'll hand over to you first. Can you tell the audience your experience with biogas? Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Thank you so much, Mama Tak. Mr. Sabon, will you help us with translation? Thank you. Um, Mama Tak, I want us to you to tell us, Hore, ever since the Biogas Project Dissimulo, how has it changed your life? Okay. Since I was fresh from school, for Senadi Piro and all, Biogas Ibeetla, since I was fresh from school, as she has said, biogas, uh, the biogas project has been able to turn my life around uh, tremendously. But since Biogasa is in 2018, I managed to do the work that I did in the first I was able to do the work I did in the first place. I was able to do the work that I did in the first place. I was able to do the work that I did in the first place. I was able to do the Since I'm a single child, um, really, my mother has been dependent on on, on me solely and uh, at the time I was a student and I was only dependent on my student allowance which was not enough could not meet our, our needs having embarked on this project I was able to I was able to uh, install electricity at home and water as well and uh, this really helped to alleviate a lot of the problems that uh, we were encountering at home as, including problems like going to uh, the watering uh, pipe to go and collect water. But uh, thank you to the Biogas Initiative. We are here now. 
le nna ke ile ka kgona go itirela jo tse dingwe tsa ile gore ne ke sa kgone go ditirela kana ko ne ke sa go sena go peko ke bere ka nteng ke kgone go itirela jo di le mmalwa hela thata tse ile gore ke a di tumela mo tsatsi la go nteng yes i was uh before this biogas pro, uh, project uh, i was not able to do a lot of things even for myself and i'm i'm sitting here proudly to say that i've been able to do uh, a lot of uh, wonderful things for my family uh, and for myself miss matale thank you for that testimony is there anything else you'd like to add to that okay thank you so much can we clap hands for it please Over to you, Ramarib. Tell us how Biogas has changed your life. When did you start with this project? And how do you see your future in Biogas looking like? Hey, Galeo. I'm going to talk to you about the first time. I'm going to talk to you about the first time. I'm going to talk to you about the first time. I'm going to talk to you about the Bridling and plastering, both high and bridging. Since uh, 2017, they know how to go ahead of bridging. And the simulates around war gas, the Nagako Panale, Bale Patala, Lavoranyan. So, the Naganamu to Yulungari, the Naganali Sihoka, the Nagako Panale, the Nagato Piwa. We tutela bio yes. Moi longore, ono wa intume di saka wore, kenega katena, kenale katleho. Ta mokotse lengani, kenega bona wore hoga nzala mo sola saka wore. Eh, way forward ni kibwa na wore tota ngai chiza ka ka bio yes. Back in 2017, I was a student at the Katem Brigade, pursuing my last year in Brick Lane. And I was shortlisted uh, by Beatry uh, to be able to be uh, one of the students that uh, uh, could be taught, uh, uh, you know, the, the ins and outs and uh, the construction of, 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 the, of, of, the, of the biogas system. Uh, I must say that I have seen that there were many benefits uh, to myself uh, on embarking on this particular project. And uh, this is where I find myself here today. Sasa mwaka bayo re bayo yesi intuisi zega wari mavo humbi kuniya ni kina kuchona kuchona lidio zelo wari ni kina kesa solo hela ranga di kuchona kawari haja asoko la wari beki kirekwa tati kawari kina kaki wana wari bayo yesi. Itla ingiza kwa kuhonga, mabo humbi yangu ni yani, kisa siki ni kiregile ni ruo le nonguari kena le loone, so kibana kwa resource usimole mata. Yes, it is indeed pleasing that uh, having uh, embarked on this uh, biogas project, uh, it has helped me greatly. Uh, we know that we are living in a time where unemployment is uh, very high, but uh, I have not. Uh, struggled at all uh, in this area. I'm self-employed. I've even been able to buy myself uh, a number of livestock uh, and, and I'm diversifying and expanding my wealth. Uh, Kisetsi kisimola ho 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 ka ho ka aratota mo bonu bugele mo kubone is very excited because uh, he's even been able to put up a structure where he's living and also assisting the parents as well uh, in in the area of construction. Tada di di nti zelo waranga di bua mihela. Sesi molemo kwa re ba yesi mabo humpi egonyani idumela kwa re 
has a sozista helang, his ozen or retazel, Larenzer is a diragor, a bazona baratili, gaha, bagiro rambun legati. We see this as not the end of biogas, but this is actually the beginning because Batsona are reaping the many benefits and are seeing the advantages of biogas. Company, there is indeed a future in biogas, and I personally uh, would like to be involved in this project because I see that uh, with the with the future uh, here in um, there's a, a real possibility to grow this industry, and uh, I would like to be personally involved in the establishment of even a, a bigger setup or a bigger company uh, that uh, can employ many many young many others. I'd like to thank uh, B3 for everything that they have done for us. Thank you so much. I think these young people deserve another round of applause. Thank you, Ramarib. Very emotional, very touching speech from your side. And thank you, Mama Tale, for that, those few words. Lastly, we have Mr. Okelo, our biogas expert from Uganda. He has been assisting us quite frequently on the project over the years. And I just want you to highlight, Mr. Ogelo, what your experiences have been like outside Botswana and what you have seen in Botswana. What do you see as the key things that we need to look out for as we try to upscale the project? And what would you suggest as the major things to consider to keep this initiative sustainable? Over to you, Mr. Okay. Thank you so much, moderator. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Anthony Walter Okello. I come from Uganda. I have been supporting the project for the last uh, four years uh, in the areas of uh, technical support, especially capacity building, and then of course with the drawings and all those other issues. I am very happy to, to be back here uh, for this closure, for this conference. I'm also very happy to be surrounded by the beneficiaries as well as the Masons. These are very good indications of uh, progress made so far. Uh, when I came here in 2007, uh, we did move to some of the, the areas, the potential areas, and I was uh, quite impressed by the resources available for biogas. So one thing to note is that Botswana has enough resources for biogas, especially because of the, the cattle population. I am also quite impressed by uh, the achievement of, uh, of the project. Uh, two, over 200 digesters in this period is, uh, is a good achievement. I'm impressed by the involvement of the different uh, stakeholders. When you ask me about one of the success factors or the issues to consider is involvement of stakeholders, different people. And for Botswana, you are very lucky that you have the government involved. I think I have uh, participated in a number of uh, biogas programs in the last 10 years uh, in, in Africa. And where government is directly involved, I can assure you that uh, there's, there's a lot of uh, progress being made. This is because there are a number of uh, uh, enabling environment issues that have to be dealt with. And it's government that can, uh, can push on this. But of course, for sustainability and for scaling up, 
Then you need the private sector, you need the CSO, you need all these members, but it's normally government that, uh, that helps. I'm also quite happy that uh, UNDP has quite been involved because to be honest, for these things to start in Africa, you need a bit of uh, support from an international organization, mainly for awareness and uh, financial support. In the projects I worked from, in like for example, in Uganda, we have had a number of support from donor organizations. Ours have mainly been through the Dutch government. They have been sponsoring the project for, we are now going for the third phase. We did phase one, phase two, and now the third one. But as we now go towards uh, 10 years, and which Botswana could also be looking at for the future, sustainability lies with the, the private sector, the, the masons. The masons forming companies, and then they start to do business out of, out of biogas. Uh, that is one. Uh, the other options could also be things like carbon revenue funding. After about 10 years, you find that there's good revenue funding from carbon. And that is what for us in Uganda now we're using mostly to, to sustain the, pro, the program, to make sure that now the donor dependence, the money from outside is, de is decreased and the project is self-sustaining. Self so for sustainability, uh, the private sector is very, very important. In enabling the environment, uh, there is need to, of course, create the, the, the necessary policies, the necessary framework. Uh, sooner or later, you'll see foreign outside players coming in. We now have experience of where we're not only talking about fixed dome. We now have the prefabricated digesters. We have a company from Mexico doing that. We have from Israel. So when the market develops, you'll see other types of biogas coming in. And they will come in with more solutions in addition to just energy for, for cooking. You'll have things to do with farm operation, the equipment, the biogas for pumping water, biogas for power operating machinery. So those are all things that will happen, but uh, they need uh, a government intervention. In some cases, to attract these people, there is need for tax to, to, to have a zero, a zero tax rating on some of these products are, that are going to, to be imported. Uh, but overall, I am uh, very happy, and I can surely tell you that there's a lot of potential in Botswana here to turn the waste from the animal industry into energy, especially for the, the off-grid farms. The farms are visited are really off grid. They are they're in different areas, and some of them are quite far from where there's electricity. And there's potential for, for such farms to even generate electricity. Some of them I saw they're really big, and perhaps we shall start to think about beyond the 30 cubic meter. We could think about the 100 cubic meter, the 200 cubic meter, that now can produce a gas that is enough to run a generator for, for the whole day. So those are all uh, all potential. And I think uh, it's about time that from this level, it's moved to, to the, next, the next level. But I am very happy with uh, the progress made. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Okello, quite wise words. And I'm happy to say, as the minister has, has alluded to earlier, we do have a good partnership with the Ministry of Energy and the Ministry of Environment, and we will take this forward together with UNDP with our new country program that starts next year. Thank you so much for being here. So now I'll hand it over back to our directors of proceedings for any questions that may come from the floor for our participants here. Thank you. This is the time we're looking for energy. Remember, this is an energy conference. So we're looking for uh, comments from the floor. You can take the side of the room, uh, my dear lady, and uh, please do introduce yourself. Oh, you have the mics here. No, it's fine. I don't mind walking. I'll hold the mic for you. I think we uh, thank you very much, uh, Director of Ceremony. Uh, thank you very much, uh, all the speakers. Uh, this is a very good experience that you have shared with us. 
and it gives us uh, hope for the future, especially for the uh, local communities. I come from a rural area, and I know the dire need of farmers to have energy for their various activities. So I thank all the stakeholders and the funders of the project. Uh, this is very good. And we hope that uh, B3 will not chicken out. Uh, we'll see to it that more units are constructed uh, all over the country. Uh, but you know, when we talk of energy, we must not forget the issue of cost. And I think that both from the uh, beneficiaries and the uh, uh, designers, it would be good to know the cost. You told us that there are four units, six cubic meters, 10 cubic meters, 20 cubic meters, and 30 cubic meters. But for the two participants, they have opted for the 10 uh, cubic meters. How much did it cost in terms of construction? And if there is no running cost, let's say so. And also the issue of maintenance from the uh, beneficiaries. Uh, I know it's the life is so short now that uh, the, the, maybe the units are still new, but maybe the experts from Uganda, uh, Walter, would uh, make some small comments on those aspects so that we'll be prepared. Thank you so much. Can you please introduce yourself? Oh, thank you very much. Uh, Tunde Oladiron is my name. Say that again. Tunde Oladiron is my name. I I come from Bust in Palapé. Thank you so much. Let's give him a round of applause. Uh, he did say thank you. But what's the name of the rural area you are from? Uh, I think we'll take that offline. <laughs> OK, no, I just wanted to know the place, uh, the rural area in Uganda. But I think the two main questions that he had asked are uh, the question of, of costing and then also the, the question of maintenance. Uh, we may not get a direct answer. Uh, but the more important one is uh, the issue of, 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 of maintenance as the main one, and then the cost of, of putting together the units. Uh, um, uh, in terms of costing, um, we have a 30 cubic at the farm and uh, buying everything was just under 40,000 pula. Um, that includes concrete, cement, sand, everything, to be honest, uh, was just under 40,000 pula. And um, for maintenance, we haven't really done much. Nothing has been destroyed. All we do is just feed the digester. So we just maintain the slurry and the digestate. Yeah, thank you. Okay, and maybe just to add to the labor costs, I'll hand it over to the Mason. If you can give an indication out of six cubic, 10 cubic, 20, let's say, till the charge of a guy. You mean price or? Price for labor. Okay. I see more like a six cubic, which is. 7,000 and 10 cubic, which is 12,000. 20 cubic, which is 16,000. And 80 is 20,000. Thank you. I hope you answered, sir. Errors have to. Uh, well, uh, I, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, Professor Oladiran and uh, indicate that we have been working very closely with him 
uh, on issues of renewable energies. And I, we have been meeting recently trying to find a way of uh, how we can actually take the trade into another level. Just thought I should appreciate uh, his presence and I promise that uh, we've been working very closely with the views. We actually have a memorandum of understanding, um, the, the OMI, uh, for collaboration with the views as the Department of Energy. Thank you so much. Thank you, Raskhava. I think this is good news to hear. It goes back again to, you know, being the team that works, makes the dream work. Thank you so much. Any other questions? There's one here. Yes. Thank you, sir. Uh, good morning. My name is Richard Murusiwa. I'm from Kahamukwenaka, as Rishika is saying. Um, I'm also a biogas user, and uh, I've been running on biogas for five years now. Yes, it's true, there's no maintenance required. Um, once in a while, yes, you need to maybe dig in and get in some of the, um, the dung that might be getting uh, harder, because I think uh, as, as, you, as you replenish, some dung seems to get a little harder and uh, but yeah, there's a way that you can go in, in, in there and, and remove it through the expand, expansion chamber. Um, I think we also need to embrace the use of other recycle, uh, recyclable material to make digesters. Um, we think um, the use of uh, plastic or HDP uh, recycled uh, material could also um, be considered. In fact, we already have a, a unit, um, a portable digester made out of a tampoline. And, uh, you know, so there is opportunity to recycle further in terms of uh, coming up with uh, raw materials that can help us take this matter you know, to another level. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Ramulu Are there any comments uh, with regards to that? Or let's just take another one and then maybe there may be a comment with regards to what Ramon Isua had said. Thank you very much and uh, good oh, good morning. My name is Gamun Pofu from Botswana Oil. Just to appreciate in terms of the biogas, is it possible to, you know, guess if, no, not gasify, but con containerize it and on sell? without necessarily just using it for own use? Are you able to um, contain it and, and sell it, probably package it and sell to other, other farmers? Very interesting uh, scenario. Uh, over to you, Ludo. Uh, we can start with comments on what Ramulisio had said. Yeah. And then the gentleman from Zona Rumbo from Zona Oil. Okay. Thank you, Ramulisio, for your can comment. Can I ask that we get uh, the gentleman's comment as okay. well? Okay. 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 Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Ho Chieng from uh, Biost. And uh, I'm very, very impressed with uh, the conversation and the input that uh, I'm hearing from uh, most uh, delegates. Uh, it is very exciting that uh, we, are, we are having this conversation. And uh, I must recognize the presence of uh, the expert from uh, Uganda. Now, are we... When I was, I lived in uh, South Africa for some time and we were engaged in this kind of work. Now, there are a few questions that normally come to mind. Number one is the quality of uh, biogas. How do you regulate that? Now, the second part to that question is where we convert biogas into energy. That requires that the quality of biogas is improved. Now, uh, as you work on production of biogas, are you also looking into the conversion of biogas into energy, which is one of the things that uh, oh, we're looking into? Well, there are quite a few projects that we worked on in South Africa, 
And uh, that is one aspect that was of interest. I do not know whether you have also looked into that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ludra. I think I can take up the question. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mulisio, for your comment on using HDPE and other recyclable materials. I'm going to allow my participants to answer the questions, but um, just to say during the pilot project, we did explore different materials. And what we were looking for most is um, one that would last longer. And we did find from the research that was done that the brick and mortar di design would last uh, approximately 20 years. And this is something that we wanted to sell to Botswana. The HDPE, yes, I understand would last around five years, but is an option that I think we would consider as well going forward as we're doing the rollout with the Department of Energy. The next one from Ms. Tampofu. Thank you again. Um, around packaging and selling. Again, I will ask Walter to speak to that. Yes, I know that in other countries like um, in Uganda where your water comes from, they do package it, even if it's not cleaned, they package it as it is and sell it to the, the neighbors and people in the community for use. So he can speak to that briefly. Um, in terms of the conversion of biogas into electricity, you will, if you are still here later on, when Professor Box speaks to the feasibility study that was done at BMC to see how the waste, the agro waste that's coming from the abattoir can be used to generate both electrical energy and thermal energy for uses in the abattoir. He will speak to that and the cost around that. So this is something that we did consider during the, the project, as you can see, and it was highlighted that the project speaks to small scale and medium scale as well. So that is something that was considered and will be considered as well as we move forward. Um, over to you, Walter, if you can. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Ludo. Uh, let me straight away dive into the, the questions. Uh, there's a gentleman talking about other materials, I think, for making biogas. Yes, uh, it's, it's very possible. The industry is developing quite fast. There are other materials that are being used for biogas other than the brick type. And now we are having the polyfiber materials that last 15 years. So the ones I've been talking about now, they're really well developed products that take over 15 years. And they are suitable in places where you may not be able to construct a fixed dome. For example, a, a rocky place. So these are, these are already existing. Uh, it's, the market is developing. So very soon you'll even see them expressing interest to come to Botswana. But other materials also make biogas. Uh, on the quality of uh, biogas, that is one very important observation, which I would like to point out especially if we come, as we come to the end of this phase or this project, the biggest question in my mind is moving forward, who is going to make sure these gentlemen do quality work? It is very, very important that they do quality work, but experience has also showed that on their own, with the time, some of them tend to relax. So in particular for biogas technology, there is need to ensure that quality is maintained so that the, the digesters that are constructed are able to last. If we say they're lasting for 20 years, they're able to stay for, for 20 years. So it's a very big question, which I, I hope the Department of Energy and other responsible agencies can look into it. Otherwise, the progress made can be taken back because of subsequent substandard work. Uh, in a country like Uganda, we now have them form companies and then from there they form an association that Puel is in charge of ensuring that quality of the work is maintained. So this is something very important. If you look at challenges of biogas everywhere, the issue of quality of work will always come up. So it's important that since we started off here on the right note, it's important that it's, it's continued along that way. Uh, on the issue of uh, packaging of biogas, uh, well, uh, those are nice words from Ludo, 
uh, but in reality, we are not doing a lot of uh, packaging, and I'm going to give the reason. But what we are doing is we're having people who now pipe it to the, to the neighbors. Somebody has a 60 cubic meter, so he decides to share it with two or three neighbors, and it's metered, so you agree on, uh, on the payment mode. However, we have done a number of research into biogas packaging, and it's something that is still continuing. But I remember I worked on one project where the first issue that came up was that the government didn't have regulation on packaging of biogas in Uganda. This is simply because when you go to packaging biogas, its property is slightly different from the natural gas. It has to be compressed at high pressure for you to achieve the same volume. So therefore it requires a separate kind of containers. The cylinders really have to be quite, quite strong. And we didn't have those kind of cylinders. There are regulations on how, how to handle them because once it's purified and it's 100% methane, then it becomes a very dangerous gas if not you handled properly. So we were slowed down because one we were informed by the Minister of Energy, look, you don't have the regulation governing this. And indeed, it's very important. But it's something that is very possible and it's being done elsewhere. But it needs a massive investment in terms of infrastructure and in terms of distribution. So it is something for, for the future. Converting biogas to energy, uh, he's talking about purification and all this. I'm glad that most of the equipment now that we import, say, from China, are able to first purify the gas. Even if you're using it in a generator, you find that it comes with a, a whole desulfurizing unit, uh, dehydrating unit, and uh, other, other units. So most of the, the generators for medium scale biogas plants have these provisions for purification. So definitely purification is something that I think is already taken care of and, and it's done as you, you install your, your equipment. Uh, I don't know, is there anything else I've left? I think I'll finish. I think you've answered us. And I just wanted to add, yes. I've seen, um, and that's why I was saying that there's packaging in Uganda where they put it in a tire. Oh, okay, yes. yes. That's what I was referring to. And then selling it to your neighbors or people in the community. Okay. Yeah, so the other way, which I sort of had forgotten, is we have biogas bags. So within a community, three or four families can have biogas bags. And from one central producer, it's always refilled. Somebody comes and picks that bag, goes and uses it and uh, leaves another one when the other one is over, comes and picks like that. But these are still things that store gas for a day or two. So it's really for very close, very close neighbors. But uh, that is how we are managing to, to do the packaging of, of biogas. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Scavo, please come in. Well, uh, I think it's getting interesting. It's getting interesting by the day. And I'll tell you one thing that uh, we are happy about. We also have an MOU with uh, Bua. So information is uh, just at our disposal. We have another MOU with the University of Botswana. So I think what I'm trying to uh, put across is that uh, this, what we have, is now a technology-led uh, market penetration. We believe that uh, the market will mature. As the market matures, we leave it to the business guys to take over and lead. We have uh, associations which are actually self-monitoring and uh, like uh, the most recent one is the Solar Industry Association of Botswana. They have to make sure that their um, members do good quality work. And uh, like you have uh, been worried about the quality of work, we have also been worried about it. But we want to have a, a mature market which can actually govern itself in terms of uh, the quality of work of uh, its constituent. We are hoping that uh, this is driving there. But what I'm putting across is that uh, as the, the market matures and you know, takes over, as the Department of Energy, we just create an enabling environment and we move forward. So definitely we'll be moving to bigger things that are not yet discovered and try to bring in the discovery, new and emerging discoveries that could be done either in biogas or in, in other fields. Um, we, yes. We, 
I wanted to talk about uh, our relationship with other institutions and the self-monitoring part, which I think uh, we were actually looking at. So the, the major problem which we have now is that yes, we have masons in the southern part of Botswana, but people are calling us all over the country. They, everybody wants biogas. And uh, it's not every uh, trained artisan who can actually build a biogas plant. That means we need to train a critical number of uh, artisans or masons who can actually be all over the country Somebody should be able to do it in Hansi. You don't need to be taking somebody across the country. Somebody should do it in, in Ngami. Somebody in Bobono. All over this country, we need masons who can actually do these things. So this is the, the skills shortage or the skills gap that we are actually looking at today to say, we need to fill this thing. Let these people be in the market. These should be the people who should be used to build biogas digesters. We don't want people who come and watch you build and then go and try and build because they will tarnish the, the whole industry. We want pro properly trained people to actually do the work. So that is what we are advocating for. And we are hoping that we'll be able to get the, the needed partnership and funding to do it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, our wonderful panelists, Ludo. Would you like to say something in closing? Uh, this uh, is almost bringing us to the end of session one. Okay, I think there's one more question there before we close. Okay. Uh, go ahead. Oh, come on, Sarlam, Mike. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for the uh, for the presentations this morning. I have one little question, which I'm not too sure whether it was uh, was answered. Uh, what I'm trying to establish is that how do we ensure the consistency and the quality? of the biogas that, uh, that is being produced. I think it's, it's about the quality of the product itself. How do we ensure uh, uh, that quality? Thank you. Thank you uh, and good morning. Um, I also have a, maybe a small question that I think uh, maybe need to be um, addressed. I don't know whether the project has been able to conduct studies on the actual yields um, of these uh, digesters based uh, on maybe size and particular feedstocks so that um, uh, as we scale up and even uh, look into commercialize uh, biogas production, then we are, or we make the right uh, decisions and, and uh, choices. Thank you. My name is Gift Bakumbi from there. Oh, thank you. Um, the first question is about consistency and quality of the biogas itself, not the structure, right? Mr. Okele, do you want to take this one? How do we ensure the consistency and the quality of the gas? Obviously, bearing in mind that we have different feedstocks that are coming into the digester. We do know that there's a certain percentage of methane that will be in the biogas, but would you say there's a way of assuring that it is consistently being produced at that percentage of methane in the biogas? Okay, uh, good question. For the purpose of heat, heating from biogas, uh, methane quality, we don't pay much attention to it. Anything being above 60% methane up to 80, whatever can be used for, can be, can be used, can be turned into heat. However, if you're beginning to look at large scale use of biogas for productive use, product, producing electricity, then the quality of the methane, the quality of the biogas would be very, very important because it would, it would determine what kind of equipment you will use it. But for homes, even though we're using say different materials, we're using a cow dung, maybe we're using chicken, uh, the quality of the, the gas for cooking is not really that, that very important. However, uh, we, we have to take precaution 
and this is normally done through user training. You have to equip the household with what they're supposed to do, how they're supposed to mix the, the, the material with water, and what not to do. We primarily know that chemical injection into the biogas system can affect the biogas production. We also know that some kind of materials, especially the chicken dung, if it has high content of nitrogen to the carbon ratio, it can affect the production of gas. And I think uh, within the team, we technically aware that if this happens, then there are certain procedures we do to, to help to, to no, not to affect the performance of that biogas. So this can only be done by ensuring that the users are properly trained on how to mix the biogas, I mean, to how to mix the, the, feed, the feed material. But I wouldn't be worried so much about the quality of the biogas that is being produced. Uh, on the design itself, what, what is produced from uh, cow dung is different from what is produced from uh, chicken dung in terms of the, the amount of biogas. So the technical people, when they're sizing up, they will know that if this is a chicken farmer, then we advise him or her to go for a particular size based on the biogas potential of that, that material being used. And that I think is already captured in the documents. I'm sure about that. Oh yeah. Thank you, Mr. Ampil. I hope you are answered, Romulis. Thank you. Last. Yes, uh, I always want to stress to individuals that uh, biogas plant, you should treat it like a, a living thing. That is how you should treat it. If you have to feed it, feed it. Because if you don't, then it can die. And the problem is that it's a dome which is underground. If it dies, you may have to empty it, break it down. And it's a, I, I was telling my friend he wanted a biogas. I, 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 tell, I told him that uh, you need to be there to always feed it. You, you can't just uh, have it there, leave it for a year, go back and find it alive. No. So this is what is very important to people who have these biogas digesters. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's hop. The final question was from Mr. Bagumbi. Um, if I got it correctly, he was speaking about research on biogas. Yes. Yeah, so as Raza Khaba has already indicated that we have, you know, a team of organizations and departments that are working together on this project. We have Bitri who are doing research on that project and they have determined you know, the different feedstocks that we have in the country that can produce biogas, what we have in the different areas and the kind of biogas that's coming out. Also at the same time, we have a consultancy that is running that is going to now quantify the biogas in comparison with the type of feedstock that's going in, as well as what the slurry would look like and what kind of crops that slurry would be suitable for. So those um, results will be shared as soon as the consultancy is done because it will now inform what will happen when the rollout comes on board and how the Ministry of Agriculture can also use that information to share with their farmers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much for a really wonderful, engaging uh, first session. We've got uh, more sessions to go. And Ludo, thank you very much for being such a wonderful moderator. And our expert from Uganda, thank you very much. Asante, Asan. <laughs> Akuna Matara. Thank you, thank you, Ludo. Um, I know we've we run way <laughs> out of the time that was allocated for this, but just to take us probably back to the theme of this conference, um, biogas for Botswana, a solution to energy and environmental challenges. As I was li listening to the speakers uh, from this session, I picked another aspect. So it's a solution not only to energy and environmental challenges, I also picked the social aspect of it. Um, we heard about the waste management, which uh, talks to the environmental challenge. We heard about the provision of gas, energy security. One of the speakers mentioned that 
regardless of the um, weather conditions, you are sure of having the energy. The biogas will still be running. And most importantly, our masons spoke about how being involved in this project actually changed their lives. So there's actually a social aspect to it as well. It's not only energy and environment. I just wanted to highlight that. Thank you. So we are about to go for our health and uh, energy break, just so that we can be re-energized. Uh, let's not forget to observe uh, the, the COVID-19 protocols and keep a safe distance and as much as is possible to keep our masks on and we keep sanitizing throughout the day. But um, yes, no, our wonderful panel can actually step down and um, we may proceed uh, is there a video that uh, you wanted us to, to, to watch? Not now, but as we go for the health break, I would like to ask our virtual, the, the ones who are joining us virtually to remain for a few minutes so we can check their mics because some of our speakers who will be coming in the next sessions will be uh, joining us virtually. So we'd like to test their mics and the video. Thank you. Thank you very much. And if there are any questions as well, uh, they can be posted on the page and then uh, we'll make sure that we we'll liaise with the technical team uh, to make sure that we pose those questions. So Ludo, you might find that there may have been a question, so we'll ask you that question from the floor, uh, anything that's coming from the digital space. Thank you very much. Hi, Bud. Can you hear us? Yes, loud and clear. Can you hear me? Okay, great. We just wanted to check your audio. Yeah, very well. 
Yeah, but you can keep talking. Where, where are you? Where, are you, where are we speaking to you from? Uh, Netherlands. I'm at uh, at home at the moment. Oh, that's great. Are you just <laughs> gonna be speaking, or are you gonna switch on your video as well, or are we just gonna hear your audio? Uh, I can switch on my my video. Let me check if that is working correctly. Do you see me? Um, yes, we see you. There's uh, just on the on the on the forehead. There's a bit of mustard. You can wipe it. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. All right, <laughs> but <laughs> sure. Uh, right. I, I have a presentation as well, a PowerPoint that I will. Yeah. Um, You'll share will the screen. Say. Okay, yeah. great. You want me to test that as well, or? Um, okay. I think they're confident. It's fine. Okay, good. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Hi, hi, Bart. Hello, good morning. Morning. I was also just testing mine. Thank you. <laughs> very well, thanks. So let's go have some snakes. No, Mago is not no, no, it's okay. Mm. But the music we can play in the background. Yes.
Alright! Let's get my tab. Ladies and gentlemen, um, we're about to start our next session. Can you please take our seats as our dignitaries will be joining us now for the next session. Let's take our seats. Hey, the point is what was the one the no, the video no, the 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 so there are two sessions that we need to squeeze in now. We're just waiting for the dignitaries to join us and they're coming shortly. No, we should be. So just I'll get another one. 
Welcome back. Yes. We're ready for session two and session three before our lunch break. Uh, we hope that you found the health break to be engaging. I've seen many conversations uh, taking place uh, on the side, and uh, we want you not to keep those details to yourself so that uh, when the Q&A opens up, you may share more of the enlightenment that you may have received during the break. Before we get to the panel discussion, session 2A, we have a moment of entertainment. We have our entertainers here. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, from Katen District, we've got Brokoko and Katsu Arepokuwi. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Tete <laughs> Mutumuabo <laughs> Kokaiya <laughs> 
gore bolo ko pila ga re se ikokotlelo sala ha tshela botswana ha re ka bolema ka bono ko pila re ke bo kotula ka melodi le mogolo kwane hela mo ba yo ke se beke le beke bolo ko rapa beke le beke bolo ko re ithutatsa pala hala ntebe ke robala borokokho ha ke tsoga le mpona be le re phokwana we e tshala mo ra ya lala phala phala ke bua ka motho ga moro ka ke bua ka lugo ke motho ma o ta o fokusi ya mo ke ya sa tla kota tsa tadi ba pela tsa poga a ba tsala ka hate ga malano ya le tsollo ke ra tere no nya morena no nya phuka tsa bo fatsa ditshipi a tsa bo lo go batsa maya ha ra ile mo ga re ga le watse mo le ha o ha go a e brika ka ra e brika e tshora ka nyana re fela imagine ya mari tsi 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 ile ga folo ga ke ga e folo sa ba yo kese a e pega mo ri mo se ka sa ka sa mo commissionera ke be ka u ka se ka le sa mo commissionera se re ba ka se re tswa ga mo nna mo wa mo tsara mana ba bo tsa putoro what is this hela kwa re bilo selo go sa botswe ene a re ke ba yo ke se ka di khontsa batswana di mole botlolong mo ka ga ke a tlhala a beswa o di bona ke a tlhala a beswa me phang lona ke a tlhala a beswa he re tla ba ka be kwa di khomo ka na ke re totobolosa ola matlakala o ke le ola matlakala ma ga re ga tsana a tlogela a tlogela bana re ba tsame ke go atla ka mo roga ba tsame ke mantswane ntshwane a re le ke tla tsa boloko ba khomo le ba le ba khulobe he re ke se ke go pa di pulwane ke tla bopa mollo e tla nna mollo a kgola ga ne o tla kgola ga nya batho o tla kgola ga nya ditshaba ke ditwera a pare ditwera a iphina ka le mpona le re phoko we Takantsu ke tlhatlharua ana tlhakatlhakano tsa tlhakana la seriti tlhaloganyo nya me botso tsa nna mafara tlhatla tsa tlhokana le tlhaloso ba yo ke se ke yone ka nthalose tsa dipotso tseo he la le nthetse nthata e ma mbasadi basadi e mang ka dilao le me le ditshwano tsa lona ditledi le tshwanne mantshwane ntshwane o ka re dua tsa bana ba tshame ka bo atla go morago ga ntlo ka re mantshwane ntshwane o ka re dua tsa bana ba ntshabe ka mmantwane child line ngwana le kukwa wa swakelwa ba nna tle botswana ka fatsela ka gitswa ka re nne ka ka giso he la afrika e borwe se zero le dikhako mona te ba o tapa tapa kwa no zimba ko re pa ka thata ya re botswana ka fatsela ma shili di notsi ke bidwa go te phorogotlo ha ke robetse ke robala borokokho ha le mpona be le re phokwa na we Yala cha cha oka yala phala phala thoko e ke a kwa mutshudi a khafela ke a bo selo se mo go pose mo maribelong a bo tshini ke motho a bo maputlako ba bo thube ka mola na ke motho a bo thube ka mola ba go thube fela ga re bena le ga re ba ka sala re tshame ka motshame go ka re matho a ka mashimi ga ke a bo ro bana ke tshame ka motshame go a ntse ke go tshise ke mo khobela tsa ta phala phala o sala la go ba bo tshobe ka re go ba puti mo a ke tsenya ba mposa puso a re na re phala phala tso sana anka go ka re ra tso ga ba ra e monna phoko wa ka mosadi ga nka la bo tshupa sa bigella le so bile mosadi ga nka la bo tshupa sa bitswa ba nna ba le khotla khotlagana le khotlaganye me goma le tsente ma le le mele sota la khosi ka na motho khola a pula o buswa a bofologa pula go dikego ne la me dipiri tu pa dupengwa ge ntsa ka tlego la ke moshwa ngwa mo khatla ke tswa khatleng ke khata bo khabo bo khabo ba khatlega tso bona ke khatlile ba khwa ke ba bona monnyu wa go ntse montla yeno ka re tonkitsa ko khatleng di bona le rotse ahe mo tsa ma isa tiro ba nna ra itlotla e bile ba nna gang ke di diana e bile ba nna gang ke re la tlhana ge se mo ka mpara la tla bona bana fela Thank you, thank you. That was beautiful. It's talent. It's not everyone who can do that. Uh, this is taking us to our next session. Uh, by guest project results. We must realize that from this project, we didn't only benefit from the biogas digesters themselves or the gas itself. A lot of other things have been um, have come up from the project and uh, in the next session we'll be talking about the results looking at the energy sector after that we'll have another session that will look at the results which are aligned with the environmental sector so our next session will be moderated by the director of energy mr mada sakabo our panelists we have ms kelebogile moremi We have Mr. Kabole Kaunyane. We have Mr. Isaiah Mulenga. We have Mr. Enrique Patino and Dr. Edwin Rakati. May I kindly ask you to step to the podium and give the honors to Rasa Kabo to introduce your panelists and take us through the panel discussion. Thank you.
sorry, we're just changing the positions so that we can capture them correctly on the cameras. Uh, good afternoon, once again, ladies and gentlemen. We will start uh, our session, which is uh, biogas result, project results, focusing more on uh, issues of energy. Um, we have uh, almost an hour to, to do this. Now, I know that I've been frantically paging through because I do realize that uh, somebody's not around. So I don't know how I'm going to introduce you, but uh, I think I see Kelebu again. Yes, um, let me, Kelebu is a passionate consultant legislative counsel with a meticulous attention to detail. She holds a master's of law degree in advanced legislative studies from the University of London and has 15 years plus of legislative drafting and energy regulation experience. Garnered mostly at Attorney General's Chambers, Botswana. And from having worked very closely with the Minister of Mineral Resources, uh, Energy Security and Green Technology and Botswana Energy Regulatory Authority. Ladies and gentlemen, let's uh, welcome Kelebo uh, Remi. And then um, let me also introduce you, Dr. Edward uh, Rakhati, who is a senior research uh, in the field of energy. He is currently working as a senior researcher at the uh, Botswana Institute of uh, Technology Research and Innovation, BITRI, since uh, August 2014. So that gives him seven years and registered as a professional engineer with the Botswana, Botswana Engineering and Registration Body. As senior researcher, he's heading the energy division of battery with the responsibility of managing energy research activities, mainly along the lines of renewable energy and energy management. Before joining battery, he worked at the University of Botswana from 1997 to 2014, where he rose through the ranks to senior lecturer where his main responsibility was to teach both to undergraduate and graduate students power in power engineering and related uh, courses. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Dr. Edward Rakhat. And uh, lastly, uh, left, let's, uh, let me introduce Mr. Cabo Joel Kavignani, who is, a senior, who is currently a senior standards engineer at the uh, Botswana Bureau of Standards. He's a, student, he's a senior standards engineer, as I've said, and he's focused on the development of standards in the following areas, energy, fire security, and metal casing. He has nine years of work experience in the development of standards and the enforcement of compulsory standards with POPs. He's a graduate of the University of Botswana with a Bachelor of Engineering Mechanical. He's a lead auditor in ISO 9001, that's quality management systems, and ISO 4501, which is occupational health and safety management systems. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Rea Kabo Juel Lekaunyan. sorry for the interruption. We've just been informed that uh, Mr. Isaiah Mulenga and Mr. Enrique Patino are joining us online. So I presume they will briefly introduce themselves as you give them the podium. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, if you give me the opportunity to introduce Re Azaya Mulenga, 
who is a renewable energy engineer. Uh, he's, he is a consultant with 13 years of professional experience in energy modeling, energy efficiency, ident and identification of renewable energies. Uh, but technology potential, energy needs assessment, resource mapping, design of productive use of energy projects, energy policies, legal and regulatory framework, energy standards and conformity assessment. He has worked both in the public sector responsible for development of national electrotechnical standards, energy regulations and energy policy, as well as in the private sector as an energy specialist, consulting with the USAID on the Southern African Energy Program, SAEP, and as the Bioenergy National Consultant for LTS International on a DFID Transformation Energy Access T product. He is currently working as an assistant country manager with the Africa Clean Energy Technical Assistant Facility and FCDO program with a focus on, stand, on standalone systems, solar systems. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Mr. Azaya Mulenga. Um, I think we have one more um, uh, participant whom I will kindly ask that uh, they introduce themselves. Please, over to you. Thank you. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Chairman. Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Enrique Patiño. I've been a uh, consultant for more than 20, 35 years, uh, basically in uh, policy, regulation, tariffs, uh, planning. Uh, and uh, I've been engaged uh, for the project of uh, reviewing and updating the renewable energy uh, feeding tariff in Botswana uh, this uh, last year. Well, I say last year because with COVID it was a little bit uh, elastic, the, the period. So thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, thank you very much for letting me uh, be here. And uh, well, Mr. Chairman, uh, let's go ahead. Hola, como estas, Enrique? Uh, do you mind switching on your uh, camera so we can just uh, put the name to the face? Sure, no problem. Uh, yeah, just... Uh, it's coming. Go back to Enrique Unatuba, Unatuba camera. Sorry, 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 sorry. Am I just... It's okay. Can you hear? Can you see? Oh, there you are. Where, where are you speaking to us from? From Uruguay, South America. From Uruguay, okay. Let's give him a round of applause. De nada. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I have five panelists and uh, I have 50 minutes to go through uh, the program. What I will do, I will give each one of them seven minutes. The three minutes will be mine. And only on very difficult uh, occasions will I allow them to go beyond the seven minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Biogas Project Results. We are focusing on energy. And uh, the first question I would like to uh, be addressed by Mekele uh, Bukhile Moremi to talk on biofuel guidelines. Mamoremi. Uh, thank you very much, Reza Khabo, and good afternoon. Oh, good morning, everyone. Um, I think uh, mine is just to, uh, to speak on the outcomes and the benefits of the biofuel guidelines that were developed as uh, part of the regulatory interventions um, that were put to support alternative ways of increasing renewable energy, the renewable energy mix in the country, and also uh, integrating agro waste uh, as one of uh, the, the measures uh, towards generating uh, energy. Um, I'll <clears throat> first start by saying that 
Biofuel production is one of the Ministry of Mineral Resources, Green and Technology and Energy Security near-term strategies to address energy security and climate change. Biofuel production can contribute to industrial development and help create jobs. Potentially, biofuels can also decrease dependence on petroleum products, which are imported at high prices in this country. Hence, biofuels are promoted as a sustainable solution in the energy sector. However, lately an increasingly critical discussion has evolved and risks associated with biofuel production and utilization are being analyzed. Among them are the negative effects of biofuel production on the environment, food security, and food prices. As to the opportunities, they are several and varied. Botswana has the chance to reorganize its energy mix by attaining its focus on renewable energy sources like biomass and biofuels. It, also, it has also the possibility to induce a major change in one of the most strategic oil dependent economic areas, uh, which is transportation. The answer on how to do all this is clearly a policy decision. However, through the biofuel guidelines that we developed as part of the biogas project, we are able to provide adequate tools for the government of Botswana to reevaluate its renewable energy priorities. It is increasingly recognized that a more consistent set of Okay, set of policies and approaches towards both fuels is needed based on a clearer understanding of their implications that are now emerging. Policies must be aimed at grasping the potential opportunities um, offered by biofuels while carefully managing the indisputable risks that they also present. They must be consistent with policies in other related areas and based on a clear and sound policy clear and sound policy uh, principles if they are to be effective. Unfortunately, these policies must also be formulated in a situation of considerable uncertainty. Nonetheless, when biofuel production is carried out with caution and forethought, biofuels have been shown to have positive effects. Projects and programs, therefore, need to be better prepared to mitigate the negative environment in impacts. Uh, to take advantage of these opportunities, Botswana needs to take a momentous decision without any further delay. The prospects of economic rewards in trade, particularly in transportation and the transportation sector, as well as the new asset of energy security, make a timely change of Botswana's energy mix. A kind, this is the kind of multifaceted challenge that the shift towards cleaner renewable energy sources like biomass and fuel and biofuels are suitable to deal with. With regards to policy coherence, biofuel developments are shaped by dif different, uh, several uh, uh, different policy domains, uh, agriculture, energy, transport, environment, and trade, often without clear coordination or co coherence among the policies pursued in each. Only if the role of biofuels is considered in relation to each of these policy domains can it be ensured that they play the appropriate role in reaching the various policy objectives. For example, uh, biofuels currently rely on many of the same agricultural commodities that are destined for food use. Their feedstock compete with conventional agriculture for land and other uh, productive resources uh, food and agriculture are therefore central to the biofuel policy development. At the same time, biofuels are only among many possible sources of renewable energy, a field where te technological innovation is moving rapidly. Therefore, uh, as we were developing the biofuel guidelines, we considered within the wider context of the energy, we considered this within the wider context of energy policy. Similarly, biofuel, biofuels only constitute one option of reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and so must be evaluated against alternative mitigation strategies. <clears throat> on, the basis, on those basis, the biofuel guidelines aim to establish guidelines to help mitigate 
the negative environment and socioeconomic impacts of future biofuel pro uh, pro projects. The guidelines highlight sustainability indicators that can be used to rate projects without significant risks and those that exhibit potential risks and those with high risks that cannot be mitigated. In relation to environmental sustainability, the guidelines examine greenhouse gas emissions, biodiversity protection, and land use and resource use efficiency, as well as water and, uh, and uh, soil and water impacts. The guidelines further address how research and development can be used for policy and project formulation at a national level. The guidelines therefore give practical assistance in the selection of projects, making sure that no adverse or these limited adverse effects um, that are caused as we carry out this project. This will allow implementation of the biofuel project that can bring real benefits to local communities, such as employment, self-sufficiency in energy generation and reduction of, of poverty. In terms of the impact that we foresee uh, as a result of the development of these guidelines and the uh, growth of the energy sector, um, I can sum up by saying that the biofuel guidelines for Botswana are developed as a tool to guide interested stakeholders, local and foreign investors, including project developers and applicants who would like to invest in biofuel project, uh, production in Botswana. Recognizing the role of many actors in the biofuel production, uh, specific guidance is targeted to the government and developers and researchers at each stage of the value chain. While care uh, was taken to be as thorough and specific as possible in the guidelines, we should highlight that not <coughs> the guidelines are not ground implementation specific or site specific and are not able to capture all aspects of best practice for site level management. It must be noted also that many knowledge gaps in, exist regarding various suggested feedstock and the economic system in which they will be grown. The guidelines will most likely be of very, uh, varying value to different users, depending on whether they are applied to new or existing infrastructure. <clears throat> or existing developments. As it respects existing developments, the guidelines can be adapted and improved in a number of ways by applying parts of the guidelines that are relevant to production, transport and processing stages of the project. Scale issues will also greatly affect how these guidelines are used by different stakeholders. And I think I'll just conclude by highlighting that we develop these guidelines consistently and in conformity with the laws of Botswana. And we also took into account government in, uh, initiatives on renewable energy. They therefore provide a policy and regulatory framework for biofuel production in Botswana. The guidelines are therefore intended to inform where policies and, pr and practices in biofuel production and also to influ influence decision makers to us uh, um, recognizing biofuel as one of the uh, renewable energy alternatives that can be used in the energy mix within the country. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much and uh, thank you for that applause. I think uh, she didn't do quite, quite bad with regard to time, but she owes me two minutes. That's fine. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we uh, uh, thankful to the senior council for the presentation. The next item here is uh, biogas standards, and uh, that will be given by none other than Mr. Kabo Joel Lekawanyani, the senior standards engineer. Uh, Mr. Lekawanyani, you have uh, seven minutes starting now. Thank you, sir. And thank you, uh, uh, Director uh, Mr. Zakamo. 
I am Mr. Lekaunyane from Botswana Bureau of Standards. Uh, and my organization, which I represent, is mandated to develop national standards. And as such, we are not left out when this uh, project was rolled out. We, as Botswana Bureau of Standards, through technical committees, which is mainly a group of stakeholders, experts, and, and other interested parties who gather together to develop standards. We have since developed two standards, Botswana standards with regards to biogas. And the first standard is basically on agricultural structure, which is biogas plant. And then the second one is a standards that we have actually adopted from ISO, which is FDS ISO 20675, which is on definitions with regards to biogas. Uh, in terms of the, uh, 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 the standards, which is A36, uh, it entails the minimum requirements for a biogas plant that utilize animal waste. So I believe most of the speakers who have just previously talked, they have mentioned the building of Mansori biogas digesters, which utilize animal waste. And as such, I believe the standard would address such. Uh, in terms of the international standards, uh, there isn't much development with, within that regard. We have at the moment four published standards, international standards by ISO. The first being the one that we have adopted, which is ISO 20675 of 2018, which is on definitions. And the second one being ISO 23590 of 2020, which speaks of household biogas plant systems, which uh, talks to design, operation, maintenance, and safety. And the third one that has so far been developed by international standards is 22580 of 2020, which is, which is on the manufacture, the design, and the installation of flares, which basically talks of uh, burning biogas, and then uh, the fourth standard, which have recently been published as well, is with regards to biogas systems of non-household and of non-gasification. In terms of uh, the benefits that are attached to biogas standards, you will note as stakeholders that are standards are tools basically that can be used to measure compliance. I have heard some of the speakers earlier when talking about compliance and the standards are a better place to address issues of compliance. And the standards so far that we have developed also addresses issues of uh, uh, sustainable development goals. The standards on biogas uh, addresses sustainable development goal number seven, which is on affordable clean energy. And it also, they also address uh, uh, SDG number 11, which is on sustainable cities and communities. And the standards that I have talked about basically talks about the safety. They, visit, they talk about uh, the environment, therefore ensuring that our communities are indeed sustainable. So in, in, in another uh, uh, regard, you note that standards also help us as regulators, as, uh, as legislators to make our work much, much easier. Just by uh, citing standards or quoting them within our regulations, it helps us and it also help us to uh, to avoid to coming up with a technical detailed uh, 
uh, documents which have already been developed. So just digitalizing a standard gives us opportunity to embed complex uh, designs in a regulation with that easy. So it's up to the nation to utilize the standards that have been developed in order to address the issues that I have uh, just addressed. With that, I will just uh, end here because in, in terms of the standards, uh, they are technical, detailed uh, documents. So if, if you were to go through the two standards, you will probably need a day or even up to a week just to go through step by step on those standards. But just for the sake of, of time management, let me end here. Thank you. Thank you for appreciating Rekka Bojuel Lekawinyani. But uh, as you answer questions, uh, maybe I could have missed it, but uh, talk to uh, whether these are compulsory or voluntary standards. Thank you so much. Um, the next uh, one is uh, um, SDG 7.2.1, data collection by Mr. Isaiah Mulenga. Mr. Mulenga, kindly indicate to the audience where you are joining us from. Over to you, Sir Mulenga. Thank you, moderator. I think I, I could not unmute so, uh, that was a delay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Am I audible now? Yes, uh, Mulenga, we can hear you kindly. I will reset the, the watch. Your seven minutes starts now. Kindly uh, come through, we can hear you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank, you. thank you so much, uh, moderator. Uh, my name is Isaiah Mulenga. And I'm uh, joining in from Lusaka, Zambia. I'm a renewable energy uh, expert, and I'm happy to be part of this uh, wonderfully uh, organized uh, conference. Um, I was going to share my presentation. I don't know if I'll be allowed to share my screen. I have a short presentation just to uh, carry us uh, through. Okay, uh, it looks like I can't share my screen, but I can just quickly maybe just go through my presentation, um, if you allow me. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do a, a quick presentation on uh, the data collection for uh, sustainable uh, development goal number seven, uh, which is uh, specifically looking at uh, energy access. And, uh, for this, we are looking at indicator 7.2.1, specifically for, for Botswana. Uh, this is a study that, has, that is being funded by the UNDP. Uh, we are grateful for that. And, and basically, it's trying to ascertain the state at which Botswana is with regards to the target that was set for 2030 with meeting this particular SDG goal. A quick background. As we might be all aware uh, that on the 25th of September 2015, about 193 countries of the United General Assembly adopted the 2030 uh, Development Agenda titled Transforming Our World, which uh, brings into action 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, with these, they are associated about 169 targets and uh, uh, over 230 indicators. Botswana has domesticated the SDGs and the global SDG indicators that are applicable to Botswana. Uh, uh, but for greater importance to this forum, I think, uh, like I mentioned, is, is SDG 7, which is about to ensure access to affordable, uh, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all by 2030. We are all cognizant of the fact that energy is central to nearly every major challenge and opportunity in the world. Uh, today. Uh, when you look at jobs, security, climate change, and everything, you realize that 
uh, central to these aspects is, is the aspect of, of energy. And therefore the challenge that we have as, as the global community is trying to transition the global economy towards clean and sustainable sources of, of energy. Um, this study that we are carrying out basically is uh, trying to see um, uh, uh, the state at which Botswana is in meeting uh, the SDG 7. Uh, so like I mentioned, Botswana has domesticated the Sustainable Development Goals in Peters um, and all the global SDG indicators that, 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 that are applicable to, 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 the, uh, to all the UN countries. Now through the statistics, uh, uh, Botswana, the SDG indicators are mapped to the relevant pillar of the Botswana Vision 2036 and aligned to the National Development Plan and associated district and urban development plans. Uh, the country has gotten to a point where uh, they want to compile a full baseline of those indicators that are applicable and whose data is readily uh, available. Therefore, the purpose of this UNDP funded study is to try and carry out and be able to compile all data associated to SDG 7, target 7.2 and indicator 7.21, which is mapped to the vision 2036 of, of the SDG. The, 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 the three, uh, I, I want to be uh, categorical, the three is SDG 7 uh, specifically looks at uh, as a whole is to ensure access to affordable, reliable and sustainable and modern energy for all. And the target, which is target 7.2 is to increase the global percentage of renewable energy. Uh, the indicator for this is uh, renewable energy share in the total final energy consumption. So, uh, in short, what we're trying to do is to try and see how much percentage of renewable energy is uh, of the total energy consumption. At the end of the day, we want to find out the energy consumed, how much of it is renewable energy. And this is what the study is, is all about. Uh, so like I mentioned, uh, um, uh, the study would have to give an indication of the level at which uh, the target has reached. Uh, currently, Botswana has committed to a target of 15% of energy consumption to be from renewable energy by the year 2030. And this study will therefore give an indication of the level at which 15% has been reached, how much is left, and advise whether interventions proposed will allow achievement of the target. This study will compile all data associated to SDG 7, target 7.2 and indicator 7.21, which is, uh, like mentioned, already mapped to uh, Vision 2036. The project scope. Um, the project will be conducted remotely and, and will be limited to three categories of renewable energy as provided in the tracking SDG 7. Uh, so we are doing this project. We are not, I'm not based in, 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 in Botswana, but I'm based in, in Lusaka, Zambia, like I mentioned, but we are collaborating with colleagues on the ground in, in Botswana. And, and uh, this project, really the scope of the project is looking at at mainly three categories of renewable energy. And what we're looking at is uh, electricity generated from renewable energy. And, and, and under this category, we are looking at the three sources, which is hydro, wind, and solar. And also the other category is, is heat generated from uh, renewable energy. And I think this category is of interest to this conference because now this is where we're looking at uh, bioenergy and specifically municipal waste and, and biomass. But also we have a category that is looking at transport sector and, and, and the fuels that are used in the transport sector and how much of these fuels are as a source of renewable energy. And here we're looking at biofuels, crop-based ethanol and, and biodiesel. But also we've uh, thought of extending it to another category that, that, that is looking at issues to do with agribusiness, uh, commercial and public service. And here we, we are looking at sources such as biofuels, as well as, as biodiesel. And, and, and quickly, uh, uh, the, the, the study really focuses on, on the energy sector and has identified clearly um, uh, target uh, uh, institutions or stakeholders that are key to this particular study. And, and in this, we're looking at, of course, uh, with, with the ministry or, of course, the government departments uh, uh, involved in the energy space. But also we're looking at uh, producers, we're looking at consumers, we're looking at manufacturers, we're looking at the industry, but also with uh, strategic um, uh, institutions like Statistics Botswana. Of course, we also intend to work with 
with the Botswana Bureau of Standards to just understand the work they are doing around, around this, uh, uh, this sector. In terms of the approach and methodology, um, the performance of this particular indicator 7.21 is derived from a global energy statistic formula, which is used by the United Nations Statistics Division in accessing global energy statistics, uh, energy flows, categorization, and, and system coding. Uh, the formula is usually cascaded to national level, requesting for uh, different inputs from the different sectors to try and understand uh, the final energy consumption of a particular country. And in, and in this study, what we are looking, what we are focusing on is the actual final consumption. At the end of the energy consumption, how much of it is from renewable energy? And therefore, we are going to look at energy consumption in the manufacturing, uh, manufacturing sector, construction, and non-fuel uh, mining industry as one, one area. And then to this also we'll add energy consumption in the transport, like I mentioned, but also we want to look also at energy consumption uh, in other sectors, including household, agriculture, forestry, and formation. And once we come up with this, uh, uh, these sectors, we'll be able to add them, give us the final energy consumption. But also, even after we do this, we're going to categorize this into two areas, which is renewable energy and non-renewable energy, and be able to find a percentage of the renewable energy in the final uh, energy consumption to be able to give us and be able to compare whether what we have is actually what uh, Botswana has put as a target, which is 15%. And in a case where we feel that there is a short, we will therefore be able to advise what policies or regulatory framework that can be put in place to try and accelerate uh, uh, actions to meet, meet this target. Uh, in terms of the expected outputs, of course, after the end of the day, we'll be able to know whether Botswana is meeting uh, its, its, its target of 15% share of renewable energy in the final energy consumption by 2030. Therefore, we'll be able to set to be able to have a set of renewable energy indicators to show uh, exactly what is the current status. And also we'll be able to give a current percentage of renewable energy to the national consumption of energy in Botswana. But also I think most importantly, we'll be able to bring out the missing energy data that needs to be filled in to be able to assist Botswana to accelerate and be able to meet this particular target. The project uh, is ongoing. And Mr. Uh, Mr. Isaiah, you now have a... One minute, 30 seconds left. Thank you, moderator. The project is ongoing, quite a lot is happening. We are still collaborating with a number of uh, stakeholders uh, on the ground in Botswana. And I look forward to, 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 uh, to working with everyone else uh, around. I'll leave it here, Chair, for the, for the purpose of time, uh, unless there are other questions. Thank you so much, uh, moderator. Over to you. Uh, thank you for appreciating uh, Isaiah Malenga from uh, Zambia. We are greatly uh, thankful for the presentation. And uh, as uh, the Director of Ceremonies have actually indicated, let's kindly note our questions and uh, we'll ask them both online and uh, you know, um, particip all participants kindly just note your questions for um, at the end of the session. Um, now, I wish to call upon uh, Mr. Hendrik Patino to talk on the renewable energy fitting tariff guidelines. Mr. Patino, kindly again remind our audience where you are from, and uh, your seven minutes starts now. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name, again, Enrique Patino, uh, calling from uh, Uruguay, South America. Uh, my presentation, I'll try to be uh, on time, uh, short. Uh, I will structure it uh, uh, around the project uh, we had for reviewing and updating the renewable energy feeding tariff refit uh, guidelines for Botswana. These uh, guidelines were first developed in, in 2011 and uh, this uh, project, among uh, other objectives, uh, had uh, uh, to review and update these uh, guidelines. Was other objectives we can mention, propose a market-relevant tariff structure uh, for each renewable energy uh, technology and develop an action plan uh, for the recommended models. 
basically, I will focus on the on the first objective, which is which was uh, to review and update uh, the refit guidelines and how they are uh, connected and uh, to the uh, IRP uh, that Botswana uh, developed the integrated resource planning. Uh, because uh, it is uh, important to, to, to have a, a global view of uh, the sector and the different instruments that uh, we use to, to, to manage, uh, to guide, uh, and to implement the policies in, in the energy sector. Um, as uh, Mr. Mulenga said, uh, uh, I, I recall two uh, of the uh, aspects uh, he mentioned, one about the, the information, uh, the importance of the information and the information gathering as a basis for, for, for any process and specifically for this one, and the other about the uh, uh, different objectives and, and targets that uh, he had mentioned. And, and we will come uh, again uh, on this uh, by the end. So for developing the, you know, uh, feeding tariffs are one of the instruments, uh, price-based instrument uh, normally called uh, in, the, in, the, in the literature and, and international experience. And basically it, uh, uh, it uh, means uh, establishing a tariff for, uh, a certain uh, technology or 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 energy uh, technology production, and whoever uh, wants uh, to produce uh, will receive uh, that uh, uh, that tariff. Uh, limitations or or elements uh, that have been uh, mentioned uh, for about uh, this. Uh, uh, methodology is, for example, is, uh, well, uh, it may be uh, difficult, especially for the first time, to calculate uh, this uh, tariff uh, because, well, for the, it's a, a, a new uh, generation technology that uh, uh, we will be estimating uh, many parameters, maybe. Uh, it is not... Uh, maybe the impact in the uh, end user uh, consumer uh, because of the price uh, is important. Uh, maybe we cannot uh, manage uh, if there is uh, a lot of uh, 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 people who want to benefit from, from, from this uh, tariff, etc. So uh, uh, the first point was to develop a, a, a methodology uh, where uh, the important point was uh, trying to uh, uh, address uh, these problems and somehow uh, to solve them. Uh, we will now we will not go uh, uh, specifically in the in the uh, description of, of this scheme, uh, although it is not a complicated scheme. Uh, on the contrary, it is simple and transparent to 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 attract uh, uh, investment. Uh, just to mention that uh, there is, uh, a, uh, let's say, a classification of uh, alternatives and different met methods were uh, proposed, taking into consideration uh, previous uh, experience uh, in Botswana. As there are several exchanges with uh, stakeholders. Uh, finally, uh, what we had was uh, three uh, types of uh, uh, manners or three manners to uh, foster and, and, and introduce uh, renewables. One was uh, the traditional tenders, which uh, would be applicable for projects of a uh, utility scale uh, size, uh, projects uh, basically connected to the grid and uh, bigger than uh, 10 megawatts. So uh, a renewable uh, projects where uh, uh, each uh, unit was uh, bigger or each project was uh, bigger than 10 megawatts would be uh, made uh, through uh, a tender 
uh, international, uh, well, you know, open, etc., uh, tender. There is uh, already, or there was already uh, at the moment in, in, in Botswana, uh, a, a framework for distributor generation. Uh, this was uh, less for less than one megawatt, and that, and that we thought it would be good to keep it. Uh, so as uh, continue uh, with the uh, already uh, good experience and the renewable energy uh, feeding tariffs uh, was uh, let's say uh, limited to uh, the range of uh, one to ten uh, megawatt uh, 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 projects and uh, technology uh, specific. This 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 means that uh, for each. Uh, technology, say solar, say wind, say biogas, etc., uh, the uh, tariff uh, would be uh, the uh, uh, different. Uh, the point here, the important point here, was to rely this or, or to or to connect this with the uh, IRP, with the planning process. Uh, the planning process, uh, you know, it's uh, uh, the manner to uh, implement. Uh, all uh, policy uh, objectives uh, for the sector and uh, this uh, scheme for uh, refit and, 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 and the other manners of uh, introducing ten as tenders and distributed generation is uh, uh, strictly uh, linked to the uh, results of the planning process. This way uh, you uh, can have a a coherence between uh, policy design, the implementation of policy through uh, the integrated resource planning, and this uh, refit uh, a scheme or global scheme, not only for for, for the medium-sized project, uh, as a manner to uh, implement the results of. Uh, the uh, integrated uh, resource uh, plan. As I mentioned, uh, uh, the proposed uh, methodology for uh, uh, refit uh, allows uh, or addresses uh, the problems that uh, normally are uh, identified with a traditional uh, feeding tariff. Uh, allows yes sorry you are left with one uh, one minute 30 seconds to end up okay Thank no problem uh, let's a couple of things uh, uh, only uh, as part of the of the project we uh, uh, estimated some of the feeding tariff or possible feeding tariffs under uh, different uh, 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 assumptions and uh, we had results that uh, were uh, quite uh, reasonable, and uh, if we consider that uh, if that they they were uh, cost uh, reflective, we would say that uh, these uh, renewable uh, energies under the, the feeding tariff uh, uh, model could be uh, quite close uh, to uh, being competitive even with uh, very uh, little uh, uh, subsidy. Uh, so again, the point here important to, to finalize, uh, the point here is important to mention that the scheme is uh, very transparent. It is uh, simple. It uh, addresses the traditional uh, problems that were mentioned about uh, feeding tariffs, and it is uh, strictly linked to the results of the integrated resource planning, which uh, allows uh, streamlining uh, uh, policy uh, planning and planning uh, implementation. Uh, uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Patino, and please uh, remember that you owe me a minute, okay? One minute? So much. Yes, you owe me one minute. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Very much. I appreciate it. Uh, let's appreciate Mr. Patino, please.
Thank you. And uh, last but not necessarily least, we have uh, Dr. Edward Rakati, who will be taking us through small scale digester design and patenting innovative data collection pilot. Dr. Rakati, um, over to you, sir. Your seven minutes starts now. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Edward Rakati. As, as the chair has already said, uh, I'm going to touch on two items. Uh, there is digester design and remote monitoring part, which you've, which you've also touched on. Uh, but maybe before I could start, I should highlight that Bitri, though the project is ending next year, Bitri will still be there for the R&D part. Let me assure the audience that Bitri is still there. Uh, uh, so we'll be, we'll, we'll be more than available to assist when it comes to the R&D part of this project. But to go straight on the subject matter, uh, uh, what has actually been underlined is actually the digester design. Uh, basically, when it comes to small scale digesters, we, we rolling out, the project is rolling out small scale digesters. For you to roll out the small scale digester, you need a design of that particular digester. That's one of the things that I'm going to talk to. Uh, and the design that we actually underlining in this particular case is the brick and mortar, fixed dome brick and mortar digester. Before we concluded on the brick and mortar digester, we actually did desktop study of other materials. Fiberglass being one of them, uh, uh, plastic being one of them. And we landed based on the research results on the brick and mortar digester. That's one of the things that I want to, to underline. And in addition to that, in addition to that, when it comes to a digester, there are so many components to consider. I think Reo Gelo has actually touched on that. There's the substrate part. That is what you feed into the digester. It can be cow dung, it can be any biodegradable. You can feed it into the, the digester. But then the gas production will actually depend on what you feed onto your digester. Chemists will say carbon to nitrogen ratio of that particular substrate. That's one of the things that we are continually looking into that. We've actually touched on that in addition to the, to the digester design. The second part is actually the reaction itself, the anaerobic reaction. For you to be able to digest the agro waste, it goes through what you call anaerobic reaction. As researchers, we are also looking into that. The other part that you can also look into is the gas. That is the CH4, which is the primary output of the digester. You, you can also analyze what you produce from your digester. That's one of the things that we also looked into. Uh, one other thing again that you can look into is the other byproduct. That is the, the fertilizer part. You can also look into that. But out of the project, when we underline the digester design, I want to say uh, we've come up with designs of small scale digesters. 
four up to maybe 30 cubic. Obviously, a digester, the bigger it becomes, the, uh, the, the bigger the diameter. There's mathematics behind that. Uh, if somebody is interested, we can take him through that. That is to design a digester. What are the factors that you consider so that you end up with that sizable, those measurements of your digester. But what I can say when it comes to a digester, uh, we've trademarked uh, the digester designs. So we do have digester designs. And what I can say, which is one of the things that has actually been underlined is that we've actually experimented uh, this particular digester designs by first experimenting on 30 digesters. And the answer was obviously a success. That's why we ended up now rolling out to 200 digesters. But as I'm saying, I'm underlining the brick and mortar uh, when it comes to digesters. Uh, one other part when it comes to a digester, imagine having a digester Komuchudi, where I come from, and sitting here. I mean, how are you going to be able to monitor if your digester is operational? That's why we then come up with what we call remote monitoring system of our digesters. So we've come up with uh, what I can call the remote monitoring system uh, of the digesters. We are currently experimenting on two digesters, uh, one in Tlokweng and one in Sojwe. We are currently experimenting on that, but so far so good. We are able to, to sort of monitor the CH4 uh, and other impurities that you actually generate uh, during the process. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, I think. <laughs> uh, Doc, <laughs> let's give him a, a round of applause. He was actually spot on in time. Thank you, sir. You saved us a bit of time. Um, I don't know how much time the, director of, the directors of ceremonies will give us, but uh, we can field a few questions. Thank you uh, very much. To, thank you, sir. I'll be as strict as you are. But, um, yeah, this was very acute and a very interesting session. Um, there we go. I think it's closer to you, uh, my dear colleague. How are one of the reports or how? Yes, please proceed. Oh, thank you. And, intro and introduce yourself. Th thank you, Chair. My name is Buti Mohoti. I'm from Buang. Uh, I have a question which I want to direct to the speaker who talked about the guidelines. I'm just wondering, or oh, I want to hear her, her opinion, especially regarding the use of biofuels for transportation. Because if you look at the international trend, I think more investment is going towards electrical, electric vehicles. If you look at the major manufacturers, car manufacturers, they are investing into electric vehicles. So there's hardly much going into biofuels. So I just wanted to know what in her opinion are the prospects for for use of biofuels in transportation, given the, that the technology, the vehicles, but more 
investment is going towards electric. I think even in Botswana, I think our president even said that he wants to build to produce an electric grid. So I just wanted to know the opinion. But obviously, transportation is just a a, a fraction of where the the uh, biofuels go. So there will be other uses, but I just wanted to know your uh, opinion with regard to the transport sector. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, sir. I think uh, the question was uh, for me uh, about uh, biofuels in transport. Can we have another hand here? Sorry. Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is uh, Walter Moisese. I'm coming from Botswana Power Corporation. Um, my question, I think, will be directed to the gentleman that was presenting from South America. You know, to try and simplify the the concept of feeding tariff. I think uh, just for the ordinary person, lay person, to know what this feeding tariff means you know, in simplified terms and how it works. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Engineer Lauters, my name from ERB. Uh, my question goes to Mr. Patino on the uh, refit. I couldn't get uh, the methodology they followed clearly in terms of reviewing the, the guidelines. Um, whether it depended on um, tender submission reviews or the estimations they were talking about, because one would be interested in knowing where the biogas fits in, in terms of the renewable energy sources hierarchy, um, just as more information on that. And to Dr. Rakati, the remote monitoring system, um, did you indicate that this study is still ongoing with the two sites? Um, what are you trialing now? Maybe, maybe you didn't uh, um, elaborate on, on the trials that you are doing at the two sites. Thank you. I don't see any other hand, Raskabo. I guess we can answer the questions. Okay. I think we have a professor, we have Dr. Rakati and then we'll go to uh, online participant. Um, over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, CEO ERB. Uh, your question is on the remote monitoring system. Uh, where are we in terms of the remote monitoring system? Uh, we've, we've planted, that is we have uh, we have implemented the remote monitoring system on those two particular plants that I'm referring to. We are currently, we are currently receiving data uh, based on that particular uh, two experimental sites. Uh, I think uh, we have a demo that uh, one of my team members is here. We have a demo that we can we can actually demonstrate uh, what is actually going on in terms of the remote monitoring system. But we are able to gather data that is to see what is really going on in those particular plants in terms of CH4 and other parameters. Thank you. 
Well, I think uh, I, I'm also thirsty to know more, but uh, uh, time is not on our side. Uh, can we have uh, uh, Mr. Patino uh, responding? I think there was something for you. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, there were, as I noted, uh, three questions. I'll try to be very brief in each of one. Uh, biofuels in transport uh, and electric uh, electric uh, transport, electric cars uh, in the future. Biofuels in transport are, are, are let's say, uh, today uh, quite uh, uh, normal in terms that there are many experiences. Many, many years ago, Brazil had a, a very big program for uh, alcohol, using alcohol produced with, with the sugar cane uh, in, in transport. And, and it was, at the moment, uh, quite successful. And today, you can find many experiences of uh, uh, mixing uh, a certain uh, quantity of uh, biofuel with uh, the traditional fuels, especially gas oil and so on. So uh, there, there, there's no, there, there is no uh, 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 problem and there are quite a lot of experiences and, and it would be a, a, a policy decision from government if uh, introducing uh, these uh, kind of uh, mixes in the in the fuel uh, consumption for transport. Now about uh, electric uh, cars, let's say uh, for the future, they are uh, quite a, an interesting uh, opportunity and also an interesting problem for 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 for, for utilities. Uh, to supply the points uh, for for charging the vehicles, but this uh, could be, uh, let's say, a problem of uh, uh, planning uh, the grids uh, and the generation uh, uh, system accordingly to uh, supply these demands uh, that uh, are, uh, let's say, a little bit uh, different and will influence uh, differently in the grid than uh, the standard demands we are uh, used to. So that would be for the question of uh, biofuels in transport and electric mobility. Uh, BPC uh, had uh, asked uh, to explain uh, clearly or more clearly, which is what is a feed-in tariff. Feed-in tariff uh, means uh, uh, for a certain technology, let's take an example, for example, for solar technology, to estimate how much would uh, cost uh, producing electricity with solar and establishing a tariff uh, uh, for this. And whoever uh, is interested in producing uh, electricity with uh, a solar system would be uh, receiving that uh, tariff. So, uh, in other words, uh, the authority in Botswana would calculate a certain tariff, say, I don't know, uh, uh, around uh, $80 uh, per megawatt hour. And he would say, okay, whoever wants to come here and uh, produce uh, electricity with a solar system, I will be paying, or PPC will be paying $80 per megawatt that it is injected in the grid. That's the uh, simple uh, concept of uh, feeding tariff. Set a tariff, and whoever who wants to produce receives that tariff. The tariff can be, uh, and many times is uh, what we call technology specific, that is, for a solar system, you have a, you have a certain tariff. Uh, for wind generation, you had a different tariff. For uh, biogas generation, you had another, another tariff. So you can address differences between uh, the different uh, alternatives or technologies for producing. Uh, 
finally, there was another question about uh, clarifying a little bit uh, the methodology uh, uh, proposed and the difference between tender and, and feeding tariff. Uh, first, let's say that we didn't go into detail in the proposed uh, uh, methodology because there's no time, but uh, uh, the, that uh, we mentioned that there are that we propose a combination of tendering processes and feeding tariff processes. And what we said that was that uh, for bigger projects, those uh, utility scale projects that are uh, connected uh, to the grid and, and they are uh, big ones, in this case, uh, bigger than 10 megawatt of capacity, uh, the method uh, to follow would be a tender. Tender is the traditional uh, uh, tendering process where the authority calls, uh, uh, for example, to uh, install a, 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 a solar uh, uh, production uh, project of uh, 15 megawatts in some place in, in Botswana. And this way, uh, uh, people come and offer the, the prices and the lowest price is uh, uh, awarded. This is the traditional tendering process. Uh, big projects, bigger than uh, 10 megawatt, uh, and uh, they would follow this uh, process. Feeding tariff, the one which we've just uh, explained in the previous comment, would be for uh, uh, projects that are between 1 and 10 megawatts. For that range, uh, there would be a feeding tariff process, that is, uh, whoever who wants to come and install uh, solar, solar panels, uh, wind uh, generators, uh, biogas digesters uh, producing uh, electricity and connect uh, to the grid. Whenever they are uh, between 1 and 10 megawatt uh, capacity, they would be receiving a pre-fixed uh, tariff by the authority. Well, I, 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 I don't know if it was uh, sufficiently clarified, sir. Uh, if not, uh, we can go more in detail, but uh, I think we are quite uh, tight in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, time, so uh, up to you if you wish to, to go more in detail or, or this, if this is uh, sufficient. Thank you. Thank you. He was shaking his head. I'm not going to hand the microphone to the engineer. He will soon get into his mathematical calculations and then we won't see lunch. But there's a, a hand up. Okay, no, what I really wanted to clarify as uh, the director has asked, the two standards have been approved as voluntary standards. Standards are, they are either approved as mandatory or voluntary, and the two has been approved as voluntary. And the voluntary standard, however, they may also be made mandatory through referencing in regulations, in tender documents, and other legislations. And I also want to highlight that the two standards that I'm talking about have been approved. However, we are awaiting the signature of the minister as in to declare them as Botswana standards. So in that regard, you may not necessarily be able to access them from this conference if you want to purchase them. So I believe early next year, the minister will be done with the gazettement and as such, the public will be able to acquire such documents. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I think that brings us to the presentation. I think uh, it's a science presentation, ladies and gentlemen. Let's give uh, our presenters a, a round of applause. Thank you very much, uh, 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 Rasekhabu. Uh, my brother, 
definitely, I'm starting with your question. But we're also going to discuss it. But thank you very much, uh, panelists. Just in, introduce yourself so we all remember that. All right. My name is Erisi Pomakorucha from Bera, Botswana Energy Regulator Authority. Agarla Wanano. Eh, how about the Rubats are less than Madia to Hale, Harsimular Rena, Harvard to Suduela Conference? Thank you very much. We are doing very badly on time, but we have another session before we go for lunch. It will be conducted differently. And uh, our moderator, uh, Mr. Getalefetze Mokoko, who's the chief policy scientist for the Department of Waste Management and Pollution Control, uh, is going to be uh, one of my really good friends uh, in assisting us uh, to go through this final session before the lunch break which is biogas, the project results, and we're speaking about the environmental uh, results. Mr. Kintafetsi uh, Mukokwe. Thank you very much. But the panelists, uh, we have the green certification framework Biogas, uh, waste water data collection, Mr. Tabo Kumuitsile, the integrated waste management bill, Ms. Kelebukhile Moremi, feasibility study for biogas digester at BMC, Professor Andrew uh, Obok, Obok, EMP for biogas digester at BMC. Ms. Komoto Motopi, and uh, waste paper segregation pilot, Ms. Tenolo Sicheli. Uh, may you please join the podium. We're also joined um, digitally or online by Mr. Eden Wildly. He's the development, uh, he's with the development of uh, the environment and social management framework. Uh, Eden, may we please get uh, you to to say hello and see if you are still with us. Mr. Eden Waldi. Okay, maybe he's having uh, technological challenges. Uh, we'll see if he's able to join us. Mr. Kintlafiz, I don't know the format of how you want this to, to pan out, but uh, in lieu of the time, and go straight to the chase uh, as, as much as is possible. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, good morning, everybody. We have um, around 30 minutes to go through our session. Um, my name is Ken Tlafezi Mokokwe. Um, I work for the Department of Waste Management and Pollution Control as a chief scientist. Um, today's session, we are going to be discussing biogas benefits, but uh, focusing on environmental issues. Um, earlier this morning, uh, the Minister for uh, Minerals and uh, Green Technology and later on, the uh, director of energy did indicate that um, the role of government is to provide a conducive environment for business through development of policies and legislation. Um, my Ministry of Environment, this year alone, uh, managed to pass two policies for approval by parliament. One of them is the integrated waste management policy, which promotes sustainable waste management practices, uh, mostly through the circular economy. And the other policy is the climate change policy, which outlines adaptation and mitigation measures uh, which would assist us in meeting our regional and international obligations. 
Um, to the panelists, um, I'm going to give them five minutes each. And what I would like from them is that uh, they just give objectives of the study or what the study intends to, 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 to address the main findings or results or achievement of that particular assignment and any recommendations that results from that uh, study. Just in a brief uh, manner. I think you should be able to do that in, in five minutes. Um, I would now like to introduce my, my guests. Um, I will start with uh, Mrs. Tendaka Palai. Uh, Tendaka is currently the Vice President of the Architects Association of Botswana. She is a licensed architect in South Africa and Botswana with 10 years, more than 10 years experience in the architectural industry. She holds a master's degree in architecture from the University of Cape Town and completed business and entrepreneurship at Rutgers University Business School, New Jersey in 2018. Through the Mandela Washington Fellowship, through the Mandela Washington Fellowship, she is the founder and the director of Le Bon Architects in Gaborone. In her professional career, she has worked on projects in Botswana, Rwanda, Kenya, and South Africa. Tandeka has a passion for women empowerment and sustainability. Ladies and gentlemen, please uh, welcome Ms. Tandeka Palai. Um, I would ask uh, Mepalai to now go ahead with a presentation on green certification framework. Please go ahead, Mr. Ms. Palai. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, sir, for the introduction. My name, as he's um, already mentioned, is Ms. Tandeka Palai. Uh, by profession, I'm an architect but working in partnership on a consultancy with the UNDP to develop a green certification framework for Botswana. So just to give you a brief overview of the certification framework and also for the sake of time, I'll try and keep this quite short. So a green certification framework really is a rating tool used to assess, allocate points and recognize buildings and industries which meet certain green requirements or standards. So in its entirety, holistically, points are awarded in line with sustainable approaches to energy and water use, internal environment, pollution, transport, materials, waste ecology, management processes, and life cycle in buildings and industries. There are various green rating tools around um, the world globally, available globally, but our task and the purpose of our engagement with the UNDP is to develop one specifically and relatively to Botswana. So we will be developing a certification framework through a system that will provide third party verification of buildings and industries, um, assessing their environmental performance in two main areas of wastewater management and energy management and efficiency. So the, the, the task really is to develop this framework specifically to those two main areas, which fit into the broader um, aspect of green building and sustainability. So the aim and the outcome of the exercise as well is to then create a comparative recognizable label that industries and buildings can use um, when they incorporate and they make use of sustainable measures within their practices, their practice and processes. So this will allow existing and new buildings and industries um, to be able to measure the sustainable, um, the sustainable implementations within their processes. 
and be recognized and uh, credited. So we are, very, we are currently working with various stakeholders in developing this uh, manual, this technical manual that will then have uh, different criteria for wastewater and energy efficiency um, within them and points allocated to each category. So basically just quickly how biogas fits in uh, we know that when we talk about energy efficiency and management, this also obviously includes the use of renewable energies, not just saving electricity, but also using re renewable energy um, in buildings and in industries. So Botswana has an abundance of uh, solar and biogas resources, and we would like to uh, recognize uh, industries and buildings that incorporate this uh, naturally available uh, resources into uh, the processes and practices. So this type of uh, energy source is very useful, of course, as uh, already illustrated throughout the conference for generation of heat and power, which of course we know, we know uses the most electricity. So in terms of energy efficiency and the use of wastewater, um, the green certification framework then allows uh, users or end users, major polluters to be recognized when they do implement sustainable measures in their practices. And they can therefore um, be allocated either gold star, silver star, according to the extent of the sustainability incorporated into into their practices. So in the quest for energy self-sufficiency and um, adequate uh, energy for all in Botswana, <laughs> sorry, this is quite a, a very broad um, uh, framework, but I'll, I'll try to really congest the, the last few points. The benefits of the framework and the technical manual is then to allow people to really incorporate sustainable measures in terms of wastewater and, and energy management, um, and thus creating healthier environments and buildings. But also we would like to really um, educate the public and major polluters on the benefits of going green and sustainability within the built environment. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Matalai. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is Re Thabo Kumwaitile. Um, Thabo is a qualified chemical scientist with the Botswana University of Agriculture and Natural Resources since 2016. He is currently responsible for executing analytical test methods in biochemistry and analytical chemistry. He performs general laboratory housekeeping and supports upper management with technical recommendations. Further to this, he provides conceptual contributions to research and development, as well as assisting in novel circular economy solutions for sustainable environment. Tawa is engaged with the UNDP biogas project to determine the level of water pollution coming out of six selected industries and around Haburoni. It's a way of addressing the level of water pollution coming into the Water Utilities Corporation treatment facilities, as well as the environment. Uh, please welcome Mr. Kumo Itzile. Uh, Kumo Itzile is going to present on the wastewater data collection. You have five ministers now, sir. Please go ahead. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Tavo Kumuitile. Uh, mine is the uh, presentation on the wastewater data collection pilot study in the selected industries in Botswana. All of the studied industries are in the southeastern part of Botswana. And um, since we do not have much time, um, I'll try to compress uh, all of the findings 
um, quickly. Uh, just to give you an overview, um, the trade defense agreement is the basis under which this study was conducted. Uh, and to give you the objectives, uh, was to evaluate some major pollutant found in sampled wastewater, uh, give recommendation for how to remove this pollutant from wastewater, establish the challenges faced by water utilities cooperation and the industries, and propose uh, best practices to ensure compliance. The trade defense agreement is the agreement between water utilities cooperation and the trading industries. Uh, the trading industries are required to uh, install such equipment as it is necessary to be able to remove or reduce uh, pollutant from wastewater. So this has to be done in, in accordance with the BOS 93 uh, quality standard for wastewater. And the industries are also required to test the wastewater quality um, and keep the, the results on a monthly basis. So none of the trading industries under study had fully complied with the uh, trade different agreement policy. And uh, by saying that, it means we, we have a problem. So polluting uh, was recorded across all the studied industries. And this pollution could um, end up in the sewage system, affecting its capability and the overall performance of the wastewater treatment processes by water utilities. Some pollution can also uh, be a threat to the environment and uh, also us as human. So one of the main challenges which water utilities is experiencing is monitoring and enforcement uh, capacity. Um, the cooperation is less uh, uh, in fact, the, the, the unit which is meant to uh, monitor and enforce the trade different agreement is less resourced. And also the cooperation has limited testing resources at the main laboratory. Uh, the industry, um, on the other hand, they lack expertise of uh, pre-treatment of wastewater and also uh, the pre-treatment maintenance and, uh, and um, also the overall cost for installing the pre-treatment facility uh, can be high. So in conclusion, uh, insufficient monitoring enforcement by water utilities uh, results in poor wastewater quality from industries thereby producing low quality wastewater, which may harm the environment or affect the overall performance of the sewer system. So what I did is, is advised to set up a unit that is independent, that would make sure that um, uh, industries are aware of the monitoring uh, activities. The corporation can also educate the, the industries uh, it must procure automated testing. Yeah, you have one minute, sir. This will end up. Okay, thank you. So, the industries, what they should do is um, acquire knowledge and expertise in wastewater pre treatment and also install cost effective equipment. They may also, if the wastewater is Treated according to the BOS 93 standard, they may use that wastewater uh, to reduce cost. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Uh, um, for keeping the time as well. Um, our next speaker 
Se me kilevuri le moremi. She's going to present on the integrated waste management bill. Can you please go ahead, Mr. Moremi? Afternoon. Afternoon again. Um, uh, the purpose, I think, of this uh, quick or brief talk is just to talk about the development of the Integrated Waste Management Bill, uh, which was also done as part of the biogas project uh, facilitated by UNDP and working with the Department of Waste um, Management and Pollution Control. <clears throat> uh, the, this was really sparked by the development of the Integrated Waste Management Policy, which was uh, approved uh, by Parliament this year in, uh, in August 2021, and also the approval of the climate change policy uh, uh, in the country as well. So in developing the Integrated Waste Management Bill, the aim was to, pro to provide a framework of legislative action that is required for implementation of the recommendation of the draft uh, integrate no okay it's not the draft now it's approved of the integrated waste management policy uh, as respects the waste management act and the atmospheric pollution control prevent atmospheric pollution prevention act um, <clears throat> so what uh, from the recommendations of the policy the integrated waste management policy uh, one of the key uh, uh, outcomes was to um, uh, consolidate the two acts, the two acts, which is Waste Management Act and the Atmospheric Pollution Prevention Act. Uh, these two acts uh, were consolidated as we were developing the Integrated Waste Management Bill. And uh, within the bill, uh, we were able to define the obligations of different stakeholders in the waste management sector and provide the basis for regulating behavior in order to protect public health and the environment as envisaged in the Integrated Waste Management Bill. And um, in, in, in developing the framework, this was guided by several international uh, agreements and commitments uh, that uh, our country has acceded to uh, including the Basel Convention on Transboundary Movement of Hazardous Waste and Other Waste, uh, which was already domesticated by the current Act. There's also the Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants and the Minimata Convention on Mercury, uh, uh, without forgetting the Rotterdam Convention. Uh, I think we'll recall that um, before the integrated waste management policy was developed, we had the 1998 waste management strategy uh, that has been used by the country for quite some time to deal with waste management. But in relation to that strategy, uh, I think we should highlight that minor strides were made towards achieving the objectives and a mammoth task lays ahead for the government to not only integrate the environment in development concerns, but also to catch up with the sustainable development objectives that were in the previous strategy, the 1998 strategy. So it was important that as we were developing these, this framework, we also uh, were able to also integrate other issues uh, concerning sustainable development and uh, environmental issues that you know, stemmed from the previous um, uh, strategy. And we should also, I think, highlight here that um, the development of the integrated waste management policy uh, was uh, intended to provide an enabling framework uh, that is required to boost the you know, circularity principles uh, that are brought about by the model adopted by the circular model adopted by the government in the integrated waste management policy. And with the circular model, uh, there comes uh, a lot of changes in the way we do uh, things, in the way we produce stuff. And uh, basically, um, you know, they are targets towards uh, waste minimization, reuse, recycling, and uh, a, a lot of um, other issues that go with uh, sustainable use of resources. 
So as we were drafting the bill, we had to redesign the approach uh, in terms of not only dealing with waste as you know an activity that comes towards the end. Uh, you have one minute, Ma, Ma Moremi. Er, uh, I'm concluding. Please wind up. So we had to deal with waste not only as an outcome of you know at the end of this uh, the, the the cycle, but we also had to integrate you know um, this the different value chains that come about from the stage of production, uh, you know, focusing on sustainable use of resources to minimize the generation of waste. And then when you are aware, you are able to, where you are able to minimize uh, waste or it's inevitable that you, uh, you generate waste, you then move to the next stage of how do you then reduce the surplus or the residue. Uh, in the case you are unable to use it, how do you recycle? If, so there's a waste management hierarchy that would be guiding how we, we carry out these activities and all these were uh, integrated and uh, you know, uh, uh, incorporated in the framework that we developed uh, under the bill. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Mama Remy. And thank you for the audience for being uh, so supportive. Um, our next speaker is Professor A. Obok Opok. I hope I'm pronouncing you this well. Henry Obok Opok is a professional electrical engineer registered with ERB. He is currently the managing director of Artemis Engineering. In Artemis Engineering, he is engaged in the design, construction, operation of renewable energy systems and electrical power systems, solar PV generation, large scale solar hot water heating systems, electrical substations and electrical installations and biogas systems. Prior to that, he was associate professor of electrical engineering in the Department of Electrical Engineering at the University of Botswana, where he worked for over 25 years. He has undertaken research and published widely international, international ref, referred journals and conference papers in the areas of power systems, power electronics, power systems harmonics, and solar PV generations. Further, he undertook consultancies, consultancies and training in the areas of electrical energy engineering for the government and international organizations. Please welcome Professor Obok Opok, ladies and gentlemen. You can go ahead, Professor. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Uh, please, I'll take my half a minute to recognize and uh, honor my former students. There are very many. Uh, I think I did not do a bad job at the university and also my former colleagues. Thank you so much. <clears throat> also like to recognize and honor the people with whom we did this job, uh, they are South Africans, they wouldn't be able to come, uh, but uh, I will represent them as well. <clears throat> the title is, the title is um, Feasibility Study for Production uh, and Utilize Utilization of Biogas at BMC. The purpose uh, of the project was uh, to establish a medium scale uh, biogas plant at the abattoir from the west. Uh, at the very start, uh, obviously, this was a very quantitative study. The methods were quantitative, uh, experimental, uh, technical analysis, and commercial. Uh, the first attack was on to determine the biomethane potential, that is, the, the methane gas, which is actually the fuel uh, for the electricity generation. Uh, we had to determine that right at the start. It was at 528 cubic meters of methane per ton of, um, uh, if you like, feedstock. Feedstock is the slurry material, or if you like, the input into the biogas uh, system. So we had to determine. This showed that the, the, the potential was there. And of course, now we had to decide uh, the applications, which is obviously to supply heat as well as to supply uh, electricity. At the time, and as of now, BMC 
uh, gets its electric power from the BPC and uh, it burns coal to get its hot water. So the possibility to replace this, uh, uh, if you like, demand uh, was uh, the motivation uh, for this um, study. Um, <clears throat> the biogas energy production itself, I'm sorry, I will have to go into figures, um, uh, was uh, in terms of electricity production based on that uh, methane uh, output, it was uh, uh, around 4,480 kilowatt hours per day. And for heat, uh, it was uh, 4,175 uh, kilowatts um, per, per day, kilowatt hours rather per day. The essence uh, to make this uh, anaerobic activity to produce the methane, the slurry has to be stirred and you have to provide heat. It only operates at certain temperatures. Uh, that was a main requirement. Uh, based on this, uh, we then had to con consider the plant design. There were four elements to the plant design, but the continuous flow stirred tank reactor, the, 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 if you like, the volume that is required. Uh, the other one is the uh, biogas production. And then the biogas uh, storage, that was the third element. The fourth element was the uh, electrical generator itself. Uh, in terms of these parameters, um, we determined that uh, the yield, if you like, the yield of the uh, biogas per day was 805. This was from the stomach content. By the way, when you're discussing the BMC, you only think about the stomach and fat, not the meat. You don't think about the T-bone or things like that. You're thinking about the stomach and uh, the fat. These are the sources, if you like, uh, which is uh, really the feedstock, which you feed into the, uh, the digester. So in terms of this, uh, we had for, for the stomach, um, the yield was 805 cubic meters per day. And this translates into, if you like, uh, potential uh, electrical energy of about 1,700 uh, kilowatt hours. The fat itself, uh, the fat matter, of course I have figures for the um, magnitude in terms of weight, but in terms of yield for the methane, it was 1,348, uh, this is uh, cubic meters. And that translated into 2,700 uh, 2, kilowatt hours uh, per day. Uh, so based on this, uh, we can then design, uh, if you like, uh, the system uh, to generate electricity based on this yield, because this is the source. Uh, you have power. one minute, Prof. Right, so on the basis of this, we recommended two, uh, 100 times two kilowatt of uh, CHP, combined heat power generator. Um, and uh, this will produce the kind of powers that have indicated. Uh, the cost, the capital cost of this ran at something like 10.5 million. Uh, this would obviously, if put in place, would require operation. And uh, once it's operating, there would be about uh, three revenue streams. The displacement of electricity from BPC, uh, the thermal heat it would provide, a cell of fertilizer. And uh, what it would do is uh, you'd gain internal rate of return. Uh, I mean, for the investors uh, at 14%, and it would take about 5.7 years to recognize. The environmental benefit would be enormous. It would be 8,318 uh, 8, tons per year that would be offset in, in terms of carbon production. And uh, the, there has to be a decision on how to implement this. The best possibility was maybe boot, build, operate, and transfer with the support of BMC providing management. And uh, this as of now is hanging, has not been taken up. So if there is some wealthy fellas here who have some money, maybe BMC would benefit. And uh, it's an opportunity for investors 
as I said, it's 14% internal rate of return, and your money would be paid back in four or uh, in 5.7 years, and the environmental impact would be enormous. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Prof. Um, you owe me one minute. Um, the next presenter is Ms. Komoso Mutlopi, who is going to present on environmental manage pl management plan for biogas digester at Botswana Meat Commission. Uh, Komoso Mutlopi is a natural resources manager by training with interest in agro-social systems and climate adaptation. Her work focuses on the interplay of climate change, sustainable development, and rural livelihoods with applications to the fields of climate change impacts, environmental management, and related policy. Ms. Motlopi is a certified principal environmental assessment practitioner in the regional climate change adaptation facility. Please welcome Ms. Mutlopi. Uh, you can start, Ms. Mutlopi. Your time starts now. Where is the other mic? Okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, yeah, uh, they keep butchering my name. If you do a comment, I hope Mutlopi. Uh, I'm an independent consultant and I was engaged by the UNDP to undertake the environmental management plan for the proposed biodigester plant at uh, BMC. Uh, following the recommendations of the feasibility study that was done by Bo Professor Oko, uh, it was apparent that uh, BMC had a resource that they were sitting on uh, that they could benefit from via waste management and uh, energy generation. So the, e I, the EMP set out to identify the environmental impacts of the proposed development. Um, according to the Environmental Impact Assessment Act of 2011, any industrial plant with potential to have environmental impacts is supposed to undergo uh, impact assessment to determine the impacts that would come off its implementation, uh, starting from design, construction, operation, and decommissioning. Um, the, uh, the, eval the assessment that we did, uh, at least at the design stage, because there were no designs as yet, uh, had the opportunity to recommend the other issues that the design should look at which, uh, for example, included the consideration of the amount of uh, feedstock from the BMC and the type of feedstock from the BMC. Uh, the feasibility study had recommended the uh, continuous listed uh, bioreactor, uh, and the EIA obviously did the assessment looking at the recommended uh, design or processing, biogas processing system. So, the site uh, is located near the BMC. So the, uh, in terms of influence the design, the recommendation, for example, was that uh, because there is a pipe that runs from the BMC to the water treatment plant across the road, when they do the design, the CTR, they should uh, make sure that they redirect the, the pipe that crosses the site. That's one of the influences of the EIA to the design. But moving from the design into construction, uh, there were really negligible uh, impacts or negative impacts as it regards construction. It was mainly related to your waste, your rubble, your dust, your uh, negligible noise that would come out of the construct out of construction facilities from the heavy plant. Uh, most of the identified impacts uh, would were identified at operation stage. Um, uh, these uh, looked at things like, for example, uh, during operation, obviously we are managing the waste that has been a problem for so long for the BMC. Uh, you, I don't know if I didn't talk about the water treatment plant. The BMC has a water treatment plant that is uh, 
uh, processing waste from the abattoir, the waste in terms of stomach content, fat, blood, uh, and those things. And those are the, 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 the waste that were really a, a, a nightmare for BMC because they spent uh, annually about 1.5 million to declutch the, 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 the fat that were accumulating at the waste treatment plant. Um, and uh, you, the, the waste treatment plant is near the Billing River. So there was a lot of spillover, especially during rainfalls. So it was important, imperative for them to do something about it. Um, so the waste, the biogas would obviously address the issues related to waste management because it will use that waste to produce a beneficial gas that they can use for that they can use for energy heating and just lighting around at the, the plant. Um, the other thing that came out was that it, having the biogas plant would contribute to climate change adaptation and mitigation, basically adapt climate change mitigation, because it will remove it will remove one the methane that is currently lost into the air at the, uh, at, one the at the wastewater treatment plant. So in the end, uh, we recommended um, that the proposed biogas plant was actually a necessity and that most of the, the impacts can be mitigated because they only had to do with uh, uh, administrative issues uh, at the plant. Um, the other, other, some of the impacts that were identified had to do with the occupational health and safety, especially during operation, when there is trapped gas that could combust. Mm -hmm. So uh, mitigation was proposed for those, uh, for those uh, negative impacts. Uh, the other impacts, obviously, that have been said by uh, the, that have been said are to do with cost savings for waste treatment, waste uh, management, the desludging, and obviously the potential for water for, for the BMC to make extra streams of income through the sale of fertilizer that could be produced after uh, as a sub after, after the biogas has been produced. Uh, because the after you've done the, the biogas, you get uh, the water. The substrate and then you get the feedstock that is very nutritious and is very beneficial for agriculture. Uh, there are other benefits that were identified uh, but time is not permitting. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, without wasting much time, I'll call the next speaker who is Bitumelo. Uh, Tenolo Sichele. Tenolo is a clean environment enthusiast with interest in partnerships, stakeholder advocacy on mainstreaming, community mobilization, and participation. She's a holder of master's degree in waste management and environmental management, as well as BSc honors in environmental health, both from the United Kingdom. Tenolo introduced a concept of continuous cleanups in Botswana, in Bubira area, resulting in clean villages. She also introduced safe daycare centers in Kaburun district, such as six bays and junior toilets, which were adopted nationally. Moreover, she introduced the first clinical waste collection truck in the country and coordinated national campaigns on Keep Botswana Clean through clean cities, towns, and villages competitions. Tenolo participated in the development of plastic carrier bag standards and also advocated for it to become a compulsory standard and further proposed its levy, which has just been introduced by government. Through her, her inspiring experience, she has the ability to move people to adopt the use of natural resources resulting in waste uh, avoidance. Please welcome Mertan Loschele. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stilo. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. 
Um, Modula Stilo has, the chairperson has talked about integrated waste management policy, as well as Me Moremi has touched a lot about the waste management aspect. And I'm here presenting about the achievements or the principle of the waste management hierarchy, which is one of the cornerstone where the natural resources are expected to be used as natural resources. And we have, in collaboration with UNDP, held a workshop, or ran a workshop on a pilot project to segregate white paper from office setup in, as we did it in government enclave. 10 institutions in, were involved, which were trained, and seven only participated in the sorting. Various uh, workers were trained, including cleaners, laborers, administration officers, and youth, which were the waste management sorters. But as we know, paper normally is found in offices, and this was observed as such. And all the ministries showed improved performance from the initial um, setup when we started they were a bit colder, but when we were going on, we um, harvested more resources, especially started around the eighth week, where we, we did this for 18 weeks, and we started to see collection of um, a lot of paper. Ladies and gentlemen, the achievements which we made, through our training, we recognized that we created benefits uh, on source separation and those who organizations which trained benefited from that and we developed skills as well because we trained about 200 workers as we have mentioned before and about 72 tons of white paper was separated um, we recognize that white paper is common waste material in all participating ministries, except at government printing where we recognize that they were using colored paper, which is newspaper, daily news. The total amount of cash accrued from waste sales during the six months in the pilot was around 2,000 pula. And ladies and gentlemen, we came across uh, challenges as we were saying that people started to warm up or many institutions started to warm up later on, we had limited amounts of waste from the beginning or the overall uh, uh, pilot project. Again, those who were trained, especially the cleaners because they were the collectors of waste from the offices, they had their contracts um, expiring so there was no continuity. There was mixing of um, waste leading to contamination and lowering the value of the white paper. Some ministries were unable to, to provide space for waste sorting. Um, recycling companies were uh, unable to pay for waste, which was not delivered to them. And as a result, that's a challenge as well. And each ministry will recognize that um, the leadership was not involved. And ladies and gentlemen, where these um, projects have been run, this one was run in an office, but where they have been run outside, like in other offices or households, is about leadership saying, yes, we will do it. If there is no leadership in it, it will not go on. And this is one of the, pro the proposed interventions that organizations, it must start from the head and organizations must have the environmental policies that they will um, circulate and people will know, public will know that they are uh, adhere to, to sustainable development, um, to intensify public education and awareness and we have realized as well that it is important to have people who are dedicated in ministries who are well in the knowing of doing the waste segregation. 
Um, the directive restricting consumption of food in offices should be enforced. As we recognize that we lost a lot of natural resources because um, it, 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 they were con the, the resources was, were contaminated. And as well, we recognize that more often than not, people do not recognize that what we call waste really is a lost resource. And we are saying there, sh there should be a directive on source separation of waste, ensuring that a continued feed of waste resources is used to achieve um, what Mamu Remu was talking about, the secular economy. Ladies and gentlemen, that was our project. Thank you. Thank you, Masaj, um, uh, for keeping the time as well. Uh, we have... Uh, the last uh, but not least presenter uh, is online. Uh, I have the name here, Windy Wildy. Uh, Windy, are you there? Uh, yes, I am, Chair. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, please. Uh, can you please briefly introduce yourself and then uh, take us through your presentation on the development of environmental and social management framework, all within 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 five minutes. Sir. Thank you. Okay. Um, yes, thank you. Um, my name is Eden Walby. Uh, I'm a the owner and director of, of, a, of a consultancy based in Johannesburg, South Africa, um, called Environmental Solutions Africa. Um, uh, our focus, our, our primary focus is, is on um, uh, assisting um, or bringing environmental and social governance um, into uh, the, uh, the sphere of um, into the sphere of, uh, of corporate investment, especially into such sectors as this one, um, which is quite you know, firmly entrenched in the agro um, business. Uh, um, sort of uh, industry. So, um, you know, to benefit from uh, such a wonderful initiative, as, as we've heard during the course of the morning, um, requires some form of investment. Um, and, and the National Development Bank of Botswana um, is a primary investor for, for such projects, um, but has historically um, experienced um, some obstacles in accessing uh, international funding. Um, one of these obstacles um, has been the lack of a robust and, uh, and comprehensive environmental and social management framework, or ESMF. Um, and this facilitates um, the sustainability ethos that, uh, that international financial institutes and um, the international lending community are increasingly concerned about and, and wanting to see um, uh, reflected in, in their investments. Um, therefore, the development of uh, the SEMF um, seeks to overcome this obstacle by incorporating environmental social governance um, considerations into the credit application process of the uh, National um, Development Bank of Botswana. Um, to do this, there, there is a sort of a linear uh, system that we, we've um, proposed um, based um, on incorporating the environmental laws and regulations of, of, of uh, Botswana with um, international best practice. Um, effectively, what we're looking to look at, uh, what we're seeking to address is risks and impacts, or environmental risks and impacts that may be um, associated with, um, uh, with the, with the um, commencement of any such projects. So in broad categories, we're looking at how to avoid and minimize adverse impacts on, on the physical environment. Um, this can be referred already by previous speakers by avoiding or minimizing the pollution from project activities, um, as well as promoting some form of resource efficiency. Um, the other thing we're looking at is to, um, to avoid any adverse impacts on, on, um, on communities that might be in, in, in close uh, proximity to the, uh, to the project. Um, respecting human rights, the, the livelihoods of neighboring communities, and, and, and also at the same time enhancing benefits from, from such projects. Um, lastly, but, but quite importantly, is also looking after the working conditions 
um, of um, anyone employed upon such projects to make sure that during the entire project life cycle, um, some form of um, you know, that, that minimum that standards are maintained that make sure that they meet the, um, the, the, the conditions, um, the labor conditions um, that are that are, that are law in Botswana and uh, part of um, you know, internationally accepted sort of practices. Um, to do that, um, the, the, the process we, 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 we've, um, we've uh, recommended um, is, is, is fairly complicated um, on the um, surface, but um, once it gets down to um, you know, uh, implementation, we believe it, it's, it's fairly streamlined. And what it attempts to do is um, on the basis of any project that is, um, that, that, that is sort of um, submitted to the National Development Bank in the circumstances, in this case, um, for potential funding, it undergoes a, an environmental and social screening process in which the uh, project is initially categorized. And this is in line with the, um, the, the environmental impact assessment regulations of Botswana and also the uh, World Bank um, Operating Policy 401 um, for, for environmental impact, uh, environmental and social impact um, of any, any sort of project. We, we've applied a set of standards and, and as a default set of standards, we, we've sort of used um, the International Finance Corporation's performance standards on uh, environmental and social sustainability as a guideline. And then um, a, a fairly rapid assessment that will be undertaken by bank personnel will then um, finally categorize the project, um, whether or not A, it should proceed, B, whether or not the bank will um, regretfully decline the credit application, um, or, or C, they will, um, uh, they will, ex they will um, proceed with the credit application um, with several caveats in place. And typically these are um, to do with the um, development of some environmental guidelines or policies to make sure that the project proposal... Uh, I'll, say, I'll, I'll give, just give you one minute to end up. Okay, um, to make sure that those are undertaken in, in, um, in, in a way that, that promotes sustainability of the project. So um, where we are now is that um, currently the, um, the draft environmental social management framework, um, which is being um, um, graciously funded by the UNDP is with the um, NDB board um, and that'll be hopefully adopted. Um, once that's um, being um, uh, achieved, there will be training of key staff in the National Development Bank to make sure that this is a can be a readily implemented and it's a practical process. And then finally, um, it will be incorporated into uh, the credit application process of the NDB, especially with projects um, aligned to to the biogas initiative um, in, in Botswana. Um, and um, I think I'll leave it there. But uh, you know, happy to answer offline any any queries that um, that um, uh, any of the audience may have. Okay, thank you, uh, Chair. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, sir. Um, we, we have come to the end of our panel discussion, but uh, I understand that there's a video that has to be played uh, before we get into a question and answer session. Can you please uh, load the video and play it? Thank you.
in ensuring we are able to meet our present everyday demands without compromising the needs of our future generations. So how do these household members receive all their energy for their everyday tasks and chores? They are using a unique source of energy derived Thank you. Let's give that a round of applause. What an interesting ecosystem we have there. And thank you very much to Tandeka, Tabo, Kelly. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Andrew, Komotseho, Tenolo. And we'd also like to uh, thank Eden uh, Wildly joining us uh, uh, virtually, but more importantly, Raking Ramokoko for keeping it uh, short, sweet, but exactly to the point. And that's what we want you to do with the uh, Q&A uh, before we break for lunch. Now, lunch will be served in the room which is behind us. And uh, we're going to shorten that, um, that activity by 20 minutes. So we have 40 minutes to uh, get that uh, out of the way. We'll come back to some interesting entertainment. And uh, we have two more sessions, shorter sessions. And the exciting part is all of you are invited to a cocktail session uh, immediately after the end of the day and more entertainment. So ready to get that girl. I see you guys. Okie dokie. So uh, Gina, you can be on the other side of the room. Uh, there were some questions that we have virtually, but I'm going to be taking these after lunch 
And if it is in respect to your particular session, it means that uh, you'll be able to answer that uh, question from the floor. And any other questions that Kibono Rona Lorona work on mathematics from Uruguay. I'm Kibona Lorbata Mosedi Pusadi. Yeah, Hobona, I like a holy. Okie dokie. I'm going back to Uganda. Thank you very much, uh, Director of Ceremonies. Thank you for the panelists and the moderator. Um, it's a small question or two small questions to Professor Obokobo. <laughs> I know your study was full of data, but what I want to know is what percentage of energy consumption at BMC will your CHP uh, meet? The combined heat and power that you design, what percentage will it meet? Secondly, the department conducted uh, a survey, I think so, some years ago, on use of the same feed or waste. Uh, through trans esterification process to produce biodiesel. Now we are using exactly the same feed for biogas production. As a consultant, which of the two options will you recommend that the waste be used for? Thank you. Thank you, Prof. We have a second question here. Um, good afternoon. My name is Jinu Lisitza. I'm from Yarnefem. I just wanted to ask Mayor uh, Tandeka Balai, Hore, these uh, green certification process, when do you hope to finalize the process? And um, when should we expect the rollout of it? Also, as part of your incentives for industry or buildings that do use the sustainable methods, is there any other tangible reward system apart from grading them? Um, for example, have you got partnerships with book URS where they get tax exemptions if they're using these sustainable methods? And then my other question is to Me Moremi, who is talking to policy. Um, in your inputs, I understand you have helped input into the new policy. I just wanted to know, for us, we, we talk to Batswana, we try and make it simple for them to understand. So the one thing I know, Gehore Batswana have been told not to burn waste in their backyards. I just wanted to know if you have considered changing this, especially in rural villages where there is no waste collection. So if they are not allowed to use traditional methods like maybe digging in their backyards and then burning their refuse, it becomes hazardous as it flies everywhere. And then also the issue of landfills. I haven't had a copy of the waste management bill, so forgive me if perhaps what I'm asking is tautological or has been addressed. Is there a, a plan to use the landfills which are filling up so rapidly across the country as fuel for some of these biodigesters that I hear so much about? For example, the Pilani landfill is so high up. I mean, it could be a wall in China, but it seems nothing is happening to it. Hamadubu, I was hearing, is now closed and people have now moved to Ramotsa landfill. Is there a way that this control in the policy talks to some of these issues that are quite tangible for that one? I thank you. Okay, great. I guess in no particular order, uh, maybe uh, we can start with you, uh, Prof, and then um, the next question is for Kelly. Thank you very much, Professor Ladiran, for that question. Um, I must say, and uh, in the discussion that uh, at the 
at the start of the conversation, um, I, I may not have mentioned, but it was 370 beasts are killed every day. Um, this limits the amount of energy uh, and the resources of feedstock that can meet the demand of uh, BM, BMC. As it is stood, um, this is not really, uh, uh, this did not meet the total demand because uh, we are limited by the resource. Uh, but your direct question was, what is the nature or the demand for BMC? I, I, do, not for, I, I do not remember the exact figure, but it was, I think it's in the region of between one and to MVA, something like that. So this is much less. This is this this is designed to meet the resources available, namely the 370 animals, which yield um, 520 cubic meters of methane uh, per ton of feedstock. That was the limitation. Thank you. Um, thank you. To answer the first one was on burning waste collection, uh, particularly in rural areas, whether we took that into consideration when we were developing the bill. <clears throat> I think here I need to highlight that uh, in developing the bill, uh, this was a holistic view uh, in terms of coming up with measures that can be put in place to regulate waste. Um, so in so far as burning waste is concerned, I think what uh, since they come from the department, uh, from the policy side of it, they'll be able to give direction. But the intention really was uh, that where in remote areas where waste collection has been really um, minimal uh, or where the services had not been able to reach those remote areas uh, in the new reformed uh, system, uh, through the empowerment of the local government, the uh, council, uh, they will be able to have those outreach programs uh, that would enable uh, waste collection services to be regular and reliable. And within the bill, we've also introduced um, the waste collection uh, tariffs, which will enable uh, the local government, the uh, council, to be able to uh, 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 come up with um, uh, fees, uh, you know, uh, some of them subsidized so that those who are not able to afford, you know, through uh, government subsidies can be able to also benefit from uh, from from uh, this new, new system. So it will be a collection of uh, a whole lot of things. Uh, it's a transition. Uh, it will not happen overnight. Uh, but uh, programs are in place, uh, will be in place, particularly in the sense that uh, through the, the new uh, integrated waste management bill, which will ultimately become law in this country, um, there will be established, there will be an establishment of a regulator, uh, the integrated waste management regulator, who will then be able to, uh, you know, build capacity and also ensure that these services are able to uh, be spread across the country. Um, and then concerning the land field, whether there's a land plan, there's a plan to deal with, you know, um, the particularly those that are exceeding their capacities. Um, I think this one as well, the Department of Waste must be able to guide in terms of what plans are there for the government. But it's also one of those issues that are covered in the proposed uh, integrated waste management bill. Uh, to uh, the intention is that as we focus more on waste minimization, we will reduce the amount of waste that is directed at uh, and at landfills. So, if we are able to do that, we will uh, reduce the burden or the amount of waste that ultimately uh, reaches, you know, our landfills. So that's that, that's one of the long term um, measures uh, that will be coming about as a result of this bill. But in terms of the short term to the medium term ones, in terms of how they're going to deal with the capacity issues for the landfills, I think the Department of Waste will be better able to, to answer that and give a, an, an accurate response to that. Thank you.
Thank you, thank you, Master of Ceremonies. Maybe just to add on um, what the advocate was talking about. Um, burning of waste. Why do we discourage burning of waste? It's because when we burn waste, normally it's insufficient combustion, uh, which now leads to emissions of dangerous gases into the environment. That is why we discourage burning of waste. Um, as uh, Mamoremi indicated, uh, the idea here is to improve the collection system and then uh, dispose accordingly. And uh, normally the disposal method recommended for, for, for smaller settlement, Wokomoka H2 and the like, is the strange method. Uh, you, don't, you don't have to use a uh, very extensive or expensive uh, equipment. Um, with regard to uh, land filling, um, one of the major objectives in the approved policy uh, is to reduce the amount of waste going to landfill. At the moment, the recycling rate in Botswana is uh, around 20%. So the idea here is to improve that so that we don't have much of the waste uh, going to landfill. Rather, it goes to recycling, waste to energy, and, and uh, any other uh, options available. Thank you very much. Sir. Thank you so much. Can we give this round and this session a wonderful round of applause? And thank you very much to all the panelists. So we will proceed to... Uh, have the conversations over lunch, uh, target your men so that you can get your answers or your lady. Uh, but we can use uh, the front door and there's some side doors that are this side. The session is in the room directly adjacent uh, to this room. Uh,
Hey, 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 when I it la shipper. Oops. One, two, check. One, two, check. One, two, check, check. My check. One, two, check. Where's the feedback? One, two. Two, one, two. This one is. This one is. Okay, eight. I'm putting it here. But why is there like a a, a delay or an echo? Oh, there we go. So, which one is that one? Which one is that? What number? What what number? Not what number? What number? Seven. Seven. One, two, yeah. That's,
Yebo, yes. That rhymes with bio, yes. Thank you so much. I think uh, food is meant to re-energize us. However, for some of us who have eaten pup, the eyes might get slightly heavier, but uh, we've arranged for some entertainment that will wake us up uh, before uh, our fourth and penultimate session. Um, and we will duly proceed uh, if we have uh, your undivided attention. So Dr. Gina, uh, actually more importantly, Mama Roka is the one whom we want in the room because she hasn't experienced the power of local entertainment. Really? Or she hasn't. She hasn't. Luda, wherever you are, we're starting. <laughs> This is a special piece for you. <laughs> Our project manager, Emma. We are bringing in uh, my future Jose. It's a special piece for you.
Brilliant. <laughs> Just what we needed after lunch. We needed that. <laughs> More of that, uh, where that came from. Are we looking forward to seeing them again with the final performance? That definitely electric. Let's get back to the business. Yes. Um, before we went for lunch, we had two sessions. The first one, where we spoke to the masons and the beneficiaries, we heard about the benefits of biogas. Our second session was looking at the results of our biogas project from the environmental and the energy side. We are now moving to the third session, which is now looking at biogas, not only in Botswana, but we're looking at biogas in Botswana, Africa, and beyond. And for this session, we have panelists, the moderator for the session on your program is written Mr. Nchena Motebe, DPS from Ministry of Minerals. But unfortunately, as I indicated in the morning, Ramotebe is not here with us. In his place, we have Mr. Sesedin Zoe, who is the project manager uh, for biogas from the ministry side. Uh, in his panel, Ren Zoe has got Mr. Temba Mudise, We'll be talking to biogas in Botswana. We have Ms. Chandi Maguiana from Zimbabwe. We have Mr. Walter Okello from Uganda. Mr. Sushim Man Amatia from Nepal. Mr. Bart Fredericks uh, from the Netherlands. And then we don't, uh, we already had uh, Enrique Patino in the previous session. He will not be joining this particular session. Um, well, as we know, we have tried as much as is possible with my co-host uh, to really stick to the timelines. There's so much information that has to be digested. It's almost as if these biogas um, uh, conferences and seminars need to be held over a period of two days. This is what I experienced in 2017 because it is a mouthful. There's so much to take in. However, we will try as best as possible to keep the conversation going uh, here after. Uh, so I'm not sure where the other panelists uh, may be, or are they joining uh, virtually? We okay. have virtual panelists. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Mr. Walter Okelo for joining. And then uh, for Sushim uh, Man Amatya, uh, uh, I, uh, if you can just... Uh, uh, indicate whether you can hear us as well as Mr. Bart Fredericks. I've spoken to Bart earlier. Over to you, uh, uh, Rento. Uh, good afternoon, Rento. everybody. Um, this is a very difficult uh, session after lunch, but I'll try to not to make it very difficult for you, uh, uh, the, the, the audience. Um, like I have been introduced, my name is Sidi Harambe Nzue. I'm the project manager for the biogas uh, in Botswana. And I'm working for the Department of Energy. At the Department of Energy, I'm the head of the renewable energy section, which is uh, implementing this uh, biogas project. Um, like it has been indicated, we are going to look at the, the biogas in general, not only in Botswana, in Africa, as you can see that there are uh, panelists from Botswana, Zimbabwe, Uganda, um, Nepal, uh, even beyond the, 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 the seas, which is uh, the Netherlands. Um, I'll firstly introduce uh, the panelists that I'm with here. Um, we got uh, Temba Mudis, Gift Mudise, who is the Sustainable Energy Consultant. Mr. Temba Gift Mudise is a Sustainable Energy Consultant with an engineering background. Mr. Mudise holds a Master's of Science in Sustainable Energy a degree from the University of Malta in Europe and has extensive experience 
of over 10 years in the energy sector and project management. He has exclusively focused on uh, renewable energy from 2015. That is the time when we both joined the Department of Energy and now he's a, a consultant on his own. Um, most of his experience in the energy sector was gained from uh, being a project manager for various renewable energy projects with the Department of Energy under the Ministry of Mineral Resources, Green Technology and Energy Security. Mr. Mudise has just completed undertaking a Botswana country private sector diagnosis, uh, energy sector uh, assessment on behalf of the World Bank and is, and is currently engaged by UNDP to deliver 150 uh, biodigesters constructed and operational uh, in, the, in the southeastern uh, part of Botswana. And that is Mr. Mudise, ladies and gentlemen. Um, the other panelist has all already been introduced. He has been here up in the in the in the podium and down. Um, is Anthony Walter Okelo, a uh, biogas uh, expert. I don't know whether I should read his his uh, credentials or because they have been already been read. I will just say uh, uh, Ray Okelo is here with us, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, like we said, um, we have been talking about Botswana, 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 Botswana until now. And we are still going to say Botswana, and then we are going to say beyond Botswana. And from Botswana, uh, like it has been uh, indicated, some are joining us from, uh, from uh, 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 outside Botswana. I'll, I'll first of all say, um, if it's possible, they can introduce themselves wherever they are. Um, uh, get us the, the ones that are online, please. We've got Tandega in Zimbabwe. No, no, yeah, not Tandega. Um, hey, Lina, Lina, Miss, Miss Chandi, Miss Chandi. Makuyana. Yes. Um, if she's there online, please can she uh, just uh, briefly introduce herself? It seems she's not uh, yet ready. Um, we Thank you. <laughs> I couldn't unmute. Sorry. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you loud and clear. Okay. Thank you very much for having me. And I'm excited about Botswana Biogas. My name is Chandim Tubuki Makuyana. I am uh, a private consultant now, uh, but I work uh, with Private Finance Advisory Network, PFAN. Um, and I've been one of the people who have been championing biogas in Zimbabwe since 2013. I'm happy to be here, and I hope to speak more about it. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And then we've got uh, Bart Fredericks in the Netherlands. Yes, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Okay, thank you. So my name is uh, Bart Fredericks. Uh, I'm a freelance uh, consultant specializing in, uh, in bioenergy, specifically biogas. Um, working in the field for about uh, 20 years, first uh, in the private sector, then in a, in a small NGO, and uh, since seven, eight years as a, as a freelancer. Um, uh, I've been doing a lot of work uh, in the field of small and medium scale uh, biogas in different parts in uh, Africa mainly, uh, some work in uh, Southeast Asia as well. And I'll be um, talking a little bit about uh, productive biogas uh, later on. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we've got Sushim Man Ahmad from, um, uh, from Nepal. 
Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> Greetings to everyone from the high hills of Nepal. Uh, my name is Sushim Amatya, and I'm currently the senior bioenergy expert. I work for the government right now. So I've been in the bio biogas sector for the last 10 years. So uh, in Nepal, we've been promoting quite a lot of bioenergy, uh, especially biogas, which I'll be talking to you about in uh, detail later. Uh, and I'm basically, um, I'm an engineer by profession. Thank you very much. Thank you and you are all welcome. Um, like we are saying, biogas is a global technology used for both uh, waste management and energy production. And today we have had speakers uh, talking about waste management, energy production in the, in the, in the form of uh, cooking gas and all those. Now, we, we would like to hear from our experts. What is it that they are doing in their country? I will start with uh, Remudise to highlight uh, what is, the, is, is it all about the biogas in Botswana. Remudise. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ansoe. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. In Botswana, biogas started in the 1980s, and by about 2015, we had about 20 known biogas digesters. You can see uh, for about that long, 35 years, we only had uh, about 20 digesters in the country um, from private um, individuals as well as uh, government institutions. Um, we had um, digesters from as uh, small as, in terms of capacity, two cubic uh, meter di digesters. And we had about 10 cubic for, for the hotel in Campbell. And this is, I'm just giving you an overview so that you may appreciate where we are from and where we, we are at the moment. We had about 400 um, cubic meter digester that was um, used uh, in incineration to replace diesel. Um, we had uh, in a water treatment plant in Khaburoni and Francistown, uh, we had the plants there. So we had a lot of privately owned, amongst that privately owned digesters. And we had a challenge that most of these digesters were not working, were not functional um, for various reasons. And the there was a need to develop a program that will ensure that uh, the regulatory aspect, institutional um, framework aspects, things such as standards are in place for the biogas industry to thrive. So the biogas project that is funded by Jeff that we are here, gathered here uh, for, uh, was started in 2017. Uh, January 2017. Um, with that uh, mandate to ensure that we promote the utilization of biogas, which involves um, legislative, regulatory, institutional um, reviews. Uh, we have heard from the morning that the guidelines in place, standards in place because of the project. And there is the other aspect of the project where we talk about the actual construction we have got uh, that side of regulatory and also the actual construction where the project started to train um, 70 masons and not only masons, it trained 16 trainers um, in collaboration with vocational training institutions. So the projects um, that were implemented within the project were implemented by local masons that were trained in the project. So as um, in other sessions before, Dr. Rakhadi alluded that 31 uh, biogas digesters were constructed for demonstration purpose, so that the household may have interactions with the biogas digester. Though we may learn um, from those 31 for the rollout to prepare for the national rollout. And following those 31, uh, the country through this project rolled out 200 still within the southeastern part of 
the country. And um, there have been challenges that we're experiencing. One of the challenges, of course, is feed, the initial feed stock. Uh, you, you find that um, the first 31 digesters were fully funded by the project and the 200 digesters that we're, ro we're rolling out that are scheduled to complete by December, they are part financed. That is, the project covers uh, part of the, uh, the funding, including labor and other appliances, and the beneficiaries will then go to procure other material. We have realized that um, the main problem to the digesters not working is feedstock availability. And even the uh, digesters that were not working prior to this program, it was an issue of feedstock. You will have, for example, there is a plant in Sukutani, seven kilowatt plant. It has the biogas uh, aspect of it. It never worked. Uh, those are some of the challenges that we, we can list a lot of the projects that never worked. But the main challenge is um, feedstock. Through the projects, um, uh, even when we were training as uh, the project training masons and implementing, we realized that sometimes in terms of quality assurance of the brick and mortar uh, systems that we are constructing, gas can escape and the project will not be functional. So we put more effort in ensuring that when they are casting the dome pipe and all those things, uh, even plastering, we do a good job. And we have learned a lot. And um, I'm, I'm happy to say nowadays we have less challenges in terms of um, operational or delayed uh, commission of the digesters. Because now we are at a stage as a country that we have learned a lot from this project. So we are ready to now roll the project to the rest of the country through uh, various various means. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ramudise. You preserved a lot of time for me. Then I can give others uh, some more time. Um, I'll mix it up. I will not go to Re Okelo right now. I'll I'll go to uh, Chandi to give us a, a, a story about the biogas in Zimbabwe. Chandi? Uh, Chandi, we are waiting for your story about Zimbabwe, by your guess. If she's not uh, uh, available right now, I think we can go to uh, Sushim and in Nepal. You can give us the, the, the bio guest story in Nepal, please. Are we having challenges with the with the connectivity or or not? Okay, now that we have we are having challenges. Uh, okay. Let's let's just uh, if, if, as they are struggling with the connection. Let's let's hear the the biogas uh, Uganda. I know you have touched uh, on it uh, earlier this morning when you were you were you were with the with the masons. Uh, uh, just go ahead, there, okay. Okay, I I had a short presentation. I don't know if uh, it can be shown.
Uh, is it possible? Like I indicated earlier, the afternoon session is always uh, very <laughs> difficult. I just continue. Okay, as as we wait, uh, maybe I just start uh, our the biogas story from Uganda. Maybe I start by giving a bit of a history just to put it into perspectives. Uh, with biogas was introduced in the 1950s uh, by by Church Missionary Society, uh, but real effort by the government came in in the 80s uh, through intervention from the Chinese government. Uh, that's when they introduced fix, fixed dome. Uh, but then the war of the 80s meant that that effort stopped halfway. So we only had about uh, 500 biogas plants done in, in the 80s. Uh, throughout the 90s was mostly non-government organizations, uh, but the real mass dissemination of biogas in Uganda started in uh, 2009. Uh, this was through an effort of the Dutch government, uh, which was involving five African countries, Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, then you have Ethiopia and Burkina Faso. That's when the real massive dissemination uh, started. And uh, the first project lasted for five years up to 2014. Then the next one for the next five years up to 2020. And now we are going into the third phase. Um, in terms of uh, what really may, uh, our figures, right now we are talking about 10,000 biogas plants over this period of, uh, of 10 years. And uh, what is really encouraging the uptake of biogas in Uganda are two things. One is, of course, the, the, the need for clean energy for cooking. Uh, the, 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 we, we don't have a lot of land because we are a population of about 43 million people. So we don't have much land. We don't have much uh, firewood. So you find in areas where there is no firewood. So there's that drive. Uh, but secondly, which has also been very important is uh, the need for biosilary. Uh, Uganda is a country that depends 90% on agriculture. So the farmers really need to, and the land is heavily used. So farmers need to put fertilizer and uh, fertilizer is expensive. So for those who have animals, especially if you, you're doing crops like coffee, banana, they, 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 they use the celery a lot. So those are the two drivers. Uh, in terms of the, pro, uh, the, uh, the whole implementation, uh, it's mostly a, a private sector led initiative. The government is involved in terms of providing uh, a, work, a good working environment, but it's mostly NGOs and uh, other entities that are, that are involved in the promotion of biogas. So you find that, for example, organizations such as UNIDO or World Vision can every year decide to sponsor maybe 200 or 300 of, of such plants, mainly to support their, their pro projects or programs which are mainly to improve uh, on, on, on livelihood. Uh, the first phase, which was the first five years from 2009 to 2014, uh, to develop the market, uh, the, the, the plants were heavily subsidized. Subsidy could go up to 40%. Uh, but once it, it kicked off, then from 2015, subsidy was, was, was cut off. Uh, the only existing subsidy now is to the biogas construction enterprises. That's what, but otherwise the farmers now pay for their digesters. Our financing mechanism, we have four types. We have where the farmers pay outrightly and then the, the digester is constructed. We also have where farmers get loans from financial institutions. Uh, then we have uh, an arrangement of what we call lease to own, where a farmer pays a certain portion and then uh, keeps on paying the subsequent amounts uh, until when the payment is completed. Normally, the period ranges from uh, six to one year. So that is, that's the third way. Then the fourth way, how some farmers acquiring biogas is what we call uh, biosilary takeoff. These farmers are in organizations, they're in cooperatives. So what normally happens is the cooperative buys the digesters for them, can be about 20 farmers. And then the farmers pay back by bringing what we call biosilary to the cooperative. And then the cooperative is able to sell biosilary to other members. When the farmer brings, they agree on what amount and the pricing. So the farmer keeps bringing until when, such a time that he fully pays for, for the digest and then he can stop bringing. So we have those four mechanisms of financing. Uh, in terms of technology, like I already said before in the morning, 
we now have a mixture. We have the prefabricated as well as the, as well as the brick type. So the good thing with the prefabricated is that uh, it's easier for us to appeal to the financial institutions. They are, they, they, they are able to give the loans and uh, it's agreed if a farmer fails to pay, then this digester can be emptied and taken away to, to another farmer. So because of that, then we are able to, to, to give loans to farmers. I mean, the financial institutions are able to give loans to, to the different farmers. So the introduction of the prefabricated types uh, is something that has been very much welcomed by, by the private, uh, by, by, the, by the finance institutions. Uh, in terms of stakeholders, the project is implemented by different stakeholders. So we have uh, most of most of these are uh, international organizations. So we have uh, GIZ, we have uh, SNV, we have HIVOS. Uh, these play different roles. GIZ is mostly for uh, policy framework development standards uh, along that area. Uh, SNV mainly does the technical advice, the training and all that. And then HIVOS does the, the fund management. Uh, in terms of quality matters, uh, the program uses what they call quality service providers. These are spread all throughout the country. These are the people who are in charge of doing inspections. Uh, if, if there are about 20 plants going on, they can sample. Uh, these report directly to the program entity, uh, but also the different biogas construction enterprises. Uh, they, they form what we call the Biogas Association, the National Biogas Association, really where amazing. issues to deal with uh, quality standards, construction issues, technical, uh, these, are, these are sorted out. Uh, finally, uh, for sustainability, like I told you before, for, for the start, the first five years, the project was dependent on donor. And now as we enter the third phase, the donor funding is only about 60%. And this is expected to go to zero in 2025. So what is really sustaining the program now is what we call the carbon revenue. So this was registered successfully in 2017. And every year now through the rigorous process, uh, the project receives money from the, from the carbon, carbon that they are offset by introduction of biogas. So this money is used, uh, it's supposed to be given back to farmers. So it's used in terms of three ways. One, to pay the quality service providers. Uh, number two, to rectify any issues that may come up with, uh, with, uh, with the farmers. If, if a biogas plant has a problem, uh, it's rectified. Uh, number three, it also has an incentive for the biogas construction enterprises. So they construct plants and if it's checked after six months and all of them are working, then uh, they are paid some, some money. So this has ensured that our quality is always being checked in a sustainable way. Uh, finally, we operate what we call uh, a client service center, whereby every new digester constructed, the owner is given a, a number, a toll free number. So that in the, in the, in the case of any issue, he or she can uh, call the service center and then the service center will notify either the biogas construction enterprise or the national program. So that these kind of issues are, any issues that are reported is quickly addressed. So uh, briefly, that is about the project in Uganda. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Re Okelo. Um, as you can see, if you compare the two countries, they are miles and miles apart. 10,000 as compared to 200. They are miles and, but there's always a point where you start. Um, Okelo, I warn you, we are going to overtake you. Um, if, uh, is it that, uh, are we able to connect to our other, other uh, participants? Okay, thank you for, um, um, who is on the line? Can you put somebody on the line because uh -huh. we, uh, I am informed that we have got uh, Sashim. Uh, Sashim, can you give us the, 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 the biogas uh, uh, status in Nepal? Thank you very much. Yes, I can. 
Uh, good afternoon once again. Uh, uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate uh, Botswana Biogas Sector for this conference, and I would like to thank the host, especially Ludo, for inviting me to uh, speak a few words uh, on Nepal and its uh, progress on the biogas sector. Uh, actually, I've prepared a small presentation, but due to lack of time, I'm just going to go through it. So in Nepal, we started with this domestic biogas sector back in 1992, where uh, it was again the Dutch who supported Nepal uh, with the quality standards, the trainings, the curriculum, etc., for the masons and the supervisors. Uh, since then, like we've come quite a long way. Uh, Nepal is a small country. Uh, it, it's an analog country uh, in between Nepal, uh, in between India and China. So uh, for the fuel purpose, we have to import everything via India. All our LPG is uh, important. Uh, so the thing is, uh, this biogas plays a very vital role uh, in, uh, you know, uh, in the energy sector uh, of my country. Uh, up to now, we have uh, almost installed about 450,000 uh, domestic biogas plants, and it's still going on. Every year, we install about uh, 25 to 30,000 plants uh, in various uh, in, uh, various places of the uh, country. So how this works is uh, basically, uh, even though the uh, the Dutch and the Germans they have stopped, like you know, uh, supporting Nepal uh, via the subsidy program. But then the government has continuously kept on supporting uh, this sector. Yeah, even now, uh, to install one biogas plant, the government uh, subsidizes uh, up to about 30% of the total investment that the farmer has to uh, put by uh, themselves. So which means this is still a relief to uh, the farmers. Uh, and in terms of models, uh, like, you know, uh, we're in a phase of transition. I remember in the morning, uh, like, you know, there were questions asked, like, can you bottle biogas? Can you actually transport biogas? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, we've started that uh, commercially here in Nepal. In fact, uh, the interesting thing is uh, the developers who are into these large biogas uh, plants, they're selling biogas bottles in, in, in compressed, uh, heavy compressed cylinders. Uh, each compressed cylinder holds about uh, uh, 10 kgs of, uh, we call it bio CNG. So this is, they're selling it cheaper than LPG. So this is creating a big, uh, you know, biogas boom in the country right now. So we've commissioned about uh, nine of those very large biogas plants in which biogas is, uh, you know, upgraded and then uh, compressed and sold in the market. Uh, since Nepal is full of hills and mountains, it's very difficult to uh, like, you know, um, uh, transport uh, via, you know, biogas grids. But nevertheless, uh, you know, biogas grid systems are become, becoming popular in Nepal now. Uh, for Nepal, like, you know, uh, up to eight cubic meters, it's considered as uh, domestic biogas. But now larger and larger biogas developers have come up uh, up to 10,000 cubic meters uh, biogas ha has been installed in Nepal, a single plant. Uh, but then like, you know, these domestic biogas, uh, they play a vital role in the economy uh, for Nepal. Uh, back in uh, uh, 2015, uh, Nepal was struck by a very heavy earthquake and like, it was a devastating one. Lots of lives were lost. And like, you know, in the same year, we had some political problems with our neighbor, India. And that was when like, you know, this biogas, uh, you know, project got a big boom in Nepal. So what happened was due to this political uh, problems uh, with these politicians, uh, there was a blockade in which all the fuel that was uh, Nepal was importing was uh, completely stopped. And each LPG cylinder that uh, normally people use uh, in even in urban houses costs about uh, $12 right now. So the price shot up to 100 US dollars at that time and people could not afford. And even those people who could afford it, it was just not available. Then people started to realize the importance of energy independence. Uh, after 2015, we've seen a surge in uh, you know, the demands of biogas from the villages, uh, because uh, if you have a, a domestic biogas installed in your house, 
then you do not need to uh, import any LPG cylinders. It will uh, replace all your um, uh, meals. Uh, in fact, if they have only one cylinder, it will go for the complete year. So whereas uh, in urban settings where uh, domestic biogas is not possible, you'll require at least uh, 12 to 15 cylinders per household. So uh, having said that, uh, we have one big project from the World Bank, so which is uh, continuously supporting the Nepal biogas sector to like, you know, uh, commercialize biogas plants. And we are working with our Indian partners to help us with the technical forefront. And also, Nepal also is earning quite a lot of money from the CDM market. Uh, almost two million US dollars is uh, being like, you know, um, we receive about two, two million US dollars from CDM money from carbon trade for biogas alone. And now with this uh, Paris Agreement in um, force, uh, the ITMO is almost about to start. And even these large biogas, uh, we're about to do this uh, big carbon project. So yes, that's about it from Nepal. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Sashim. Um, uh, without uh, wasting uh, much time, uh, let's see who is on the... I can come in. Yeah, uh, 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 we are handy there. Uh, you can yes. go and tell us the story about the Zimbabwean boy by, by your guest. Thank you very much. My apologies, I was having problems with unmuting myself. So the biogas program in Zimbabwe started as a program in 2013 uh, and it lasted for three years until 2016. Uh, the main uh, promoters of the program like in Uganda were SNV and HIVOS where SNV was the technical partner and HIVOS was the fund management partner. But most important, we had government stakeholders of government partners that were also part of the program and uh, Ministry of Energy and Power Development, mainly for the energy, uh, the Rural Electrification Agency, because we're working mostly in the rural areas, and also uh, Ministry of Agriculture for the um, uh, farm energy that biogas posed as well as the slurry. So our program in Zimbabwe really is focused on developing the biogas, what I would call the biogas back backbone infrastructure, uh, this included trainings uh, of for masons, basically, uh, and making sure that they were certified. So we had masons that were certified, we had quality controllers that were certified, trained and certified. We, we, we came up with designs that were suitable for Zimbabwe climatic conditions. Our feasibility studies re, um, indicated that most biogas digesters uh, prior uh, 2013 were the ones that failed a lot were the ones that were actually uh, not of the MCD type, uh, mainly because uh, we have cold winters, very, very cold winters, and we've got uh, very hot summers. So during the cold, some cold winters, our digesters failed. So we settled for the designs of MCD and SSD, which we borrowed from Tanzania. Uh, we also embarked on a mass awareness raising uh, campaign uh, our main tool was what we call the biogas tools. So we'd basically go around with a trailer full of uh, biogas um, uh, utensils, like biogas uh, stoves, biogas uh, um, rice cookers, you name it. And then we would go to a certain place and where there's a biogas digester, which is functional, which is part of the program. And then that digester, uh, and then we would plug the trailer to that digester and all the appliances would work in people would actually realize that the, digest, the biogas actually works. So it was really a mass uh, awareness raising campaign. We also did market development. We focused really on market development because we, unlike other biogas programs uh, that were being conducted or that were being promoted by SNV and HIVOS, the Zimbabwe program didn't really have a lot of funding. So we really relied on the markets picking up on their own uh, and funding these biogas digesters. We also did standards development for construction of digesters as much as also for ensuring um, how a digester is supposed to be, um, to, to, to be operated, sort of how to be constructed 
And then we also did what we call demonstration sites. I think we put up almost close to 600 or 700 digesters, each of which had a GPS coordinate and what we called pins, basically project, project identification numbers. Uh, our targets were, we had different types of digesters. We had uh, household digesters, what we call domestic digesters, which were from six cubic meters to 20 cubic meters for rural households, which used cow dung and pig dung. We had institutional digesters, which were for schools, clinics, uh, and hospitals. And these were from 20 cubic meter digesters to about 80 cubic meter digesters, and they used human or sewage waste. Uh, then we had what we called commercial biogas, which was really uh, biogas for big farms, uh, and they were above 100 cubic meters. And these were really ma mainly for dairy farms, pig farms, chicken farms, that kind of thing. And then the last type was municipal biogas, where we started off uh, with the feasibility studies uh, with, a city, with the city of Blawayo, which is in Zimbabwe. I'll quickly go on to the update, uh, where we, our target, the, okay, for us, Zimbabwe, I think the main exciting thing was that our government stakeholders were really excited about biogas and they put a biogas target in our national uh, renewable energy um, policy. So we, we, we have, we, we, that target has been everyone's um, target to achieve. Uh, by we needed, we needed, we need about 8,000 digesters by 2030. Uh, and at the moment, I think we are close to 5,000 now. Uh, the new developments that are happening with biogas is now is that now biogas companies are now doing uh, for towns and they are also doing biogas digesters for property developments, what we call, um, uh, what we call them gated communities. They are also now coming in with biogas. The stakeholder partnerships, like I said, it was very important. Government especially was a, an important partner because then the sustainability of the program is actually through the government and not the stakeholders only that way there. And private sector is also being promoted. Biogas uses is also increasing to electricity generation. And we have various partnerships that are coming in uh, and experimenting with different types of, um, of, of, of waste. So we've got uh, TNO, that is actually, it's a Netherlands organization, a Dutch organization, which is coming in and trying to experiment with solid waste, uh, solid household waste. Uh, we also have uh, new uh, prefabricated digesters that are coming in and the smaller prototypes uh, are on uh, pay as you go and are being piloted by an organization called Zonfu. We have, a, we have about 500 already being piloted in the country. I think um, Mr. Shemin, I can uh, stop there for now and elaborate if there are any questions. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chandi. Um, from the noise that I picked, uh, when the, the, the presenters were presenting, there is a trend that shows that um, for, for, for you to move uh, up the ladder for your digesters, you need support. And we are saying we need support also. And without taking much time, let me cross over to Brett. Brett. Fredericks in Netherlands. Crossing over to you, Bart. 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 Hello, can you hear me? Oh, there he is. Go ahead. Hello. Ah, okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I have prepared a presentation as well. Let me just see if I can get it up. I don't know if the host can permit me to share my presentation, my screen. Is that possible? Nothing uh, yet.
Okay, well, it looks like uh, I won't be able to uh, to show it. Um, my presentation uh, uh, is about uh, productive biogas. Uh, that's a field in which I've uh, I've worked for um, uh, about about fifteen years now, starting with a, a, a small NGO um, uh, supporting uh, development work uh, in, the, in the field of bioenergy in uh, uh, developing countries. Um, uh, productive biogas, there's, there's, there's not a very clear definition uh, about it. Uh, productive energy in general um, uh, is about uh, utilizing uh, uh, different sources of energy. Oh, wait a second. Uh, yes, this, you, you can share. It's, it's, it's fine now. You okay. can share. All right. Yeah, you can see it. Go ahead. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, so basically, uh, uh, talking about productive use of energy, um, uh, it, it, it's mainly about uh, utilizing energy for, uh, let's say, income generation, uh, productive, productive activities. Um, and that can include uh, activities like, like milling, uh, uh, grinding of, uh, of, of, of grains of rice, uh, water pumping for irrigation, for example, um, pressing of, of, of oil seeds, uh, heating of products, uh, drying of products, uh, uh, cooling for uh, preservation and storage of, uh, of, of produce. Um, and for all these, uh, let's say energy, different energy sources can be, uh, can be used and that can be electricity, that can be mechanical power, uh, and that can be heat. And of course, uh, biogas is a, is, a, is a very versatile uh, type of fuel that can be used for uh, the production of mechanical power in, uh, in engines, um, can be used for electricity production in, in generators, uh, for, for heat, of course, as, as we all know, um, and can be used for uh, generation of cold um, by, by combustion, uh, by, by using it in uh, that's a conventional LPG uh, cooling units. Um, and all these uh, applications can be uh, subsequently used for uh, productive uses. Now, if we look at uh, one of the main uh, conversion routes that is uh, through the use of, of, of biogas in, uh, in engines. Um, but what is important here, and that has been uh, indicators already by, uh, by by colleagues this, this morning uh, is to 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 mind very well the the gas quality, particularly looking at uh, hydrogen sulfide, which can uh, cause uh, a rapid wear of, uh, of 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 equipment in which the the gas is used, um, but also a uh, minimum methane level in in gas may be required for uh, for certain applications. Um, secondly, it's it's very important to um, uh, uh, to, to, to really mind the maintenance of, uh, of equipment uh, in order to, to avoid, uh, let's say, uh, uh, breakdowns before the, 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 the regular end of life of, of equipment. Um, and let's say looking specifically at engines, um, you can have, uh, let's say, uh, biogas generators, um, you can have uh, diesel generators in which uh, part of the diesel consumption is, is replaced by the biogas. Um, you can have uh, converted gasoline engines uh, or, or uh, LPG engines of, of any particular sizes. And uh, what is uh, becoming more and more popular, especially in Asia, is uh, to, uh, to rebuild uh, diesel engines by fitting them with uh, spark plug systems so that they can uh, operate as a, as, a, as a gas engine. Um, some examples from the, from the, from the field. Um, a, a project carried out in, uh, in, in Guinea, in West Africa, um, uh, within the course of a uh, national biogas program that was carried out uh, over there. Uh, there were several 
larger scale biogas units constructed. And one of them uh, was, was particularly used for uh, water pumping. Um, it was implemented at a, at a fruit farm where they uh, use the water for, for irrigation and the, uh, the slurry for, for fertilizing of uh, banana and, uh, and pineapple fields. Um, another uh, water pumping example uh, from, from Cambodia, where uh, some of the larger units, um, biogas units were uh, used for producing biogas from uh, the wastewater from, uh, from big stables. Um, and over there, they uh, used uh, modified car engines uh, to directly drive water pumps. And they, uh, they pumped the, the, the water needed for, for, for stable cleaning and for uh, and drinking water for the, for the pigs. Um, another example is uh, uh, agro-processing. Uh, in the picture here, you see um, a uh, maize mill that is running on a, on a diesel engine. And uh, in a number of villages in, in, in Mali, uh, uh, such units uh, exist. Um, and uh, small biogas uh, units were constructed there to uh, reduce the diesel consumption for, uh, for these uh, uh, products and activities. Um, and uh, typical reductions uh, range from about 50 to 60 percent of the, the, the diesel that was uh, used beforehand. Um, uh, a second example from uh, Guinea, West Africa. Um, uh, here also uh, an agro-processing center was, uh, was constructed under the so-called uh, multifunctional platform program. Uh, which is carried out by UNDP in, uh, in several countries. Um, uh, similar to, to, to the Mali uh, example, um, uh, biogas was produced at, uh, at, at, at a similar scale using cattle dung and the gas being used in, uh, in, in diesel engines for replacing some of the, the diesel yes. that was being used. I'll take three minutes. Three minutes? Three. Quite. Quite good, quite good. Um, so a, a final consideration about the, uh, the, the economics. Um, it, it, it's very uh, case specific. Um, let's say the scale is, is, is very important. Large scale uh, uh, units tend to have uh, relatively lower uh, investment costs. Biogas technology that is, that is possible depending also on the, on the type of feedstock. Um, the, the, the application, whether it's there's, there's existing equipment that can be used. Um, the, the, the benefits very much depend on the, on the scale, of course, but also the, the, the cost of alternatives, um, like, like in, 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 in landlocked countries where, uh, 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 let's say, other fuels uh, need to be transported over land. Um, the rate of utilization, whether uh, units can be uh, used to their fullest extent or whether in some seasons uh, they, uh, they, they may be standing still. Uh, lifespan, lifespan of, of equipment, uh, level of maintenance and um, uh, service providers uh, very much depend, uh, very much determine the, the, the sustainability of a, of a, of a project. So all these, these, these issues um, uh, have their influence on the, the uh, overall economics. Um, I think this uh, this is where uh, I will end my presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Frederick. Um, ladies and gentlemen, that is our last panelist. Um, before I return the the button to the the uh, directors, I would say. Like I, I have mentioned earlier, there's a trend, a different trend here of the number of years that we have uh, those uh, countries have had uh, biogas. So we can see, we can see that we are, we are in our infancy, but I'm still saying we are going to catch up. Uh, back to you, Director of Ceremonies for Questions and Answers. Ramu Dise and Rao Kelo, you can join me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the floor is open.
Uh, earlier on, I haven't had the opportunity to uh, take uh, the questions from the diaspora. This is also an opportune time to do so. But uh, please, by just your show of hands, um, may we please uh, uh, get your questions, if there are any. There was a question that was asked earlier from the gentleman to your left. Can you please give him that opportunity because I had promised before we had gone for lunch, even if it's not specific to this session. Uh, thank you, Mr. Siboni. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for the question that I've asked. Uh, we have uh, noted that there are two types of design. That is the brick and mortar design and the fiberglass design. But my point is, uh, does this design have any impact to the combustion output? That is the first question. And the second question would be, why is it the design or the gas holder, all, all of them being shaped in a capped format at the top? Is there any reason for that? Thank you. Thank you. Um, this one is to Re Mudise. I was looking at the bill of quantities here, and I not I mean I, I noted that in your presentation you did indicate that there is some leakages sometimes that you experience in the domes. And I'm wondering if isn't there necessary to have a sealant layer inside? Because from the BOQ, it looks like there's nothing that seals the, the diaphragm inside of the, the digester. Maybe that also could be the reason why you experience some leakages. Thank you. Thank you. Over to yourselves. I think uh, we can start with Remudise, or do you want to tackle? I will I will it up. Now we will the bill of quantities in Hore Roha Mode Fremung Hawaz and wa some sort of a sealant because no buaka kadi leakage. Okay, no. Thank you so much. Um in terms of our digesters, what do we do in the bill of quantities? You will see that there is um um the we wrote acrylic um waterproofing that's what we use uh, in our plastering we've got um five different layers that we apply and the last two layers that's when we mix we've got different ratios of mixing from the first layer until the fifth layer and the last two layers that's where we apply that uh, uh, um, acrylic waterproofing paint with uh, the cement. But now the, the challenge was that we realized normally some of the masons, they cast the dome pipe after plastering, which resulted in the leak. That's, that's some of the challenges that we experienced. The other one was that um, the dome pipe assembly, uh, some of them, they don't fla almost flush it with the, with the wall. So you will realize that you have a lot of gas around that uh, uh, the gas chamber, but you cannot uh, harness it because the, the pipe is low. So those were some of the challenges that we experienced. So we rectified that they need to cast the, the uh, dome pipe assembly first before they start uh, plastering. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Ramo Dise. Um, the, the question that was asked earlier, um, about the, the type of the the, 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 the the shape and also the material. I think I'll pose it uh, to all my panelists here. They've got the experience. They've been working in the, in the biogas. I just pose it to any one of them to, to, to assist in, in answering that uh, question. Panelists, there's a question. Thank you. Yes, so I, I think I can address the one of uh, the different designs, whether they have an implication on gas production. Is that right? Uh, 
Yes, they, they do. Uh, I just give you an example. Uh, the, the biogas production requires constant temperature all through. So when we have digesters that are outside, especially the prefabricated types, if you have a sudden change in weather, uh, definitely it affects the function of the microorganisms. So gas production reduces a bit. So when we're promoting the, these other types, especially those that are above the ground, we always make sure the user is aware of this kind of, uh, kind of problems. But also at times when the weather is hot, then you find that the ones above ground actually also perform very well because you know biogas production increases with the, with the temperature. If you're operating at set temperatures above 40 degrees centigrade constantly, there you have a very good uh, gas production. So yes, it, it varies. But the fixed dome has the advantage that it, you're constantly sure about uh, the gas production because the temperatures down do not fluctuate so much. And that's why we, we prefer it so, so much. Then about the shape, uh, was it because of it being cylindrical? Or the, the shape is just to facilitate gas, gas movement out. When it's cylindrical, it's better. If you had a, a rectangular shape or any other funny shape, getting that gas out of it all will not be possible. You'll find that some of it be, will be retained inside the, the digester because of its shape. So we prefer this current shape that helps for gas to, to be extracted out of it all. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Reo Okelo. Is there anyone from the panelists who has got uh, an additional uh, information towards the, the question that was asked? I think, um, thank you, Renzo. Um, just to add on what uh, Mr. Okelo said, the, our cylindrical shape, we are ensuring that we exert we exact pressure uh, to one location as opposed to having so many different locations. You will realize that even your cylinders for LPG, they are um, cylindrically shaped where we are um, harnessing the, the gas. So it's an issue of making sure that um, we exert, as he's saying, for us to harness the gas uh, efficiently. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Ramudise. Any panelists online who can add something? If not, I will say thank you to all the panelists. And let me remind you about the uh, conference theme. Biogas for Botswana, a solution to energy and environmental challenges. It says, the theme is posed as a question that will be answered by the participant through sharing of different intervention brought about by the project and what this intervention means to the future of biogas in Botswana. Um, I'm reminding you of this uh, uh, theme because we have heard about uh, different um, stages uh, from different uh, countries about biogas. And it's one of those um, sentences that you can, you can pick up from here and try to answer this uh, theme of our 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 conference. Uh, with that, uh, I'll thank again the, our panelists. Thank you very much. Uh, back to you, uh, Sibon. Thank you so much. Let's give them a round of applause. You may step down. And I like the way you posed this question, uh, Renzoe, because it leads us right into our last session: the future of biogas in Botswana. Is there really one? Or are we just here talking away? Our online panelist uh, wanted to say something. I think that was Sushim. Yeah, we can see you. But you can unmute yourself, Sushim. 
sorry about that. Uh, I, I kept on getting unmuted. So um, uh, one of the questions was what can be done, right? So uh, we kind of realized that in Nepal now we're trans we have transitioned ourselves into this new type of uh, biogas technology called the CSTR. It's called the continuously steered tank reactor in which uh, we realized that agitation plays a big, big role uh, in the amount of gas produced. So uh, our national, we have a national standard in which the quali quality standards has been defined by the government itself. And um, uh, the university has been doing continuous research on it. We can realize that the yield from these biogas is about uh, the, uh, from the theoretical point of view, we can only get about 40% of the actual uh, gas we can get from uh, agitating the whole thing. So now, uh, continuously state tank reactor has become more and more popular in Nepal, and especially in this commercial uh, biogas uh, sector where people are selling biogas, uh, it is very important that efficiency of this biogas plant plays a very vital role. So I would like to uh, say that, like, you know, uh, as some of the other panelists has, had mentioned, you know, temperature plays a vital role. So does, does the pH, uh, but then uh, agitation also plays an equally uh, important role uh, in generating a lot of biogas. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sushim. What does your name mean, uh, Sushim? I think we've lost him. Anyway, thank you, Sushim. So the question has been posed. It is now time for us to answer with this very last session of this very engaging conference, BioGuess for Botswana 2021, uh, this conference. This project has had a number of years, and uh, really, all I'm seeing is lead tidings up until this point. So we're going to ask Chimbizani Bratanozo, Bratonozovic. Braton. I'm going to say it properly, Ch uh, uh, Chimbi. Bratonozic. You have to say it properly. You, we call to the stage Chimbizani Bratonozic. <laughs> That's how you say it. All right. And um, uh, she's the UNDP special uh, program special environment. Uh, Specialist on Environment and Climate Change. So thank you, Chimbi. Joining you, we are going to call Renzoe back as a panelist, but this time he's also wearing a different hat <laughs> as the head of renewal energy <laughs> at the Department of Energy. And we would also like to have uh, Rejon Matlapeng who is representing Melo Ratomarapedi from the National Development Bank, and he's a product uh, development specialist. Our representative from the Minister of Environment uh, and Natural Resources, unfortunately, will not be able to, to join us. But for our online audience, thank you for those of you who have stayed on and stayed tuned uh, we're really happy with all the feedback that we can get. The future of biogas in Botswana, is there one? That is the golden question. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Thank you very much, Director of Ceremonies. And uh, the question has been asked, uh, the future of biogas in Botswana, is there one? And like we said, the previous session led us nicely into this one because we hope to get answers, particularly on sustainability. Because as you all know, uh, Biogas was a pilot project and it will be coming to an end as already indicated by, pre uh, by previous speakers. However, I have with me here on the stage, two gentlemen who have a wealth of information uh, and they have been with the organizations for a very long time. I have next uh, on my right, Mr. Setsedi Harambe Nzue, who has the environment, uh, the renewable section in the Department of uh, Energy. Um, and I have also furthest away from us, Mr. John Matapeng, who is the pro uh, product development specialist uh, at the National Development Bank. Gentlemen, you're welcome.
Uh, I will not be giving very long um, you know, introductions. They'll give a brief synopsis of what they are responsible for before they uh, respond to the uh, questions that I'll pose. Uh, however, don't let the short intro fool you because like I said, again, they have a, a wealth of knowledge. It's unfortunate that uh, we cannot be joined by anybody from the Minister of Environment. However, we have benefited a lot today from uh, some of the work or the policy strides that the ministry has, has made by far. And uh, they do indicate that indeed there is a future for biogas and other renewables that contribute to reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. So without further ado, uh, I'll move on to the first uh, panelist, uh, which is uh, Ren Zue. Um, Ren Zue, we have gathered today that biogas is one of the best alternative renewable sources of energy. Uh, with great potential to fulfill the demand of cooking, lighting energy, where there currently exists no option other than firewood. It is eco-friendly and it has many other benefits such as being clean, sustainable, simple to use and cost-effective. With that said, uh, we would like to appreciate from yourselves as the ministry, uh, what are the plans of the ministry to ensure biogas can contribute significantly to the energy mix. And uh, in addition to that, you would also highlight, uh, you know, the future plans and also plans for the ministry to take forward this pilot initiative uh, into the future and perhaps to the rest of the country. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you very much, Simbi, for, 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 for that question. Um, like uh, Re Seboni has indicated, um, I came. I come again now wearing a different hat. Um, I'm a. I'm the head of the renewable energy section at the Department of Energy, of which uh, this uh, project, biogas project, falls under my portfolio. Um, I'm an energy and environmental engineer. As you can see, my title is fit for this. The energy and the environment. And we are trying to address these two issues at the same time, the energy for cooking and preserving the, 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 the environment. Um, going back to uh, your question, um, the minister, the director, the peers this morning have indicated that the ministry is in a position to move forward with the with the the, the accessible uh, reliable uh, uh, sources of energy and and environmental friendly so uh, the ministry and the department of energy has been pushing for the access to uh, a re reliable uh, energy by 2036, uh, of which we have we have got quite a number of, of, of projects that will lead to the to, to realizing the our, our dream. Now getting to the biogas. Biogas um, uh, is a is a is a, a, a project that is targeting uh, those people who are using agro waste, and for 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 this uh, question, biogas in Botswana is there what future? Is there the future for biogas in Botswana? I would say yes. There is a lot of uh, potential for biogas to grow in Botswana. From the last session, you could you could hear from all these countries that they started small and some are at 50,000, the, the targets are 5,000, 8,000, they are at, at, at 5,000. And we are just saying we are at 100, 200 uh, digesters. And look at our, looking at our, our population, we, we are looking at the population whereby 
fewer people stay in the in the in the urban areas and majority of people are in the rural areas and that is where we need the biogas uh, you know there is uh, deforestation in in Botswana and to curb the deforestation um one of the the the, the beneficiaries when we were interacting with him he said the biogas uh, digester had helped them to put the X down. And by, say, by saying that they put the X down, they say, they, he means that they are no longer cutting trees and they can have, uh, they can cook any time of the, the, the day, whereas it's cold or rainy or whatever. And when you, you use a, uh, uh, firewood for cooking. You can't go and get firewood when it's raining. And if you get the firewood when it's raining, you can't cook with them before they dry. So I would say biogas, since it can be used in any condition, at any place, there is future for biogas in Botswana. Thank you. Thank you very much, Reza Tediharan and Sue for that. Um, this should fairly be a, a short session because we only have two panelists, uh, but perhaps Renzo, just as a follow-up, um, may you kindly share the statistics? What is, where are we currently in terms of mm -hmm. biogas and perhaps where are we projected to be uh, in the next couple of years, if you may tie to other commitments that we have made? Thank you. Um, right now, we, we are just about to complete the 200 uh, digesters that uh, were funded by uh, GIZ, uh, Jeff and UNDP. And uh, we got uh, also uh, 31 digesters that were pilots. So at this juncture, we are standing at 231 uh, digesters. And uh, for future, we, we have already, uh, our, my ministry have already drafted a concept note. This concept note is for rolling out the digester to the rest of the country. And in this concept note, there, there is need for, 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 for assistance. Like we have uh, seen from the other uh, presentation that they needed support. We are going to need support. First of all, we need to train more masons so that they can cover the whole country. And that needs a lot of resources. Um, imagine somebody in Shagawe wants to put up a, 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 a biogas digester. And I'm, in he, I'm here in Habron. And for you to put up a biodigester, start right from the, the setting up, you need monitoring. And building, we need monitoring. The feeding, we need monitoring. As you, you, you heard, Ray Okello was, was uh, stressing that feeding is one of those critical areas in the, in the biodigesters. And it, indeed, it is. If you don't feed your digester correctly, you will end up saying, this thing doesn't work because you didn't feed uh, the, the, the digester uh, correctly. So it needs a lot of monitoring. And that is why I say we need to uh, train more masons so that they can, they can, they can assist us in building those uh, 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 digesters throughout the, 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 the country. And for the initial rolling out, we were looking at uh, uh, installing 750 digesters. And these digesters uh, from the concept note, it's going to be distributed to the, 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 the areas in Botswana according to the district. And we were using the population census for 2011 to equally distribute uh, these uh, digesters according to the, 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 the district. And also even the masons, we are going to train the masons with those uh, statistics from the 2011 uh, population census so that we can distribute them evenly on, on, on different uh, 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 districts. 
it's still a concept note. Like I say, we need support to roll out that uh, 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 those digesters to the rest of the of the of the country, so that at the end of 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 two or three years, we can proudly say we are close to a thousand digesters. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arantzo, for that. I did realize that my question could have gone either way. Uh, when I said statistics, I was referring to the contribution of biogas to the energy mix. Uh, but as you think about that, perhaps let's move over to Ray Matapeng. Uh, Rema Tapeng, once again, thank you very much for making time to join uh, this important uh, discussion today. Um, as pressures on global warming and climate change remain high on the country's agenda, including Botswana, uh, and research has also continued to show us that uh, Botswana is one of the most vulnerable um, countries in Southern Africa when it comes to the projected uh, effects of climate change. And we know that banks are, or financial institutions are becoming increasingly you know, uh, important in assisting countries to meet their ambition. And in various discussions with our colleagues from the bank and yourselves, we have seen the bank indicating the need for it to keep up with the times and also help the government, uh, you know, respond or um, meet the obligations that it has made, particularly under the Paris Agreement. So with that said, Remata Peng, uh, would you be so kind to share with the, the participants today, what are the plans of the bank to support biogas production and usage as well as upscaling of the technology? Over to you, sir. Um, thank you, ma'am. And um, good afternoon to everyone. Um, at National Development Bank, we do recognize um, the need to address uh, the, the climate change and issues surrounding it. Now, as a bank, um, we are focused on the agriculture sector as an, as an agriculture-focused bank. And um, now one of the areas in, that, in, which we look, in which we are focusing on is basically adoption of um, renewable energy technologies. Now, um, in just by way of background, in trying to implement um, renewable energy technologies or, or promoting the implementation of renewable energy technologies, um, we have uh, followed a number of processes. The first one being um, entering into an MOU with the Department of Energy. Um, that's where we basically get guidance uh, with uh, anything related to green energy. And we're also implementing, and we also have also implemented our uh, environmental and social uh, management framework with support from UNDP. And uh, aspects of, the, of, um, of that framework are actually being implemented in our loan products. So whenever, whenever we're promoting loans, um, there are, there are metri metrics that we do look at in terms of from the social aspect and also in terms of from supporting um, uh, adoption of renewable energy technologies within our, our loan products. Now, um, talking about, uh, I mean, focusing on, on, on biogas, um, we've looked at biogas as a, a new initiative within, the, within our nation, a new technology in which could be adopted to help us address um, measures uh, relating to um, uh, global warming and so forth. And um, we've basically been mainly focusing on the small to medium scale uh, biodigesters for funding. Now our funding, the position for our funding is basically that um, we look at the project that we are funding, which is the business. And however, we do look at uh, renewable energy technologies like biogas digesters as enablers uh, to promote um, a, a sustainability within the environment. So we do fund um, such, uh, such project, uh, such as projects of biogas and our loan products and under our flagship, pro uh, our existing flagship projects. Now um, in, in our funding, what we've, uh, the areas in which we do look at are obviously since it's a loan, viability is a key area and um, uh, and, and also looking at uh, the past experiences with renewable energy technologies, we do look at the, um, let's say the management aspect of it, the issues surrounding workmanship, because 
in terms of biogas, there's some sort of setup process that has to be followed. And also, like the gentleman has just stated there, it's critical to have um, availability of masons because we fund projects or customers throughout um, various areas of the country. And it's important to have those skills of the, or those masons within at least the particular areas in those, um, uh, in those localities. So uh, our, our, our approach towards um, supporting renewable energy, specifically speaking to um, uh, biogas, is within, the, is, is within the framework of our loan products and um, not just the biogas, but also other renewable energy um, uh, uh, technologies that, uh, that could be adopted. And we hope that, um, uh, I think the more the word goes out in, into the public concerning the use of biogas, the more we get our public or the people to move away from um, uh, basically cutting down trees for energy and actually using the agro waste, which is available um, within our farming operations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Remata Ping, for that. And uh, participants, you can hear opportunities do exist uh, for you to go try your luck uh, at the NDB because there is financing available. But uh, once again, Ramata Peng, just a quick follow-up um, in terms of the plans that are quite clear and it looks like they are pretty much at an advanced stage in terms of financing uh, by, by, by digesters. Uh, this is small and medium. Um, looking at that, this is not necessarily an area or technology that the bank has financed before, how do you intend to quality assure? And uh, I say this because uh, this is something that has come out uh, from the discussions that we've had today as uh, a bit of a challenge. And uh, the department, however, through the support of UNDP was able to somewhat address. But as the bank, given that it's a new area that we'll be venturing into, how do you plan on making sure that uh, the quality assurance is, is handled properly? Over to you, sir. Thank you. Um, now, in terms of the quality of work, um, uh, being undertaken, given that it's a new technology. Uh, we have made deliberate, like I did state earlier, that we did make deliberate steps to enter into formal engagements with our stakeholders at the Department of Energy, where we discuss where there are engagements in terms of uh, the type of setup that has to be done and the qualifications of those individuals who are actually um, undertaking or doing that, that construction, and also the masons from scaling of the masons. So we have, um, we do have engagements with them. And um, this, uh, this is a partnership or a stakeholder that is very critical to uh, our success in terms of supporting renewable energy. So our continued engagements with them and setting up of the standards as we, as we discuss within our engagements and also identifying the uh, skilled masons within various areas of the country. Hopefully we'll be able to cover all areas of the country. These are the steps that uh, we've actually uh, commenced and we are ongoing with them. Thank you very much. I wanted you to reiterate that because uh, to everyone, once again, we just want to emphasize the importance of collaboration in delivering uh, such initiatives. Uh, because as speakers in the morning have also highlighted for us to be able to deliver on our obligations as a country, we need all hands on deck, as they sometimes say. So we need everybody to be everybody relevant and, uh, you know, who could contribute to be on board. So uh, perhaps, thank you, Remata Peng. Uh, back to you, Renzoe, in terms of the statistics again, just for the participants to appreciate how much biogas is contributing currently to the energy mix. And perhaps if you have projections for future, you could also share. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Um, let me start first with the statistics of the renewable energy in the, in the energy mix. We are very low in the, in the, in the renewable energy as a whole. Uh, that is including uh, solar, wind, uh, biogas, and other, other renewable energy technologies. Um, so far, I would say we are, we are just under 2% in the uh, uh, renewable energy into the 
to the to the energy energy mix. So you can see that the the biogas contribution it will be even smaller than what the renewable energy is contributing towards the the the, the, the energy mix. So having said that, um, with the with the with the growth of the the biogas, the 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 the, the two hundred uh, 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 digesters. After we concluded uh, the installation, then that, that then that is when we can quantify the amount of contribution uh, in the renewable energy towards the renewable to, to towards the energy mix. So far, we can say we have we 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 can quantify the amount of of contribution uh, done by the the uh, by biogas alone, uh, separating it from the other renewable energy. As, you, as I've already said that we are just under 2%. And this uh, 2%, uh, uh, like I said, is constituted uh, with other renewable energy uh, technologies. So with the end of the biogas, and after the consultancy that we are doing that uh, is going to assess the, 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 the installation of the, the 200 uh, uh, plus so uh, uh, biodigesters, we will be able to take out the, the the statistics and share them with all the, the the stakeholders. That here is our biogas; it's contributing so much. Here is our solar; it's contributing so much, and also other technologies like wind. They will we will share that with the with the with the stakeholders on how much. They contribute to the energy mix. Thank you. Thank you very much, Renzo, for that, and absolutely understandable. Uh, participants, colleagues, you can see there is a future for biogas in Botswana. Uh, on behalf of the Environment the Ministry of Environment, Natural Resources, Conservation, and Tourism, we can only say that uh, they do acknowledge and appreciate that uh, biogas it's an environmentally friendly energy source. Because it, because it alleviates two major environmental problems simultaneously. And these include the global waste epidemic that releases dangerous levels of methane gas every day. Uh, the second one being the reliance on fossil fuel energy to meet global energy demand. So um, biogas does give us an opportunity for us to divert or transition uh, out uh, from coal towards uh, renewable energies. So um, I think my panelist, it's been great. Uh, so let me hand it over to the uh, director of ceremonies for them to take questions, if any, from the floor. Over. Thank you so much, Shimbi. Um, there, there are many. And not only are these questions, but there are also suggestions and comments and additions and subtractions. Uh, I take it somebody's taking notes because this is what we are here for. Proceed. Uh, thank you very much once more. Uh, my question comes to Mr. Nzewe. My first question is, uh, as you have been in this industry for a long time, uh, I'm sorry because I come from the petroleum subsector where there is a lot of uh, tempering with the output. So my point is, is there anything that people, pardon? All right, sorry. Is there anything that people normally do to speed up the reaction of this biogas from the, the gas port? That is the first question. Then the second one is, <clears throat> my question is, I'm coming from the petroleum subsector whereby people are always playing around with the end product. That is, you will think you are having a biogas, it's only to find that people are putting something within the, the chemical uh, preparations of this in order for them to speed up the process or just to temper with the, the output of the biogas. Now my point was, is there anything that you have noticed because you have been in this industry for a long time that can be used to temper, whether positive or negative, with the end results of the biogas. 
And then the second one is we are living in a situation where there is uh, the garbage you put in is the garbage you get out with, with the, the, the standard that we are expecting to be signed from the ministry. I remember one colleague just said that before. Uh, uh, are the standards going to depend with what you put in? Thank you, sir. You can take more and then decide how to distribute the questions. Thank you so much. Um, mine is not a question, um, but maybe an addition to um, can biogas, it, does it have a future? I think one of the critical aspects where the financial institutions are coming in, if you look at the way the project was designed, as Renzo was uh, indicating that it will start with support, but as other um, countries that we have learned from as well, there was support at the beginning, but we need also to make sure that um, the private sector takes over. There is a higher participation of the private sector um, by reducing also that support. So we, we need, as we are rolling out, to make sure that we balance between the support and making sure that with all that we have done, the guidelines, the standards, now the private sector, not necessarily the masons that we have trained, the industry is ready to take off. I think that's one aspect. The second aspect is um, from, from my little experience with implementing this project. A lot of, as we commission more projects, there is appetite from Botswana to implement this biogas. A lot of appetite, most of which are ready to pay labor costs. We are talking about Boma 18,000 for labor only. So it shows you that there are people that are ready as long well as they are assured that this thing is working. Which brings me to this final one to say, the challenge now becomes the appliances. We don't have them in Botswana. Appliances, I mean stoves, heaters, desulfurizers, we don't have them. And until we have appliances in Botswana, until we support um, Botswana to have those appliances or to, to have them in the market somehow, we are going to struggle to allow the private sector to uptake. Even the masons, uh, if they have a private line, they start asking me, where are we going to get the, the stoves and all those things? So thank you so much. Mine was, was just a comment. He wasn't shouting. This is just how he speaks. Hey, we're passionate. Because... <laughs> I think I need to move this side of the room. Uh, good afternoon. I guess my question is on the, the, next, the next plan for the biogas. Uh, what I'm getting from you, Renzoe, or from all of us here, is the plan for the rollout of the small-scale digesters. How about medium-scale digesters? What are we saying about them? Come again. Medium-scale digesters. What is the plan for the medium-scale digesters? We'll then start talking about energy mix. The moment we start underlining medium scale digesters. I think let's also have a plan for medium scale digesters. It's very clear for small scale digesters. And as Remudi has already said, there are so many calls of us wanting small scale digesters. That one can simply be rolled out. But medium scale digesters, what are we saying? I think that's my question. Thank you, Italy. Okay, proceed. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I have a, a few points. One, future of biogas in Botswana is attractive, is good. There is good chance that it will succeed. However, we will need to take a lot of precautions. You know, we started uh, with solar energy, solar water heaters several years ago. 
And I think by now, Botswana should have been the reference point in the whole of the region. But a lot of problems arose, which were not arrested quickly. And that made us to go back many years up to now that we have not yet fully recovered. One, we have talked about it this afternoon in the morning, installation is paramount. We need to train, we need to create standards, we need to make uh, various associations to be responsible for the workmen that form their organizations. That's one, we need to continuously do that so that we don't fall into the same pit hole. Number two, there must be some incentives. Uh, the, ministry, the department knows various incentives that are possible and how to write concept notes about them. Number three, I think when we talk of biogas contribution, we should not look in, we should not talk in terms of quantity, quantities of the small plants that we are installing. Let's talk in terms of capacity. That's the way we will understand the contribution in terms of the energy content, not really the number. Uh, like you did some years ago, when you projected that we'll be producing 50 million barrels of uh, biodiesel. Let's do the same thing with biogas uh, to do that. Uh, that brings me, I like the question asked by one of the colleagues there, that why is the ship not flat and it is cap? At the end, that's a very good question. And we can look at it from the theoretical perspective that if it were flat, the streamlines of the gas flowing from the bottom will hit the top and there will be recirculation at the two edges, preventing the gas from flowing like the people have <laughs> said. So the streamline will be disturbed. So I like the way they answered it. <clears throat> and finally, we need to emphasize the importance of research. Um, research is crucial. Even when we install 750 units, we need research continuously. And like somebody asked now, what can be done to increase the flow rate? Obviously, like the consultant said, Temperature has an, uh, an impact, but there are so many other factors that should be thrown to the research domain on how to increase the flow rate of gas. There is a future, we must handle it well, we must encourage people, we must provide uh, incentives so that more people Entrepreneurs, people will be busy uh, going into biogas production. I think I should stop there. Thank you very much. I'll also ask my uh, director of ceremonies perhaps to pause it here and allow for panelists to attempt some of the questions that are posed. Yes. But do note in that uh, most of them were comments. We even got responses to some of the questions asked earlier, which is brilliant, and also acknowledgement that indeed there is a future for biogas. Uh, perhaps uh, to my panelists, I'll throw back to Ren Zue and other colleagues who were here before uh, to respond to the one on interference with the gas output. Uh, Ren Zue, you could attempt, and then maybe other colleagues who've had much more longer experience, like Wurrao Kelo and others online, could also come in. Over to you, Renzo. 
Uh, thank you very much for the for the questions. Let me start with the last two two questions. Others were the suggestions from the prof. Um, Doc, with the medium uh, to large scale uh, biodigesters, I think we this morning it was discussed when we were talking about the feasibility studies and and all those things and. When I was moderating here, I said, we need support. With that support, we can now think uh, large scale by biodigesters. What I'm saying is, right now we can only manage to support the small scale biodigesters. We did the feasibility studies. We did the, board, the, the business model for the for the for the for the medium to large scale and we don't have support to carry out the implementation of that uh, 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 digester so the answer is just simple if we don't have support we can't go along and and, and say we can put up a a, a medium to large uh, a digester i'll try to attempt the ones that uh we're talking about the interference, is it? Yes. Um, yes, you are from the oil company and you've got uh, different uh, uh, filling stations who are dealing with uh, selling and buying of, of fuel. I think it's a little bit different when it comes to biogas. It's for individual in your home. If you temper with the with the production of gas in your home, you are tempering with your your your, your benefits. So I think it's a different, uh, and I don't think as an individual, you, if you own something, you can temper. We can temper with that so that somebody can fail somewhere else. So I take it for a, um, since it's for individuals. It's different from the, the 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 comparison that you did with the with the with the with the oil oil, oil industry. That I want to remind me, uh, Jimmy, uh, the same question from him. You can remind me a little bit about. Perhaps just to repeat, sir, um, because I noted appliances, but not uh, your second question. Unless if it was covered somewhere in the discussions. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my, my second question was about the standards that we are waiting uh, to be. Uh, thank you so much. Um, right. About the, the, the standards. Um, the development of the biogas standards, as uh, Rale Kaunyana uh, say, say, uh, has presented this morning, is that um, whenever there is a new technology, we look at uh, two basic things. What is the technology going to do to the life of Botswana? And if it's going to uplift the, the life of Botswana, uh, we say, what is it that we can do that will not affect those life of Batwan? And that's how we develop uh, standards. We look at a, a product or a service and we say, let's standardize this service so that if somebody is doing it here, they can do it at the same standard with somebody who is doing that. We standardize uh, things that we we, we 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 do and it's the same as we we develop the the the, the biofuel guidelines everyone wants to produce their own uh, uh, biodiesel but for us to protect you as the producer and the consumer we have got to have standards so that when i put my product they are, they are biodiesel in your car it doesn't damage your car and if it damage your car without any guidelines there is no way you can take or you can sue me for not complying with 
something that is not safe. So the standards are there to protect both the, cons the consumer and the producer so that there is a, 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 a level playing field. If somebody needs to sue somebody, there is something that you fall back to as standardized. I, I think I've tried to answer your question. Thank you. Yes, no, thank you very much for that, Renzo. Um, maybe we can take more and... Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, let's uh, go with uh, Romulo Siwa, then I'll, I'll move over to the brother here. Two questions from me. Um, well, the first one is just a comment to say, maybe we've done the first five years, we've seen the pace at which we can deliver. And maybe going forward, we can try and speed up the pace. And my suggestion would be, please allow private sector participation. Um, because if you want it to be government driven, government supervised and government implemented, then you are denying um, the country, the pace and the ability to move quickly on this matter. Because the biogas, uh, for me, I think, yes, it has a future and we are under pressure, by the way. Um, we've heard of uh, synthetic diamonds, and that obviously tarnishes the, our, our aspirations about our diamonds. Now, with beef, we are coming to a point where we are going to have black beef. Why black beef? Because our cattle, the two million cattle that we've have, we have here, produce tons and tons of dung, which then emits this methane into the environment. So our own animals that are any revenue for the country. At the same time, they are damaging the ozone layer. So very soon our beef will be blacklisted or at least there'll be campaigns against our beef because we've got people that don't want us as a country to, to survive. You have a synthetic, uh, well, what is it? Lab, lab manufactured beef already in Japan. So our beef now is seriously threatened. So we need to really move quickly with biogas so that if people want to undermine our beef, at least you can say, you know, we are doing something about it. We are using the, the cow dung to manufacture uh, something, or at least to protect the environment. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, uh, Reseboni. Uh, my question, I don't know whether it would be two questions in the end, but I, I just wish to touch on the issue that uh, Prof uh, talked about earlier. He jogged my mind. Uh, it's on the issue of the critical success factors for biogas to be taken up in, in Botswana. It is not very clear what the critical success factors are. Uh, what I hear a lot coming out is uh, government support. And government support is very broad. You know, we need to appreciate what we are talking about when we say government support. Is it a subsidy? And what subsidy is it? What, what, what form of subsidy would we require? And then the prof talked about uh, tax, well, he talked about incentives. And I just put in the word tax in there to say, does this thing require tax incentives? If so, what are they? You know, just so that you know, we appreciate the level of government support that we are talking about and what it is. And then uh, the health and safety issues have been downplayed uh, the entire day today. I haven't really had anything on health and safety. Is this thing, once you have connected it, no issues at all in terms of safety or in terms of health? Can people tamper with the gas and then you have an explosion underground or anything of that sort? I think. These are some of the issues that uh, we also need to appreciate whether uh, once buried underground and we keep feeding it, there are no issues or we may have issues and how do we address, how do we address those? So I think maybe I'll just stop here for now. Some of the issues have been uh, dealt with with uh, some, uh, uh, some of my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. Do you wish to tackle these? Or do you want uh, you want more? Um, before I forget, let me <laughs> try to to answer um, them. Um, the first one, uh, 
ya 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 revolusi ya pre am when ya gen revolusi was basically uh, a pro encouraging us to allow the private Aha. sector to participate and, and before encouraging the, the he, he he talked about the the speed that we 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 we, we are installing the the digesters uh, first of all let me say as when the project started it was coupled with research and research take time that is why it was a little bit slower now that um we are saying those 31 digesters the lessons the lessons learned from those 31 digesters uh, uh, we, we we are using them to uh install the 200 and um, from 2017 to 2019 we we installed only 31 from december 2019 to now 2021 we are almost done with the 200 so you can see that we have learned from the research and the pilot uh, project and then the acceleration we have got the momentum now that the funding is coming to an end we want to keep that momentum in installing even more that is why we say we want to train even more masons so that at a at a go at a given uh, time we can be able to install more than 50 digesters at a given time that will accelerate and that will will will, will increase the numbers that uh, that 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 we are having for now with the with, with the digesters uh ramp off um the 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 safety of the of the gas a raw kilo will 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 augment on that this is a very 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 low pressure gas and even if you can leave the the valve the whole night in the house closed windows the gas is not stable on its own it will be absorbed by the atmospheric air so there won't be any explosion there is nothing that will, will will even if you strike the match it only ignites because it's coming from an orifice a small hole and it's concentrated at that small hole the moment you leave it to dissipate in the in the air it's no longer a flammable so the safety part of it has been addressed during the research of all this uh, uh, uh digesters and the 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 the, the equipment i would i would like to touch on something that uh, remudi said touched on the equipment right now we are saying it's a challenge it's an opportunity for others to see that there is lack of this why not venture into supplying this equipment so that biogas can grow and who can do that it's not the government is the private sector here is a niche for 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 for, for an opportunity to grow the the biogas market is a challenge yes for the government because we don't we can't do it but for the private sector yourself open up a shop buy those equipment because right now people have got the appetite for biogas they will buy those equipment and those by buying those equipment you are engaging these masons so that they don't fold their arms because they don't have equipment to 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 install after building your 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 digest so let's take all the challenges as opportunities to grow the biogas thank you Thank you very much Renzo. Perhaps one other question you may have left out, the critical success factors. Uh as the gentleman would like to really understand clearly what is required in terms of the support to government uh to see 
the upscaling of uh, biogas uh, happening in the country. Uh, we'll allow him to drink water and he will come back to you on that one. Um, perhaps while he comes back, uh, just to add that at the beginning of this pilot initiative, uh, quite a bit of time was also spent on just, if you may, like for lack of better word, perhaps selling the intervention to the beneficiaries. Uh, because this is a new technology being introduced to our local communities who are not familiar with it. And therefore, it took a little bit of time for people to really buy in and understand the processes. And therefore, we saw now interest coming out at a much more later stage, particularly really after the midterm uh, period of the project. And therefore, just to contribute to Ray Mulisiwa's question on perhaps the pace at which the project has moved in installation. Over to you, Renzo. Uh, can I supplement I before, before? Yeah, and I was just going to say, maybe before I get in, Ray Okello has got something to augment or subtract or... Yeah, yes, I just want to quickly supplement on the issue of uh, safety of biogas. Uh, to understand it, we start by looking at the composition of biogas. Uh, we are talking about methane being 60%, then about 40% or 35, uh, that is carbon dioxide. And it can only burn if methane is above 50%. So it's already dilute. The moment you release it into the atmosphere, the concentration of methane drops to less than 50 and it cannot ignite. So when we are talking about domestic biogas at the home state, then the safety is already taken care of. However, if we reach the stage of purification of gas, the way we're getting 100% methane, then now we, the, the issue of health and safety is very paramount. Uh, that's why I told you that at one stage we we're, were trying to do purification and packaging. And then that's when people of standards came up and said, no, look, we, we need to go slow on that. So once you reach the stage of purification of biogas, then there are issues of health and safety that need to be considered. But at a domestic level, not yet really quite uh, paramount. Uh, then secondly, there's a gentleman there, I think, if I can't remember his name, who was concerned about the speed. Uh, I must say the speed is okay right now for the start. Uh, we have to be very careful to make sure that the next phase, government is involved. Uh, we have to make sure that the number of issues that have to be addressed or taken care in the next phase. Uh, the gentleman probably wants to move into numbers I can assure you, if you start doing 100 a month or 50 a month, there are so many issues that can come up around quality and uh, other issues, which if there are no proper structures in place, can again affect the progress. So the, 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 the slower the, the process has been, the better because there are learning phases, there are other issues that have to be, to be taken care of. Uh, what needs to be done by government, uh, specifically for me, I would think, uh, now government has to come in one with the subsidy support, but also with the support of other sectors of biogas, just not only the, the subsidy, but it could be in terms of policy, could be terms in terms of tax, tax incentives. Uh, most importantly, there needs to be an entity that is responsible for quality and after sales services before anything else. So if that's the Department of Energy, then they will do, they, you'll find that they, 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 they need the structures throughout the country. If you are now going to go throughout the country, who are the people who are going to be checking on all these issues? Uh, the mason on their own at the start, it's simple if the digesters are few, but once you're talking about 2,000, 4,000 digesters, it becomes something of serious concern. So I think uh, there are so many things that the government needs to do. Uh, the private sector shouldn't be worried that uh, they are not involved, it's still slow opportunities will come. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Herman Nguyen and I come from the Solar Industry Association of Botswana. I just want to say a few comments here that I, I think we are all appreciative that uh, the ministry has taken up this pilot project of biogas. This 
is a pilot project that has already shown some results. And when you look at it, uh, the end benefit is visible. Uh, it is bringing about better livelihoods for our communities. And my fear is that if we limit it to being a pilot project throughout, uh, it won't work for us. And my comments also augment what, uh, uh, what, what was mentioned earlier by saying, let us allow the private sector to, to come in and, 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 play, and play the part so that we can move the project forward. Uh, the reason I'm saying that we want to limit it on to being a pilot is that I think let's look at it in two parts. There is the digester and there is the use, the use which is in the domestic application or the chicken house or whatever. Currently, I think I'm aware that uh, the pilot has been to use agro waste. Yes, we can use agro waste, but we can also look at commercial uh, ways of employing it, where we will have to look at uh, driving gas forklifts with it, cookers like for secondary schools and, and other uh, larger entities, and heaters for, 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 for the agriculture. Uh, and other applications. There are various applications we've seen from the gentleman who was presenting from the Netherlands. These applications can be used, biogas can be used in various applications, especially in the processing of the agri, the agro sector. The agricultural sector needs a lot of boost in that in that line. And if we focus our efforts on saying, let those who can play the uptake of the technology carry on now because now that the first phase of the pilot project has come to, is coming to an end and we are only looking at the second phase being the larger rollout throughout the country. Let those come in and, and play their part. The issue of uh, safety, I think we don't have to lose sight of that. We cannot take our guard out of that because yes, it is important, but Let's, in hindsight, let's ask ourselves, uh, since time immemorial, that's when I have used gas, and LP gas is more dangerous than what we are talking about now. And we talk of how are we going to monitor issues of quality and delivery to the customers. Who has actually, if I may ask the room here, who has actually went into a gas store, bought, a gas cylinder and he's told it's 19 kgs and demanded that they weigh it in front of him. Who has done that? So these are issues that are actually going to delay progress and we will look at it, we note them, we look at them as we go by. And my plea is, uh, let us all understand that this, pro this project is going to benefit the larger part of our communities who are, who are very needy and who need the service so that they can actually improve their delivery in farming and realize a bit of profit. Uh, thank you. There's a hand at the back. Uh, thank you. Um, mine is just uh, supplementary to uh, the speaker who just um, uh, finished making comments. And I think just to appreciate and, you know, to back him up and say, as we, you know, um, go uh, to our homes and rethink uh, what we uh, benefited today from this exercise, we should also be, uh, you know, um, aware that uh, we are in a transition stage and it takes time to transit from one system to another. And in doing so, there are so many key factors that play a role 
in how you, you know, transform or how you reform a sector, particularly where there are pressing, uh, there are other pressing issues uh, at the international level as regards international commitments to, towards uh, climate action. So we need to be able to balance all the factors uh, that need to be in place for us to get to where we are. Uh, first of all, there is the technical side, the technical side which will be uh, you know, informed by research and, uh, and development in terms of the technologies that are available, you know, that allow us to do this in a sustainable manner while at the same time protecting public health and, you know, being able to achieve environmental protection. There is the, the economic side of it in terms of how uh, capital intensive is it to get the right infrastructure in order to achieve certain things. At the moment, um, focus, because usually you start with smaller steps until you get to bigger ones, focuses on uh, small uh, digesters for own use. But we do have here uh, different institutions that are uh, part of this conference. And I believe the energy regulators here, we have Botswana Oil. We have key stakeholders who should really be looking at this thing, you know, with uh, seeing how we can expand on it and actually establish and develop the sector going forward. Because I believe they have the resources or at least they can be able to, you know, take lessons learned today and try and see on how they can expand on these and actually assist government because I feel this is a step in the right direction in the sense that the partnership of UNDP and the department was, you know, is one of the initial steps that we needed to take in order to kickstart the development and, you know, the establishment of the, the biogas and biofuel industry. So as to how we proceed um, in terms of the framework, because for when there's an emerging industry, there's always need for the regulatory framework, you know, to have an enabling framework within which that industry can thrive. We know that there are a lot of issues of exploitation, especially when you look at uh, the targeted group at the moment. We are targeting the rural communities. We are targeting, um, you know, women, because usually when you talk about firewood, you should support up and other things uh, at farmers and dealing with waste. You are basically targeting the women who usually do the cooking, and you know, the, the youth earlier on who were uh, giving tes testimonies on how they benefited from these exercises. These are usually the vulnerable groups that usually take advantage, of, uh, that are usually susceptible to, you know, being exploited when there's an emerging industry. So this is where you need now, you know, your regulators to come up with measures and you know regulations in terms of now you coming up with the eligibility criteria you know certain things and you know uh, uh, and requirements that needs to be put in place for the industry to grow and be established in an environment where you know there's um, uh, fairness and there's equity uh, you know you are able to have a framework that guides the development without others overstepping on other people, particularly when you want to now transit to the medium uh, and, and, and bigger infrastructure, when the big co companies with big muscles come in. That's when we need to really now start looking at the broader picture of coming up with these uh, regulations that can guide the industry going forward. So uh, for me, this is, I think, uh, a really an eye opener. And I think um, the platform has been created. It's just for the industry uh, and you know relevant institutions within the government, both parastatals and other ones that can actually take this project going forward and actually take it take ownership of it. And the other thing that we should not lose sight of is the linkage of this project to the waste aspect, because there's also the waste aspect. We're talking about the integrated waste management framework that that that, that is being brought about by the new policy and the envis envisaged. Uh, Integrated Waste Management Act. So once we have these in place, and there's also another um, initiative that's ongoing, that's, that is parallel to this one, and the Minister of Agriculture on Smart Agriculture. So we do have arrows leading, to, uh, leading us to a certain point 
It's just making sure that we pick the momentum and we're able to align and reconcile all these initiatives to achieve um, the climate uh, 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 targets and these environmental issues, uh, you know, addressing them in alignment. All these are linked to climate change. They are linked to sustainable development. So it's just taking that holistic view of all these ongoing parallel exercises that are happening in different ministries and seeing that really we are going uh, towards the same direction and uh, you know embracing it and running with it. Thank you. Thank you very much to the last speakers, uh, Tandeka. Sorry, Mamoremi Mojo or Moting Unte Mahoko Kasatswana. Um, Ren Gwenya, thank you very much for your intervention there regarding the pilot engagement of the private sector and allowing others to play and make sure we move. Issues of safety and health will forever be considered upon any intervention uh, being uh, taken on. Uh, I think these were uh, pretty much comments and uh, just to say we are in the right we're taking the right steps towards the challenges that are facing the country. Um, perhaps just to end and wrap up our session, we at UNDP um, are very excited, especially uh, more than ever today, because we see uh, the excitement that all of you, uh, you know, have regarding uh, biogas and its future in Botswana. So we stand firm once again to reiterate our commitment to supporting the government of Botswana in addressing environmental challenges. And uh, again, to to say to you, as you know, uh, as a research institution, uh, this is an opportunity for us perhaps to get together, put uh, together a very strong concept that we could pitch to the global environmental facility, to the global uh, climate fund, and perhaps get Again, if we do a good job, we might just get additional resources to support government in upscaling this initiative. So really the ball is on our courts. How do we then learn from the biogas, uh, the lessons from biogas, and how do we take them forward? And it doesn't necessarily have to be just biogas. We can grow it, expand it, and make sure we cover other sectors as well. And because everybody else now who's funding anything in the climate space, climate change space, wants a much more broader uh, program. They want us to look at all sectors, biodiversity, energy, uh, sustainable land management, you know, and, plus, and climate change, of course, is a cross cutter. So let's be creative, let's come together and pitch these issues and see how, and look around where we can find resources so that we don't just look up to government. We know that resources are quite tight, uh, lately, particularly now with the COVID pandemic, so resources have been repurposed. So it's uh, upon ourselves to say, where do we find resources as a country? Uh, look up to our development partners. We are here exactly for that reason. With that, Director of Ceremony, I hand over to you. Thank you so much. A big round of applause. What a beautiful, fruitful day. While you are here, I don't know if, uh, uh, our colleague from uh, from from Ment uh, is still online, um, so that no? the closing remarks. So while you're here, maybe we can get that underway. But thank you so much. You may step down, Chimbi. That was well executed. Thank you very much, and all the wonderful comments and the international audience that has been here with us. That is the participants, as well as the panelists from all over the world, from Uruguay, Nepal, uh, neighboring Zimbabwe, from South Africa. It has been an absolute marvel. So Ludo Moroka, a job well done on a beautifully executed Biogas oh. Botswana Conference 2021. I, I see you already closing, but I wanted to acknowledge that we got some comments uh, from our I wasn't closing, from, I was just... You, you were getting us there, sort of, okay. kind of, you know. <laughs> so I just wanted to say, um, I'll read, we just picked a few. Uh, this one goes to the question that was posed on safety. We had an answer from, or a response from Chandi, who was in one of the sessions. Um, 
I will just read it as it is. The safety issues related to biogas are as important as any other type of gas. So yes, they need to be addressed. However, it is unlikely that biogas will explode underground because digesters are constructed in such a way that if the gas is not used, then gradually there will be no space to feed the feedstock. The raw gas from the digester is also full of impurities and deliberately we leave it like that for households because if it leaks, they will smell it. It smells like rotten eggs uh -uh, because of the hydrogen sulfide present in the biogas. So you can actually <laughs> smell it. And then we had another intervention from Bart Fredericks. He said, as long as there is no air in the gas holder, there is no risk of explosion. But leaving your gas valve open indoor overnight might in principle lead to a dangerous situation. Even then, explosions are not very common. With my creative mind, the only thing I could think of with just naughty children is just the small child jumping into the incinerator. So, uh, biogas digester, not get into the digester, sorry. Okay. Uh, jumping into the, into how feed you and then the digester. Right. Or it's, 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 it's very tough. small. There's some very small babies you haven't seen. Okay, no, no, no. Uh, no maybe just one last one. It's, it's not an answer to any of the questions. But we had an intervention from Red David Lesolle. Uh, I call him uh, Botswana's grandfather of climate change. He introduced me to climate change. Uh, Red Lesolle, he says, as we develop the biogas, let us also create a baseline against which we will measure the methane and environmental gains. It's just a comment. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and, you know, the audience has been really wide and vast and there are many more comments that we have uh, on the digital channels. We have on standby, Reje Mumene uh, from the Ministry of Environment and uh, Natural uh, Resources or from MENT. Uh, and then after this, I see you guys. Thank you, Director of Ceremonies. I believe we had a wonderful conference today. And uh, you had already given the vote of thanks, so I'll go ahead and do the closing remarks. Uh, let me say all protocol observed and move on to uh, indicate that it does give me great pleasure and honor to have been accorded this opportunity to perform the closing remarks at this Biogas Conference 2021 under the auspices of the Government of Botswana, UNDP, Jeff, B3, and Water Utilities Corporation, who are the key sponsors of this conference. Director of Ceremonies, this Biogas Conference has benefited from the experience and expertise of various speakers and experts from the region and internationally. This is indeed commendable as we live in a global community and issues of climate change and sustainable development more than ever before require nations to share experiences, technologies and innovations towards sustainable low cost solutions that will reduce negative impacts brought about by climate change. Therefore, we are most grateful to our international speakers to have positively responded to our call to share their experiences in this conference. Ladies and gentlemen, the government of Botswana take issues of climate change seriously and to address the challenges brought about by this phenomenon, a number of policies, strategies, and initiatives geared towards mitigating the impact associated with climate change and building resilient society have been developed. Director of Ceremonies, I'm happy to report that climate change policy, integrated waste management policy, were this year approved by parliament 
together with other national environmental strategy documents. This marks a significant milestone in the achievement of national priorities and demonstrates the government commitments towards realization of its target in the National Vision 2036, the NDPs, and the need to fulfill its international obligations, including global sustainable development goals and other international treaties ratified by the government. Director of Ceremonies, we are very grateful that our collaboration with UNDP together with the Ministry of Mineral, Green Technology and Energy, BITRI and other collaborating institutions had resulted in establishment of a national biogas project. The project has achieved significant milestone in introducing low carbon technologies to our communities, which offers alternative renewable energy sources that contribute to the reduction of the carbon footprint. Ladies and gentlemen, there are a lot of benefits to be accrued by our communities by adopting the biogas digester technology, including providing energy for cooking, heating, and lighting needs. The biogas project is embraced internationally, will also minimize deforestation due to indiscriminate cutting of trees as firewood. It is therefore our interest as the ministry to see biogas project being rolled out at national level to improve livelihoods and provide alternative renewable sources of energy. In conclusion, I wish to sincerely thank all those who made this conference a success. Our development partners, experts in the biogas field, financial institutions, and everybody who contributed in one way or the other. We are very hopeful that this conference will go a long way in promoting use of biogas as a beneficial and alternative low cost source of energy in our communities, and thus ensure that the main goal of environmental sustainability is achieved. Finally, I wish to take this opportunity to urge all of you to strictly to adhere to COVID-19 protocols. Remember, it is our responsibility to encourage others to get their vaccination. Remember, we can only save others, including our, fa our families, if we ourselves are safe. At this point in time, I'll take this uh, opportunity to officially close the conference. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. With that, can we give him a round of applause? Thank you. Please uh, practice uh, social distance, distancing like me. Nerit like spectator tapelo you a kemang hai se matapel. So would like uh, Miss Mukani tapelo. Uh, to please give us the closing prayer. We prayed at the beginning, and the reason why, uh, you know, nobody tripped on the light uh, is because uh, uh, Miss Mukani, Tapelo, Rebe Hapil Harama Sidia Poloka. Good afternoon, everybody. May we close our eyes and pray. Heavenly Father, just like we asked you in the morning to be with us throughout this conference, we just want to say thank you that you have been with us. And we want to thank you, Heavenly Father, for all the collaborations that have been done. We thank you, Father, for all the information that has been shared amongst ourselves and that this is not the end, but the beginning, Jehovah. As you continue, Father, to pour out your wisdom on us, Father, and as we continue, Heavenly Father, to use these hands and the brains that you have given us, Father, to improve our lives, my God, and to make our country be a greener country, Jehovah, in the mighty name of Jesus. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for each and every one, Jehovah, who has participated, God, in the mighty name of Jesus. And that is, Heavenly Father, as we leave this place, go into our various places, we still trust that you are God in our lives and you continue, Jehovah, 
to protect us, my God, in the mighty name of Jesus. And that heavenly Father, this country that we have given unto us, Jehovah, you will continue, Father, to be our Father, to be our God, to be the God who shall protect us and continue to outpour your peace upon our lives. In the mighty name of Jesus, we give you thanks. Amen. Amen. Mukani. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> to my beautiful co-host, uh, I'd like you to uh, come as close. You've done a sterling job. This is the first time as master of ceremonies. And she's How do done. you know that? You said, hey, no, some oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> actually it's true. <laughs> okay, in a setting of this nature, she looked absolutely radiant. And let's give her a round of applause. I think she did a wonderful job. Thank you. Yes. Like not looking too bad yourself. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> we try. Anyway, um, Galeta Maila, uh, Aretoaha Reportaka. Hey, Aretoa Reportaka, we're going to have uh, a few refreshments and some entertainment while we're at it. So we may kindly leave the room. It has been a marvel. There is a future in biogas and we look forward to seeing you at biogas 2022 yes yes coming thank you so much you guys have been wonderful thank you lungo thank you so much bart edwin coqueto Adronic Galaxy S10.